Scholastic Audio presents Battle Magic by Tamora Pierce, read by Nancy Wu. Chapter 1 Outside the walls of Garmashing, capital of Gyeongshi, in the canyon of the Tom Shuo River, far to the east of Winding Circle Temple, in the month of Carp Moon. Two boy men sat on the river's eastern bank, where an open fronted tent gave them shelter from the chilly spring wind. It whistled down the canyon, making the banners around them snap. Briar Moss was the older of the two, sixteen and a fully accredited mage of the Living Circle School in Emelon. He was the foreigner, his skin a light shade of bronze, his nose long and thin, his eyes a startling gray-green in this land of brown-eyed Easterners. He wore a green silk quilted tunic patterned with light green willow leaves, gold-brown quilted breeches, and the calf-high soft boots that were popular in the mountains. He sat cross-legged on cushions with a traveling desk on his lap, but his eyes were fixed just now on the events across the river. There, five shamans from the Skipping Mountain Goat tribe stood before a sheer rock face on the cliff opposite Briar and his companion. Crouched near to the shamans were two horn players, a drummer, and three players of singing bowls. The musicians sounded their instruments. Briar would not call what they produced music. The shamans, three men and two women in dark brown homespun robes, shuffled, turned, and hopped, ringing the small cymbals that were fixed to their hands. As they did, Briar started to feel a quiver under his rump. The longer the shamans danced, the more pronounced the quiver grew. What are they doing? He asked the boy who sat nearby. Aren't you worried? The god king looked up from his own desk. The ruler of Gyeongshi was an 11-year-old boy with the ruddy bronze skin, long brown eyes, and short, wide nose of his people. He was dressed even more simply than the shamans, in an undyed, black-bordered, long-sleeved tunic, undyed quilted breeches, and black boots. Like most Gyeongshin boys and girls, he wore his shiny black hair cut very short, with one exception. From the moment he had been chosen as God King, he had grown the hair at the crown of his head long. He wore it in a braid, strung with rings of precious metals or semi-precious stones, each a symbol of the eleven gods he served. He also wore eleven earrings, six in one ear and five in the other, made of the same materials. Why should I be worried? I told you what they're doing, the God King reminded Briar. They're calling a statue for their temple out of the cliff. It does involve a little bit of shaking. Briar looked at the ink in the dish by his side. It quivered, too. What if the cliff falls on us? He demanded. How do you know they're doing it right? The god king chuckled. They always do it right. That's why there's more than one dancer. So if one gets a step wrong, the other's correct for it. People have been getting statues from Gyeongshi's stone for generations, Briar. They haven't pulled the cliffs down yet. He nodded to a waiting messenger and held up a hand for that young woman's scroll. Briar scowled at the river, then at the dancing shamans. This kind of religion is too odd for me, he muttered to himself. He looked at the group of people near the shamans, trying to spot his student, Evie. There she was with some of the local stone mages and the warriors who had escorted the shamans. Evie was standing far too close to the cliff for Briar's liking. Suddenly he grinned. First dedicate Dok Yi, head of Gyeongshi's living circle temple and a stone mage himself, wound a big fist in Evie's tunic and gently towed her back from the cliff. Ever since Briar and his companions had arrived in Garmashing between blizzards four months ago, 
The busy first dedicate had made time in his day to instruct Evie. That morning, he had told Briar that he, too, wanted to see how the shamans worked. It was very different from the way the scholar mages did their magic, and so it would be his pleasure also to keep an eye on Evie. Briar was grateful. Evie had frustrated the few other earth dedicates they had met who specialized in stone magic. Like Doki, they worked their magic with charts, books, and spoken words, letting the magic they were born with pass through stones that responded. Evie, like Briar and Briar's mentor, Dedicate Rosethorn, drew her magic directly from the outside world. Stones gave Evie her power, just as plants gave their magic to Briar and Rosethorn. Doc Yi at least had spent years with the shamans and in other lands. He could adjust to a mage who worked in a different way. He could show Evie the books, charms, and spells of stone magic that could strengthen what she did. He could also sense when she tried to experiment on her own and stop her before things got out of hand. His special stones helped him with that. Should I make Evie come here? Briar asked the God King, who was reading his message scroll. Hmm? The younger boy looked up and grinned. Let her stay. Doc Yi can handle her. Ah, they make progress. If progress meant more noise, Briar agreed. Small rocks and sand fell down the cliff face, though nothing appeared to land on the shaman's musicians or other mages who waited there. Briar suspected that Evie was sending the stones away from the people, particularly when he saw one large rock arc away from the cliff to drop in the river. Needing something to occupy his hands, Briar picked up one of a number of stones that Evie had left with him before she had crossed the river with Doc Yi. She was always collecting bits of rock and handing them to him or Rosethorn while she gathered more. Before they moved on, there would be a painful session at which she would have to choose the pieces she could not do without and those she would have to abandon. After nearly two years in Evie's company, Briar knew limestone when he held it. The surprise lay in the image embedded deep in its surface, a curved section of leaf much like a fern. Interestingly, it was unlike any fern that Briar knew. And after five years of Rosethorn's teaching, he knew many. He stared at the cliff across the river, not really noticing the twenty-foot-tall rectangular crack that was writing itself into the rock face. As he would if the fossil were a living plant, Briar reached for it with his magic, only to find nothing. The limestone held an image, but no remainder of the plant that had left it. Briar glared at it and reached for another piece of stone. It was unmarked, but the third rock he examined gripped a fossil much like a sardine. This is a sea fish, Briar muttered. Life near the docks from early childhood had taught him the look of salt and freshwater fish, flesh, and bone. Eons ago, all the Gyeongshin flatland was a sea, murmured the god king. Slowly he straightened. His pen fell from his hand. Then the Drimbakang mountain gods were born. They shoved their molten bodies up against the shore and dragged the realms of the sun with them. He said it as if chanting an ancient tale, half awake, half sleeping. Briar tried not to shiver. It felt as if every hair on his body were standing. The god king continued in that unearthly voice. Higher they drove the shores and the sea. Greater they grew, the youngest gods clawing at the sky, rising toward the sun and the moon and the stars. When they could grow no more, when they stood taller than any other mountain gods, the sea drained away between them, seeking its ocean mother. The immense shoreline forests of palm, cactus, and fern withered. Only firs, spruces, Larches, junipers, and hemlocks thrive here, and rarely on the open plateau. Here the gods see everything. Gyeongshi has nowhere to hide from the gods of this world. He slumped. 
Briar was almost afraid to breathe until the younger boy blinked and straightened. Rubbing the back of his neck, he looked at Briar sheepishly. Did I go off? They never give me any warning, you know. I've told them and told them that it frightens people when they grab me, but gods and spirits don't really understand fear. Do they do that to you often? Briar whispered, goosebumps rippling all across his skin. Often enough. The land is crowded with them, what with one thing and another, and I can never tell when one of them will work through me. A large crash split the air. The god king jumped to his feet with a whoop. There we go, he cried, as if he had just won a wager. Briar remembered what had brought him to this cold ledge on a chilly morning. Setting aside the boy's tail to ponder later, he looked across the river. Rock tumbled from a rectangular hole at least twenty feet high in the cliff's face, cascading around a solid shape at its center. The shamans continued to dance and the musicians to play as they backed toward the place where Evie and the other observers stood. Briar whistled in silent admiration. He knew he couldn't dance and walk backward, yet the shamans and their musical helpers never faltered. Only Evie moved, walking forward around the line of shamans. Doc He lunged to grab her again and missed. Evie took a place on the riverbank, in front of whatever was going on in the cliff, and held out her hands. Briar fought to stand, spilling the tray of ink. He ignored it, but he could not ignore it when the god king grabbed one of his arms. Stop, the younger boy ordered in a voice that froze Briar where he stood. She will be fine. Watch. He released Briar, who instantly found he could move again. Rather than continue to try to reach his student, Briar waited. He wasn't quite sure if Evie made any noise. The racket caused by the grinding, collapsing wall of rocks drowned out any other sound except, of course, for the God King's voice. Briar wondered if Evie might not be chanting a spell, though. He knew she was working her magic, because the tumbling rocks split on either side of the opening it made, like curtains before a window. That was pure Evie. Neat piles of broken stone grew from the falling rock on either side of the rectangular gap in the cliff. At its heart stood a pair of embracing, human-like stone skeletons. As the heaped boulders and chips in front of them shifted to either side, the twenty-foot-tall skeletons walked out of the cliff. Evie wavered. She was trying to do too much at once. Worried, Briar stepped up to the edge where the tent was pitched, then halted again. Docky had reached the girl. He stood next to Evie, writing signs on the air as he worked spells of his own. She straightened, able to control the falling stone again with Ducky's help. The skeletons, which had paused when she seemed about to fall over, resumed their walk away from the cliff. One of the two skulls looked curiously at Evie and Ducky, while the other scanned the riverside behind them, the gap in the cliff, and then the shamans and their musicians. An arm from that skeleton reached around to tap the skull that had cocked its head as it stared at Evie. When that skull turned to glare at the other, the tapping hand pointed to the shamans. Both skeletons lumbered toward the dancers. Briar looked at the god king. What are they for, the statues? I don't think you said. The god king squinted at the dancing skeletons. Such things are a promise from this realm to those who build their temples here. They are our blessing on the temples and a sign of our protection. They tell invaders that the temple is guarded by the gods of Gyeongshi as well as the gods of the temple, where the statues stand. Seemingly unafraid and without missing a step, the dancers and musicians continued to back up, dancing or playing as they went. The warriors mounted horses to form a half circle around them. Other members of their group that handled the wagon they had brought helped the musicians into it. As smoothly as if they often traveled this way, the warriors and wagons set off in the lead, their half circle ending with the dancers just inside, 
the two skeletons, arms around each other's stone spine waist, came last of all. Dokie turned to Evie and bent until they were face to face. He grabbed her by the ears and pressed his forehead to hers. Briar wasn't sure if he was trying to scold Evie or just knock two rock heads together. Thinking that he ought to intervene before Evie said or did something rude, he turned to excuse himself to the God King. The boy was scowling at the message he had just received. You don't look very happy, Briar said. I have not heard from the king of Inshia. That was the realm to the northeast, a country that stood between Gyeongshi and the Yanjing Empire. I often do by now. Our mages who deal in conversations at a distance have not heard from his mages in several months. No horse messengers have come through the Green Pass either. It is only the third month of the year, Briar reminded him. It's probably frozen solid. The God King gave him an absent-minded smile. The Green Pass is in hill country, beyond the mountains of the Drimbakang Sharlog. Usually it is open by this time, though the weather has been very harsh in the hills this year. He stopped speaking as he stared off into the distance. Briar waited longer than he would have waited for anyone else to resume talking. When he was sure the God King had simply forgotten what he'd begun to explain, Briar asked, So what has this Inshia fella to do with how well you'll sleep tonight? He could tell the God King was worried. All three kingdoms north of Yanjing have been fighting the empire for the last five years, the God King explained. Since Inshia is our closest neighbor, we have sent mages and soldiers to their assistance for four of those years. We should have heard what they will need for this year's fighting by now. Briar nodded. Now he understood. Because if Inshia falls, Gyeongshi is next. I would like to think not, the younger boy replied, but he did not sound convinced. We have very little to interest the Emperor Wei Shu except the gods and spirits who are closer here than anywhere else in the world, and you can't pay soldiers with those. There are the temple treasures, but surely Weishu's mages do not believe they can take the curses from temple goods. We do spread word that there are curses on anything stolen from the temples of Gyeongshi, and we cannot remove them. The God King sighed. I would feel better if I knew the Yanjing Yi armies were denting their teeth on my neighbors again this year. A surge of pity raced through Briar's heart at the expression on the God King's face. That's not the look any boy his age ought to wear, thought Briar. I'd even feel sorry for a man of twice my years in his shoes. It was at moments like these that Briar understood why the gods of Gyeongshi had told their priests to choose this boy to rule over the many different tribes, villages, cities, faiths, and temples of Gyeongshi. There was something great inside the god king, something larger than Briar was. He wouldn't have spent a day in the god king's skin for all the pretty girls between there and home. Briar, did you see it? While they had talked politics and war, the rest of the statue-raising party had crossed the river bridge to join the God King's group. Evie raced over to the tent. The pockets of her orange wool tunic sagged with what Briar knew were more stone fragments. You aren't even looking! We watched the statue-raising, the God King told her. I've seen such things before, you know. Briar was impressed. I was. Briar assured the girl. Evie stopped at the open doorway and bowed to the God King, then braced her hands on her knees while she struggled to catch her breath. They had been in high mountain country for nearly two years, but Evie and Briar would struggle with the thin air if they tried to run. Rosethorn had trouble breathing all of the time. Although their entire journey had been Rosethorn's idea, she had been forced to spend much of it resting. She had chosen to work on the spring gardens instead of taking the awkward journey down the cliff into the river canyon with Briar and Evie that morning. 
Briar looked forward to getting back to lowlands again, so his rose thorn could breathe more easily. Could you see what I did? Evie demanded. I kept the scrap rock from falling on anyone. She grabbed the pack she had left with Briar and emptied her stones into it. Do you know it's going to take them at least ten days to walk back to their home temple? They only had the five shamans who could do the spell, so there's no one to keep the magic going at night. If they aren't dancing, the statues won't move. They're going to be awfully tired, the shamans, not the statues. I offered to clean up the loose rock, but Doc Yi said the Drimbakang Zugu have their own way of dealing with it. What does that mean? She gathered the stones she'd left with Briar and stowed them in her pack as well. Evumeme Dingzai was a skinny former slave who never missed a meal if she could help it. She was five feet tall with a strong Yan Jing Yi face, wide cheekbones, sharp chin, and long black eyes. Briar liked to tease her that she'd smacked her face into a door once since her nose was flat at the tip. Her hands and nails showed scars and scratches from two years of hard work as a stone mage and a lifetime as a cat owner. He had found her scraping for a living in a slum. Although her magic was different from his, he had learned that he would not give her up to a teacher of her own power who would be unkind to her. The god king stood and moved off the giant pillow where he and Briar had spent the morning. Wait a moment, Evumeme. Evie scowled. From the very beginning, the god king had treated her as a beloved sister. She had soon lost any shyness she could be expected to feel in his presence. You always tell me to wait. I'll have you know I am older than you. I am the 298th god king in a straight line of choice from the first god king he replied, as he did whenever she brought up their difference in age. You will have to be as old as... The stone beneath Briar's feet had begun to shake. He sat hurriedly and pulled at Evie's arm. She signaled for the God King to join them. Everyone outside was sitting as well. Briar heard the kind of grinding noise that brought landslides to mind. Looking across the river, he felt his stomach roll. He clapped his hands over his mouth to keep his very good breakfast where it was supposed to be. Stones that had fallen, gravel that had dropped off a cliff, dust that had settled after the skeletons had gone for their walk, belonged on the ground. All of these things had no business rising into the air in front of the gap in the cliff. None of them should be entering that gap, nor should any of the boulders on the riverbank or the stones between the water and the cliff be rolling to it and climbing over one another in their eagerness to fill in the hole left by the skeleton statues. Now, more stones rattled down the slopes of the mountain that stood behind the cliff. They hesitated only briefly on the edge of the drop, then rolled over in a maneuver that left Briar feeling as if he had been inhaling strange smokes. The new stones fell not straight down, but in a curve, dropping into the hole where the rocks from below had still left gaps. Now, except for a few openings, the rectangular space that had provided the statues was filled. Who did that? Evie cried. Is that what Dedicate Doc Yi meant when he said the mountains would clean up the loose rock? That is what he meant, the God King said, getting to his feet. And I am glad the work is finished. I don't like to leave before the cleaning up is done. There have been accidents in the past. He went to the edge of the rock slab and held his hands out, palm up. Tilting back his head, he opened his mouth. Sounds came out, spoken in something other than the Tion language that he'd used all morning with Briar and Evie, the common tongue of the East. These words rolled along the canyon, grating on Briar's bones. He pulled his tunic over his ears, willing to do nearly anything to make them stop. Evie rose, her face alight, and listened until the God King lowered his hands. Briar uncovered one ear. Normal sounds were returning to the canyon. 
He cleared his throat and got up. What was that about? He asked the God King. I was thanking the canyon, the younger boy replied. The shamans did it, of course, but the little gods appreciate it when I say something, too. Evie was slowly coming back to herself, her joy being replaced by her usual liveliness. Dedicate Doc Yi found her as they waited for the servants to gather their tent and the cushions. He was a gnarled and sun-wrinkled man in his fifties, with dark eyes buried under heavy lids. His wide-lipped mouth, like his eyes, was framed by laugh lines. His knotted legs and muscled arms showed he was no stranger to hard work, and plenty of it. Even his brown dedicate's habit didn't soften the hard shape of his body. Nicely done back there earlier, Evie, he said, tweaking her nose. I don't suppose you could teach me how you made the stones overhead fall backward into the opening. Evie reached out with her hands, opened and closed them, then shook her head with regret. I asked them to go that way, she explained. Ducky looked at Briar. She asked them. I see them as tools to be set in place along the frame of a spell pattern. And your student treats them as partners in the work. Briar, who asked plants to do things, smiled at the older man. At least Doc Yi wasn't hostile about the way in which Evie worked. Unlike many of the mages they had encountered in their travels. A pigeon caught their attention as it swooped to and fro, trying to fly past them into the tent. Briar spotted the small tube bound to one of the bird's legs and moved Evie out of the way so the bird could fly to a landing on the God King's shoulder. Servants rushed to complete the packing of the tent, as if the pigeon were a signal. Doc Yi walked over to take the bird, so the God King could undo the ties around the delicate strip of paper. Once he had it, the God King reached one hand into a pocket and brought out a selection of dried berries and seed. Doc Yi took that and fed the bird, as the boy read the message. What is it? Evie demanded. The silence had stretched too long for her liking. Briar gripped one of her ears between his thumb and forefinger, giving that organ a gentle twist that promised to get harder if she did not behave. Didn't me and Rosethorn have that little talk with you about affairs of state and you sticking your nab where it oughtn't to go? He asked an imperial, the language they had taught Evie to use. You don't go around asking kings about their messages. The thought of Evie being so impertinent to Duke Vedris back home in Emelon made Briar shiver. Vedris was a good old fellow for the most part, but when he got on his dignity, he could freeze someone's hair off, and Evie was more fragile than she acted. It seems that although the Green Pass is not open, and we cannot get word to or from Inxia, the great Emperor of Yanjing is more than capable of sending messengers through Ice Lion Pass, the God King said. The look on his face was quite strange. This, though my weather mages tell me that Ice Lion will not be open for at least two months. A messenger from the Emperor waits in my audience chamber, bearing letters for me and for Rosethorn. The imperial messenger was sleek and elegant, dressed in three overlapping silk robes, each heavily embroidered. Briar's fingers itched for an eastern-style ink brush and a pad of paper sheets, knowing that his foster sisters would never forgive him if he couldn't describe imperial fashions and decoration perfectly. He wondered what such plain dressers as Doc Yi and Rosethorn made of the messenger's yellow, green, and black garments, or of the black silk cap with wings that were stiffened to stick out straight on either side of the man's head. It was impossible to tell from their faces, which were as blank as any stone. Doc Yi wore the plain brown habit of the Earth Temple here in the East, with the black border of the initiate or mage. Briar was relieved to see that Rosethorn had cleaned up from her morning's work with plants. 
She wore a clean habit in the earth green of the Western Living Circle Temple, also with the initiate's black border. Her short, dark red hair was still wet. Months spent indoors had kept her skin the ivory shade she preferred. While she held summer suns and wrinkles at bay with a large selection of creams she made herself. Her large brown eyes missed nothing, ever. That was why Briar kept Evie half hidden in back of him now. She ought to have been stone, like the rest of the people in the room. But instead, he felt her shake with silent giggles. If he had to guess the source of her merriment, it was the messenger's hat. It did look silly, but Briar could control himself. Rosethorn's watching, he whispered out of the corner of his mouth. Do you want to spend another week washing our clothes yourself? That calmed Evie down. She respected Rosethorn like no one else, not even her first teacher and friend, Briar. As if she knew she was being discussed, Rosethorn moved until she stood next to them. Dok Yi came with her. The Gyeongshin guards stood at attention. Two of their number struck a pair of large brass gongs, while one of the rotating number of priests from Gyeongshi's many temples cried, The God King is here! Together with some residents of Gyeongshi and a handful of other visitors, Rose Thorn, Briar, and Evie bowed low. The boy ruler walked briskly into the room through a side entrance and climbed the steps to the backless pile of cushions that served the God King as a throne. There he sat, lotus fashion, propping an elbow on one knee, and looked at the Yanjing Yi group. As soon as he was settled, his advisors ran up the steps to stand on either side of the throne. Doc Yi remained with Rosethorn and the two young people, a gesture Briar appreciated. The moment they took their places, one of the Yanjing Yi group, a barrel-chested man in black silk trimmed with yellow satin, stepped forward. He began to speak in a deep, thundering voice that boomed in the huge throne room. Briar didn't recognize the language. He glanced back at Evie, who looked as confused as he felt. Briar didn't check Rosethorn's face. He doubted that this was a language she knew, since he actually understood more languages than she did. It's the language of the imperial court in Yanjing. Doki said in a voice that went no farther than the four of them. It's as old as the imperial line, that's what they say. If they caught anyone not a noble or not of the imperial household speaking it, that person would die the death of ten thousand cuts. Briar looked down so no one could see the face he made. He tried to remember if he'd ever heard of anyone dying for a language before. The herald stopped speaking. At the sound of rustling cloth, Briar looked up again. Everyone in the Imperial Party, led by the chief messenger, had knelt on the floor. Now, in unison, they placed their hands on the floor, leaned down, and touched their heads to the cold tiles. They straightened, then repeated the head-touching exercise seven more times. Finally, everyone but the messenger halted their heads against the floor. The messenger straightened and began to speak to the god king. He did not stand, and the language he used sounded much like that spoken by the herald. Evie could stand it no longer, speaking quietly. She told Briar and Chamuri, Only eight bowings and touchings. They insulted him. They give the emperor nine bowings and touchings. Chamuri was the language she had spoken when they first met. She was taking a chance on it being unknown to anyone from Yanjing. Traveling messengers might know Imperial, which was spoken over many Western lands. Maybe they think they were complimenting him, giving him almost as many as their own master, Briar murmured in the same language. Now hush. Your accent is a delight to the ear and your facility with words a pleasure to any listener, the God King told the messenger in Tion. You will forgive me if I ask you to favor us with what I do not doubt is equal mastery of Tion. 
My guests, whom you seek, have never been granted the opportunity to study the golden phrases of the imperial speech, nor will they have the years it takes to master it as you have done. Briar noticed that he said nothing about his own obvious mastery of the Yanjing Yi language. The messenger bowed first to the God King, and then, half turning, to Rosethorn. Forgive this unworthy servant of a great and glorious master, he said in perfect teon. If offense was given, I offer my life to blot it out. A bit extreme, don't you think? Briar heard Rosethorn murmur to Doc Yi. Briar turned his snort of laughter into a cough. By the time he had gotten himself under control, the messenger was making a flowery speech in Teon to the God King, passing on greetings from the Emperor in the East. Briar ignored the fellow, who added half bows and gestures as he talked, to look at Rosethorn. The corner of her naturally red mouth was tucked deeper than usual, a sign that Briar knew meant she was contemptuous of the messenger's overwrought manners. At least she had not crossed her arms, the signal that trouble was brewing behind her brown eyes. Evie nudged Briar with a bony elbow. She had noticed the tucked corner of Rosethorn's mouth, too, even if she hadn't heard her comment. The messenger got to his feet as gracefully as a dancer. Once he was upright, he reached into one wide sleeve and produced two scrolls, each bound with gold streamers and secured with what looked like green jade buckles. He touched them both to his forehead, then offered one to the God King. Does he think the God King is going to run down the steps to get it? Briar wondered. If the messenger did, he was disappointed. One of the generals who had been in residence in the palace all winter walked slowly down to the messenger to accept the scroll for the God King. Only when the general had worked several spells over it without result did he let the boy ruler have the message. Once the God King was reading his scroll, the messenger turned until he faced Docky and Rosethorn. Is this unworthy one correct? The messenger asked. Has this one the honor to address the first dedicate and dedicate initiate of the first temple of the living circle? And dedicate initiate Rose Thorn of Winding Circle Temple? I am Doc Yi, the older man said without bowing. This is Rose Thorn. The messenger bowed slightly and offered the other scroll. Then I am honored to present my master's invitation to dedicate initiate Rose Thorn and her companions, he said. His dark eyes flicked over Briar and Evie. He bowed very slightly but there was still respect in his voice as he said in Teon. Am I mistaken? Have I also the honor to stand before Nan Shur Briar Moss and his student, Evumeme Dingzai? Nan Shur was the Teon word for mage. Briar was impressed in spite of himself. Few adults gave him his proper title, refusing to believe that someone his age had achieved a mage's certification and power. He returned the bow and nudged Evie with his foot until she did the same. Since he had been at the courts of royalty and the houses of nobles enough by now to navigate their mazes of manners, Briar said politely in Teon, May I have the blessing of one's own name, so that I may thank one's ancestors for the pleasure of a son with such grace and perception? I can't believe you just said that, Evie muttered. Briar burned to give her a proper scolding. Instead, he kept his face pleasant and watched the messenger. If the man heard Evie, he showed no sign of it, but bowed a little more deeply to Briar. Were the movements all measured out for him? It made Briar wonder if he had a measuring stick at home, and if he practiced bowing to each particular notch on it, so he would know just how far to bow to a lord, or a mage, or someone who had paid him a compliment. Forgive this humble messenger, gracious Nan Shi, but when this humble servant of the emperor, great as his name, son of all the gods, master of lions, speaks in the voice of so great and puissant a master, his own pathetic name and being is obliterated. 
Only the name of the mighty emperor Wei Shu Maorin Guan Gong Jian, sixth of the Long Dynasty, remains. The courier cocked his head slightly, his black eyes glittering with more than a little touch of mischief. And if we wanted to ask how was the weather in the passes, would we say, Excuse me, you? Evie wanted to know. How could the emperor in his distant palace know the weather in the mountains? Briar wouldn't call the swift look that the courier shot Evie a glare. Distaste, perhaps. The man found a smile, a tiny one, to plaster on his face. That was what he offered to Evie. But it was the eagle of the heavens, the leveler of mountains, who arranged our easy journey through the Ice Lion Pass, he said coolly. Such as his eagerness to meet dedicate initiate Rosethorn, Nan Shi Briar Moss, and even the student of such acclaimed magic workers that our dread master banished the storms and split the snows in Ice Lion Pass to allow this unworthy messenger to bring the gracious imperial invitation to you. Rosethorn finally looked up from the scroll, her brown eyes shining. It, this is amazing. She looked at Doc Yi first, then the God King. I had told you that our plans were to travel through Yanjing with a trader caravan, when the pass is cleared, then sail home from Hanjian. Our hope, my hope and Briar's, was to visit as many gardens and gardeners along the way. I never thought, I didn't expect. She took a breath and let it out. Briar, the emperor has invited us to visit the winter palace in Dohan. He is offering to show us his gardens there himself. You are also invited to be guests, all three of you, at the celebration of the Son of the Gods' 50th birthday, the messenger said. It is the rarest of honors. There will be lords of Yanjing who will be gnashing their teeth with vexation that they have not been included. The gardens at the Imperial Palace in Dohan, Rose Thorn whispered, running her fingers over the raised gold letters on the scroll of invitation. Her perfectly arched eyebrows snapped together in a worried frown. To the God King, she said, Will you be offended if we leave soon? Because you've been so good to us, and I really don't want to offend you. Briar looked at the God King. Did he dare say no, given his concerns of that morning? He had not sounded as if he looked forward to any kind of conflict with the great Emperor of Yanjing. The God King smiled at Rosethorn. Keep you from the most famous gardens in our part of the world? I would not be so cruel. You have given us four glorious months of your company. I am only sorry to lose you, as I would have been if you had left us according to your original plan, in six weeks. To the messenger, he said. I do hope you will let them have two days to pack and let us say our farewells. The messenger faced the God King, knelt once more, and touched his forehead to the floor. Those who had come with him had not budged from their positions in all that time. My glorious master has ordered his humble servant to give all obedience to the God King of Gyeongshi, he replied. I suppose that means yes. Briar heard Rosethorn murmur to Dokyi, now that the messenger wasn't looking at her. Briar let a sigh of relief escape him. She was her usual mocking, hard-headed self. It was understandable that she would be excited by the chance to see the emperor's famous personal gardens. But after the god king's remarks and all of the rumors and stories about the emperor that Briar had heard over the last four months, Briar wanted Rosethorn at her most hard-headed. With Rosethorn and Evie both to look after, Briar wanted all of the good sense he could find, buy, or steal. Chapter 2 Outside the Walls of Dohan Winter Capital of the Yanjing Empire Five Weeks Later, the Second Week of Seed Moon Evu Meimei Dingzai was very unhappy. First of all, she was hot. Once they had come down from the heights of the Jimbekang Sharlog, 
they had found themselves in wet, sunny lands that were already warm despite it barely being spring. Today was even warmer than usual. To add to her discomfort, she and Rosethorn were traveling in the most elegant of palanquins on their way to the first part of Emperor Wei Shu's birthday celebration. Bearers carried them along one of the many roads of the Winter Palace, a skull-thumping honor Evie would have happily done without. The curtains of the palanquin were drawn. They had been told by their servant guardians to keep the emperor's favored guests from being stared at by the vulgar and to keep dust from their clothes. It meant they bounced along in an airless silk-wrapped box. Only the thought of Rosethorn's grip on her ear if she voiced her feelings kept her silent. Surely even Rosethorn could understand how a girl in three layers of silk robes, with her hair oiled, braided, and secured by jeweled pins, might want to say something, even if she only muttered it. Still, Rosethorn so often held strange views about the behavior she expected of her traveling companions that it was really better for Evie to keep any complaints behind her teeth. That was, at least if she wanted her ear to stay in its normal position on her head. It wasn't fair, Evie wanted to say. Court etiquette only required Rosethorn, a dedicate of an established religion, to wear garments like those she wore in service to her gods. Of course, the emperor required that those garments be silk, a white shift and the pine green habit worn by earth dedicates of the western living circle. Rose Thorn wore no collar. Evie had three, all of which framed more of Evie's bare skin than she thought was right. She tried to tug a layer over her upper chest and failed. Stop fussing, Rose Thorn ordered. She lay back against the cushions, waving a fan to cool herself. The clothes will be easier to wear if you forget you're wearing them. You don't see Briar tugging and squirming. I don't see Briar, Evie grumbled, trying to slouch. He got to ride a horse. If we wore clothes suitable to horseback riding, I'm sure we would have been allowed to do the same. The palanquin tilted suddenly. Evie tumbled among the cushions. The slaves who carried the chair with its box-like compartment were climbing. Evie wriggled back to a sitting position and risked a peek through the curtains. Stairs she told Rosethorn. Big flat stone ones, like in that old temple back on the Sea of Grass. She let her magic drip down into the polished surfaces below their palanquin. The stone steps were old, quiet, and sleepy. She had woken them up to ask them questions. There's dips worn into them by people coming and going, but they say they don't mind. She let the ancient voices roll through her bones. They say humans tell them they are white marble from Sishan. They've been here for more wet seasons than they can count, if they could count. She leaned back, letting the curtains shut. They're going back to sleep. She sighed, feeling better. Carefully, she smoothed one of her sleeves, then confessed in a tiny voice. I wouldn't fuss so, only I'm scared. I had noticed. Rosethorn said quietly. We are guests, Evie. The emperor made promises to the god king and first dedicate, Doc Yi, that we would be safe. We have to trust that he's telling the truth. We have heard how much pride he takes in his gardens. From his letter to me, he believes I am a gardener of great renown. He wants to show off. Perhaps he would even like me to do a little work with some plants of his. Evie bit her lip. Until she was four, her parents had taught her that the emperor could do anything he wished. When she lived in her burrow in the rock in Chamur, the old Yan Jing Yi woman Qin Ling had told her stories of home. In them, the emperor had figured as being one step below the gods. Evie had survived on her own for years by avoiding powerful people. This trip to the imperial court went against every survival instinct she possessed. Their palanquin bearers slowed to a stop, 
but when Evie tried to get out, a frowning eunuch appeared in the opening of her curtain. He shook a finger at her and closed the curtain with a yank. We're hot, Evie snapped in Shamuri, vexed. Rose Thorn slapped her arm lightly. Manners, she warned. We aren't in Gyeongshi. I can't breathe, Evie whined. She felt cramped and suffocated in this cushion-stuffed silk box. Suddenly, someone thrust a tray with two bowl-like cups through the curtains. Rose Thorn frowned, then chose a bowl. Evie took the other. It was chilly on the outside. There was no spoon, so the contents must be drinkable. She took the tiniest of sips. The taste was as refreshing as cold water, but with a slight, unfamiliar, fruit-like taste that cleared her head. She drank eagerly. Very nice, Rosethorn said appreciatively, when they had returned their bowls to the tray and the patient arm. Both tray and arm pulled away. It's coconut water. I showed you coconuts in the market last week. You see, Evie, there are benefits to this. Evie stared at her. Yan Jing has hungry ghosts that eat the insides of people and take their skins. Is that what happened to you? Is that why you're all calm? Then she noticed the beautifully carved supports around them. Rosethorn had run a hand over the wood once they were inside, telling her what it was called, though Evie hadn't listened. She was attentive now. The frame over Rosethorn's shoulder had sprouted a couple of leafy twigs. Shame twisted inside Evie's belly. While she had fussed, Rosethorn had been so tense that the wood of the palanquin had grown saplings to console her, despite its layers of polish. Evie smiled at Rosethorn. The drink was very nice, she said agreeably. Rosethorn raised her brows. That was too polite. What is the matter with you? Are you unwell? I just don't mean to be a burden to you, Evie explained as the palanquin surged into motion once more. Immediately, Rose Thorne set the inside of her wrist against Evie's forehead. No, you're not running a fever, she said. Where did you get this burden notion? The palanquin moved into the shade and halted again. This time, Eunuchs on both sides opened the curtains. They offered silk-clad arms so the emperor's guests could climb out of their luxurious box. Once they were on their feet, imperial waiting women rushed forward to straighten Evie's layers and even Rosethorn's habit. They backed away when Rosethorn glared at them. Or had they seen the tiny saplings that also sprouted on the outside of the palanquin's box? Evie wasn't sure. She held still, determined to be good for once, and not give Rose Thorne anything to worry about. Instead, she looked at the ceiling, while the women tidied her robes and hair. There was a ceiling because they had been brought inside a huge stone building. The rafters were dark, gilded wood hung with huge paper lanterns. Evie was grateful that the lanterns weren't lit. It was fairly cool in here, except for the occasional drift of warm air from outside. An insistent thumb called her away from her thoughts on weather and rafters. A maid was pushing on her chin, while another waited with a pot of red lip paint. I'm too young for that, Evie said flatly in Tion. What she wanted to say was that the court women with their single drop of red on each upper and lower lip looked stupid. But Rosethorn wouldn't like that. Take that red stuff away. Evie, Rosethorn said, warning dripping from her voice. I let them put the white stuff and the rouge on my face because you told me to, Evie said. If anyone within earshot speaks Chamuri, it serves them right for eavesdropping, she thought fiercely. I look like a tumbler in a show. I will not let them give me the drop of blood. The maids at their guest pavilion had told them that was the name for the current style in lip paint. Both she and Rosethorn turned when they heard the scrape of a chain on the floor. But all the ladies who must make their kowtow to his imperial majesty wear the drop of blood and the lily face, the stranger said. 
He had stopped next to the newly arrived Briar, as if for contrast. Briar was a slender youth, handsome and smiling in his own set of green, peach, and ivory-colored robes. He did not wear the stiffened black silk cap of a non sure or a noble, leaving his short, glossy black hair uncovered. The newcomer also had very short black hair. He wore only a white garment, like very loose, draped breeches that ended at his knees. He was a darker bronze than Briar, heavy with muscle and scarred as a warrior was scarred. His wrists and ankles were secured by gold shackles and connected by lengths of heavy gold chain. His wrist shackles were chained to a throat collar, also gold. He saw the direction that Evie's eyes had taken and raised his wrists a little, tightening the chains that led from throat to arms to feet. No, I'm the only one required to wear these, he said, a wry twist on his mouth. It makes it difficult for me to run away. He bowed deeply and saluted first Rosethorn, then Evie, then Briar, by touching his fingers to his brawny chest, then to his lips, and last to his forehead. I am Parahon, the latest imperial amusement. Just now, I am ordered to bring you into the presence. I am, Rosethorn began. Rosethorn, Parahon interrupted. Though I have trouble believing that so beautiful a rose has any thorns at all. You have no idea, Briar murmured, as he fell in step with Evie behind Parahan and Rosethorn as they walked out into the open. The big captive led them to a small cluster of three chairs at the foot of a stone dais. Evie saw now that they stood at the top of a short pyramid, its point had been lopped off to make a platform. Briar dug a sharp elbow into Evie's side and nodded in the direction of the throne. The emperor was looking at them. Hurriedly, Evie joined Briar and Rosethorn in a deep bow. Parahan managed to kneel without his chains getting in the way. Like the emperor's messengers and garmishing, he touched his hands and forehead to the stones. The emperor only nodded casually to them. Then he turned his attention to what lay before them all. They did the same as Parahan got to his feet. The view spread out below the pyramid left all three of the newcomers silent and staring. Before them, horsemen rode in complex patterns, fighting mock combats with long spears and swords, shooting at targets and racing down grassy strips set on either side of the sprawling field. Periodically, at the rear of the performing troops, something would boom. In the distance, earth would explode into the air and fall. What was that? Evie cried the first time it happened. Boom dust, Briar muttered in imperial. His hands were clenched into fists on the arms of his chair. He still had nightmares of the time pirates had attacked his and Rosethorn's home with the brand new weapon, maiming and killing many. Parahan sat cross-legged on the stones between Rosethorn and Briar. I don't know your name for it, he said in Teon, half turning to look up at Briar. Here it's called Zayao, and I think they have the right to call it whatever they want, since they invented it. His gaze sharpened as he took more notice of Briar's hands and the movement under his skin. Raya, be kind. What happened to you? Briar sighed and stretched out one hand so Parahan could have a closer look. I was trying out a little tattoo, he explained. Something with vegetable dyes I made up myself? I'm a green mage. I applied it with one of my foster sister's needles. She's a stitch witch, Evie said cheerfully. She never tired of the story. She spent so much of her time feeling stupid around Briar that it was very comforting to know he could be stupid too. She is more than a stitch witch, Rosethorn corrected. 
She is a thread mage. He borrowed the needles she uses in her magic. It wasn't like she has one set for sewing and one for magic, Briar protested. Her sewing is her magic. Anyway, he told Parahan, after glaring at Rosethorn, it should have worked. Only the flowers I put on my hands weren't just pictures after all. They grow, Evie explained. They bloom and move around and die and grow some more. And they're growing up along his arms. I think it's splendid. Hmm, Parahan said. May I? Briar let the man turn his hands over and inspect them. Parahan saw deep pock marks in Briar's palms, reminders of a determined thorny vine that had not wanted to release the boy when he was younger. The man noted that the flowers and leaves grew under Briar's fingernails. When he lifted Briar's hand to let the silk robes slide back, he even saw that the colorful plants continued up the young man's arms, moving and opening leaves or new blossoms and sending out new stems as he watched. Finally, he said cautiously, I find it very interesting that a young fellow would want to put flowers on his hands. Might you have been trying to cover over something? Oh, between your thumb and forefinger, perhaps? Evie covered her giggles with both hands. This friendly stranger had guessed Briar's secret. Before he had been a mage, Briar was a thief and jailbird, with two arrests to his discredit, and two jailhouse X tattoos, one on the web between the thumb and forefinger of each hand. He'd been arrested a third time, about to go to hard labor for life, when a mage had seen the magic in Briar and brought him to Rosethorn. Briar glanced at the throne and its occupant. Neither the emperor nor his immediate court was within earshot. I'm reformed, practically, Briar said quietly, his voice very dry. And I do so much more damage as a non sure than I did as a thief. Parahan released him with a sigh. I am only envious, he confessed. Had I been a mage of your skills, instead of a spoiled warrior prince, I might have stopped my uncle from selling me to the emperor. You were wondering about my attire. He shook his wrists, making his chains jingle. This interested Rosethorn. Your uncle sold you? Parahan grinned displaying strong white teeth. You should pity him. I know he would much rather have killed me so he would be sure to inherit my father's throne someday. Sadly, my uncle did not dare to do so. Parahan looked out over the field. The horsemen were forming in brigades to either side of the great field. In Kombanpur, where I come from, one of the realms of the sun, it is very bad luck to kill a twin. I have the good fortune to be one such with my sister, Sudamini. Actually, I am not certain if my uncle believes in bad luck in general, or if he simply knows what would happen if Suda learned I was dead by his hand. He winked one large brown eye at Evie. I'm the easygoing one. Suda is the battle cat. Anything else they might have discussed was drowned out as musicians came forward to strike drums, blow horns, and hammer large gongs. The explosions stopped. Those who had set them off cleared away. In the distance, Evie could see a line of color. Slowly, it grew larger and larger still, until she realized that she was looking at line after line of armored soldiers flanked by officers and flag bearers. After them came teams of camels pulling catapults and companies of archers. Spaced between companies of foot soldiers, archers, and the teams that worked with each catapult and its ammunition were men and women on horseback. Many of them wore the long black silk robe and cap of a non -shirt. Evie did not need the wardrobe to identify the role played by the new arrivals. To her ambient magic, 
the power of these people blazed from around their necks and wrists. They had to be wearing some kind of spell-worked stones as jewelry. If they embroidered occult signs or threaded their stones on cotton or linen, they would be just as obvious to Rosethorn and Briar. None of them spoke as the army marched and marched and marched, its members coming all the way up to the foot of the Imperial Pavilion. When at last the drums, gongs, and horns fell silent, and there was no more movement on the ground, the army stretched as far as Evie could see. Her skin was crawling with goosebumps. She had never seen such a large force in her life. The officers yelled something, and the warriors shouted in Tion. Three times they repeated it, making Evie's ears ring. It took her a moment to realize they had cried out, Long live the emperor! When they stopped, the emperor left his throne and walked down to the foot of the dais, where those soldiers who were fairly close could see him. Two black-clad mages moved forward to stand each at one of his elbows. Then he raised his hands and began to speak. Stones at the mages' necks blazed. The emperor's voice rolled across the field like thunder. He praised their strength. He praised their obedience to him and to the gods of Gyeongshi. He promised his warriors battles and honor and tales to tell their grandchildren. Last of all, he cried, Death to the enemies of Yan Jing. All of the people who stood before him, even the riders had dismounted by then, dropped to their hands and knees. Nine times in utter silence, they touched their foreheads to the ground. The last time, they remained in that position. I am really starting to hate that ceremony, Briar muttered softly in Imperial. The Emperor and his mages walked away, around the far side of the dais. Other mages and nobles streamed off the dais after him. Are we supposed to follow? Rosethorn asked Parahan. I have been placed in charge of escorting you to the Hall of Imperial Greetings, the big man explained. We're waiting for the crowd to ease. Then we can go. Why didn't he greet us here? Evie wanted to know. I would imagine because he wanted you to admire one of his armies. Parahan replied blandly. He likes to show them off to visitors. For a long moment, no one said anything at all. Evie was wondering if she was the only one left breathless by Parahan's words when Rosethorn said, This is just... One of his armies? Oh, yes, Parahan said quietly. Specifically, it is the one for center Yanjing. I have also seen the armies for north Yanjing and south Yanjing. South is much larger. I am told north was much larger before he decided to fight three of his neighbors at once. Why does he show you all his armies? Briar asked. Parahan shook his head. Oh, it's nothing to do with me. He likes to show them off to everyone. He reminds his friends that he is a dread enemy, and he gets word to his enemies that it would be better if they surrendered. And his guests? Rosethorn asked. Our home in Emelon is neither friend nor enemy. Why show them to us? Parahan replied, So you will tell those you meet what you have seen. Chapter 3 The Hall of Imperial Greetings, The Winter Palace, Dohan, in Yanjing They were not presented immediately. Parahan escorted them to their guest pavilion, where a Yanjing Yi meal waited for them. Before they could eat, however, the maids who waited on them removed what Briar had mockingly called their army-viewing clothes. These were replaced with loose robes so they could eat without fear of spoiling any silks or linens. Rosethorn wasn't sure what made her happier, the cooler garments or the food. 
She had been afraid she would have to face the official presentation with no more in her belly than coconut water. Now, as she settled on crossed legs before the low table, she realized that Parahan meant to stand back with the dining room servants. Join us, please, she said. I won't be able to touch a bite if you loom over us. The servants twittered, shocked that their guests would ask a captive to eat with them. But once Rosethorn caught their eyes, they fell silent. Parahan didn't need to be invited twice. Immediately, he sat on his heels next to Briar and helped himself to pulse bean soup, roast goose, cherries preserved in honey, and baked lamb. Rosethorn had only taken a few mouthfuls before she noticed that the servants were all too willing to give Evie rolled fried cakes, sugared jujube berries, and numerous other sweets while they ignored Parahan. If the emperor's people were going to insist on serving his guests, as they had done since the newcomer's arrival from Gyeongshi, Rosethorn decided she might as well take advantage of it. She looked at the servants and raised a single eyebrow. They were so well-trained that they froze instantly. Once she had their attention, she looked at Parahan, since he had not been supplied with eating sticks he was using his fingers, then looked at the servants again. Immediately, one of them brought a finger bowl so the big man could wash his hands. Another placed a fresh pair of eating sticks in a proper stone holder before him. A third maid waited for him to indicate his choices for a second helping. Parahan blinked up at her, then began to point. Satisfied, Rosethorn whisked three small dishes of sweets away from Evie and showed her own server that Evie could have twice-cooked fish, water reed shoots, and sliced turnips in sauce. If she let the child eat according to her own taste, Evie's teeth would rot out, mage or no. Evie glared at her new meal, her lower lip thrust out. Rosethorn ignored her. The girl would eat, or not. Briar, at least, was minding his manners and pointing out his choices to the maids. They had almost started an incident on their arrival when Rosethorn had tried to insist that they would serve themselves. It had taken the august mistress of the guest pavilions herself to explain that things were done in a certain way when one was a guest of the emperor, and to do them any other way was to get one's servants' heads cut off. After that, Rosethorn had ground her teeth and borne it. As a dedicate, she was far more accustomed to being the servant, or at the very least, to doing her part of the chores. Being waited on itched in all of the places where her vows had become part of her. With Parahan and Evie properly attended to, she picked at her own roast goose. Her appetite had shrunk since their arrival at the Winter Palace. So many things here had a deadly result for the servants, not the guests. She couldn't even go for a walk in the gardens. Seeing the gardens would have soothed her, but the servants were supposed to keep her from doing so until she, Briar and Evie, had been officially presented to Emperor Wei Shu. How many ceremonies would they have to endure before she could see the emperor's famed gardens? His lily ponds alone were renowned as far west as Emelon. Parahan had gotten Evie to talk about her magic. Not only was she chattering away, but she was eating her vegetables. Briar caught Rosethorn's eye and winked, making her smile. Bless him, too, she thought. She hadn't thought how much she would come to depend on Briar's support when they had set out on this very long journey. He had taken complete charge of Evie and Gyeongshi, when it was such a struggle for her to breathe. Rosethorn had tried to thank him for it once. He had only kissed her on the forehead and told her not to be silly. It made her feel both grateful and weak, and she hated to feel weak. Only the knowledge that he was her boy and they had passed beyond what was owed to whom years ago kept her from hating herself and him. She needed to find her strength again. But this place, with its crushing weight of imperial authority, 
was starting to seem an unlikely place for her to heal. Briar reached over with his eating sticks and plucked a slice of roast goose from her plate. The maids gasped and giggled behind their hands. Rosethorn frowned at him. It's bad manners to leave this wonderfully cooked food on the plate, and you're toying with it, Briar retorted, his mouth full. He reached with his sticks again. This time, Rose Thorne snatched her plate away and began to eat. And don't you give yourself airs, she warned when she had finished. I wouldn't think of it, Briar assured her. I want to live to get home. The waiting women came forward, bowing and looking anxious. Parahan rose to his feet in a single athletic movement. Rose Thorne almost sighed aloud and stopped herself in time. She was no schoolgirl to moon over a handsome man, she told herself. She was just envious, because the days when she did not have to first get to her knees, then straighten first one leg, then the other, in order to stand, were long over. Yes, that was it. These pretty ladies are telling us that they will get into trouble if they do not have you dressed into the palanquin soon. As will I, Parahan said. Of course, he was totally unaware of Rose Thorne's interesting thoughts. Then let us get clothed, Rose Thorne said, rising to her feet as gracefully as she could. Once she was on them, she could not resist. She stopped and smiled at Briar and Evie. Of course, I still only have to wear a shift and a single robe. Ignoring Evie's wails, she walked into the airy, luxurious room that was hers for their stay. Parahan had not been joking. The Hall of Imperial Greetings was a work of art in itself. The chained man led them down a long hallway where the walls and ceiling were lacquered bright yellow. Ornately carved ebony benches were placed along one side of the corridor so nobles could sit, chatter, and be waited on and fanned by serving women and eunuchs. All of them watched their small group go by, their faces emotionless. They reached the middle third of the hall. On one side, large paintings in the Yan Jing Yi style attracted admirers. They showed lush, beautiful scenes of palace life, gardens, and mountains. These had attracted groups of viewers who discussed them with soft voices. On the other side of the broad corridor, placed under windows cut high in the wall, hung large gold cages. Their purpose was made clear by their size and the ceramic chamber pot on the bottom. There was no screen for privacy no blanket for warmth. If the absent prisoners were given food and water, the evidence was cleared away. The empty cages swung a little in the thin breezes from the windows and hallway. That one is mine, Parahan said, pointing to the last one in the line. Usually the guides tell guests I am a chieftain from a savage kingdom among the realms of the sun. The emperor keeps me here when he has nothing for me to do. Or, if he wishes to point me out as an example to one of his nobles or generals. Evie looked at the cage, then at Parahan with horror. That's all the room you have? Parahan twined and untwined the chains around his wrists. It's better than some of the other places he stows his captives. He put me in a couple of those at first. They had reached a huge round opening framed in teak. Beyond it stood a partial wall that was covered in rough gold silk and embroidered with two horned, winged lions. A eunuch, his face painted white, his long black hair left to stream down his back, waited there for them. His eyes had been lined all around with black paint. He was gloriously robed in bright turquoise blue, red and palest yellow. Parahan bowed to the eunuch. Master of presentations, I bring you these most honored guests of the imperial lord of us all. Carefully, he introduced each of them in order of their age and expertise in magic, beginning with Rosethorn. 
He then introduced the eunuch as the master of presentations to the emperor, first among the imperial eunuchs. When he was done, Parahan told them, And that's my part. You'll see me again. Don't worry. The master of presentations will look after you well. He grinned cheerfully at all of them, and then walked off, his chains jingling. Evie wanted to whimper. Losing Parahan felt like losing a particularly warm and comforting blanket. She didn't whimper, though. Not here. Not in front of this proud-looking old man who wore more eye makeup than she and Rosethorn put together. The master of presentations looked each of them over, as if he expected their clothes to have stains or rips in them. Then he sniffed. I trust the ladies of your pavilion explained what you are to do when you are presented. He had a high, fluting voice. Of course they did, Rosethorn told him. Her bearing was suddenly as haughty as that of any noblewoman. As did the prince. Do you mean to delay us further? I will be her when I grow up, Evie thought joyfully, as the eunuch flinched and minced his way past them through the round opening. I know I will have to work hard at it, but I want to be just like her. They followed the master of presentations around the end of the golden wall. Before them spread a broad rectangular room, far more splendid than anything they had seen until now. Huge porcelain jars filled with live flowers perfumed the chamber with their scent. The roof was held up by thick pillars in precious woods, all painted with bright red enamel. Their ornate, fish-carved bases and capitals were covered in gold leaf. Overhead, paintings of gods and goddesses at play, or doing warlike things among dragons, lions, and other creatures, decorated a deep blue ceiling that was otherwise starred in gold leaf. Ornate gold lanterns hung from the tops of the columns to give light. On a dais at one side of the room, musicians played the instruments of the empire, including drums, flutes, a lute-like thing called a pippa, and the very long-necked lute called the erhu. Briar was learning to like Yan Jing Yi music. The erhu's sweet, mournful sound in particular was growing on him. Evie loved it, even the singing, as the sound of her childhood, while Rosethorn only sat silent and ground her teeth. Now, seeing the master of presentations trot by, the musicians put their instruments aside. The courtiers who swarmed through the room parted in front of the master of presentations, bowing slightly as he went past. He was bound for a gilded raised platform at the heart of the chamber. Briar fixed his eyes on their host. Like them, he had changed clothes from the yellow robes of the afternoon. Emperor Wei Shu Maorin Guan Gong Jian of the Long Dynasty was fifty years old. It showed only in the bits of gray at his temples and the startling splash of gray in the beard trimmed close to his chin. His mustache was as black as the rest of his hair. His eyes were the dark brown of Yan Jing, his skin the bronze of a Yan Jing warrior who spent plenty of time in the sun. He had broad cheekbones and a long nose. Horse nomad blood in the family, thought Briar. But his mother was a concubine and a captive, wasn't she? So maybe she was a horse nomad. Wei Shu's robe sported gold embroideries thickly clustered over bright yellow silk. It fastened at the neck and shoulder with more gold silk frogs. He rested his feet, modestly covered with plain black slippers on a stool. He held a folded blue fan in his lap, though two servants stood on either side of him, wielding much larger feathered fans to keep him cool. His head was covered with an intricately folded stiffened black silk cap. Behold the mighty emperor, sixth of his dynasty, beloved of all the gods. The master of presentations began as he came to a halt before the dais. Their small group stopped behind him. 
This was part of their introduction. The eunuch would list all of the emperor's titles, which would take a little while. Briar looked briefly to the right of the throne. There, Parahan knelt at the foot of the dais. He had been given an addition to his wardrobe, and not one that Briar liked. One more chain was fastened to the big man's gold collar. It led to the throne and looped around the emperor's left wrist. Briar looked down before anyone saw the fury in his eyes. He was surprised to find that he had developed a liking for Parahan. He thought it was cruel to treat him like an untamed beast. In the two years that he, Rosethorn, and Evie had traveled east, Briar had met a large number of people. He had learned something of warriors. Parahan had not gained his old scars by wrestling with his favorite hound. He'd gotten them by fighting. Perhaps this emperor was too accustomed to his bowing warriors and slaves. Maybe one day he would learn the hard way that putting a man in shackles didn't mean he was tame. The master of presentations reached an end to his gabble at last. Rosethorn bowed only as deeply as she had bowed to the god king. Dedicates of the living circle recognized no masters on the earth. Briar bowed deeper. He liked to let powerful folk think he was a nice, respectful boy. Evie, who was still a proper daughter of the Empire, even if she'd left with her family when she was four, went to her knees and touched her forehead to the ground nine times. Dedicate Rosethorn. The Emperor's voice was deep and pleasant, the essence of kindness. His teon was perfect. Briar wondered cynically if he'd had his voice magicked to sound good, then told himself he was being petty. We are greatly pleased to welcome you to our court, the emperor continued. Your reputation came here long ago, born by traders who brought us medicines and plant clippings obtained from you at very great cost and trouble. Rosethorn bowed again. I trust the medicines and plants gave satisfaction, your imperial majesty, she said. They taught us much of your great power, Wei Shu replied with a smile. We hope to honor you by introducing you to our gardens and hearing your opinion. Any advice you might give us will be a gift we could not hope to repay. I am greatly moved, Rosethorn said evenly. I did not believe I would receive such an honor once we had left Gyeongshi to come here. The whole world has heard of the Imperial Gardens. We had not realized you intended to visit the lesser gardens of our realms this summer, the Emperor said. Have you family or business here? He glanced at Evie. Business only as any gardeners would conduct when they venture far from home to new lands. Rosethorn explained. I had long promised myself a journey east to see what grows in different climates from my own. I had been forced to put off such travels often. Once Nan Shermas received his certification in magic, it seemed like a good time to journey together. Certainly, we are glad to take advantage of so great a gardener's visit, the emperor reassured her. Let us start our tour tomorrow, then, we must warn you, we begin our day with the rising of the sun. And she stays in bed until noon, Briar thought ironically. We are accustomed to early risings, temple dwellers and travelers as we have been, Rosethorn replied as graciously as any courtier. For someone who hates this stuff, Briar thought with pride, she does it really well. We shall send our servants to guide you to us then, the emperor told her. We look forward to speaking with you in a less formal setting. The emperor had turned his attention to Briar, who bowed and then gazed at the man with his most innocent expression fixed on his face. From Parahan, he heard something very much like a smothered snort. What did you think of the review of our troops this afternoon? 
Are you now eager to set aside your trowel and watering can for a sword and shield? Briar smiled. If it pleases your imperial majesty, I already get into plenty of trouble with plants. I shake to think of the kind of mischief I would find with conventional weapons. Interesting to find a youth who does not hanker for battle. The emperor raised a finger. A servant with a tray appeared from the shadows behind the throne. He knelt, offering the tray to Emperor Wei Shu. Another servant who had been standing just behind the emperor's elbow stepped forward and offered him one of the small porcelain cups on the tray. The emperor drained it. As he returned it to the standing servant, he asked Briar, Are the stories true? You are a full nun, sure, at such a youthful age? Briar swallowed a sigh. He'd been asked this question from Emelon to Yan Jing, and he was heartily bored with it. Slowly, he reached into the front of his robes. There was movement behind the emperor. Four mages stepped up to stand beside the throne on Wei Shu's left. Two were men in black scholar's robes and caps. One, a woman in scholar's robes. And the fourth, a mamander of the deserts west of Gyeongshi clad in the head-to-toe gray veil of those mages who worshipped the god Mohun. A knitted screen covered his, or her, eyes. These were all imperial mage guards and warriors, among Wei Shu's closest advisors. To his right were warrior and slave servants, the former being the only ones allowed to carry weapons in the room, the latter to wait upon their master. We must be careful, the emperor explained. A nan sure is the only kind of assassin who could get so close to us. Understandable, your imperial majesty, but we have not journeyed so far from home and lived by being stupid, Rosethorn said. For a moment, Briar knew. Their standing hung on the emperor's sense of humor. Then the man laughed, and everyone in the great chamber relaxed. Except Parahan, Briar noticed. He had never tensed up in the first place. Briar lifted his medallion free of his robes. On the front of the silvery metal, along the rim, his name and rose thorns were inscribed. At the middle, his magic was symbolized by the image of a tree. On the back was the spiral that meant he had studied at Winding Circle Temple. It was the Mohanite who came down the steps, walking between the throne and Parahan. The captive man tugged his leash hard enough to make it jingle, hinting that he considered tripping the mage. The Mohanite ignored him and stopped before Briar to extend a gloved hand palm up. Good of him to ask, under the circumstances, Briar thought. He held the medallion out to the length of the silk cord and placed it in the mage's hold. The Mohanite turned it over in his fingers, saying nothing. Sometimes, Briar wished he'd never gotten the thing. Their teachers had given the medallions to Briar and his three foster sisters two years ago, before he, Triss, and Daja had set forth on their wanderings. It was rare for mages so young to have them. Medallions were the proof that they were accredited mages, able to practice magic without supervision, and to teach. The four were forbidden to wear them publicly before they were eighteen, to prevent trouble. At this point, Briar was sure he wasn't going to wear his openly even at eighteen. Older mages were often furious to see it on him, though dedicate initiate Doc Yi hadn't seemed to care. Most mages didn't receive theirs until they were in their twenties. Briar hated the aggravation. The Mohanite gently placed the medallion on Briar's chest, gave him a small bow, and then climbed the dais. He raised his robe slightly to climb the steps. When he reached Parahan's leash, he placed one foot on it firmly, looking down at the captive. The big man replied with a wide grin. He placed his palms together and bowed. The Mohanite shook his head slightly and returned to his place beside the other mages. Truly impressive, the emperor said.
I should have expected as much from a student of the great mage Rosethorn. Briar bowed, wondering if his spine would start to curve after much more of this. I will never be what she is, your imperial majesty. There was humor in the emperor's eye as he said, And modest, are you certain you are a youth of sixteen years? There was a ripple of laughter among the listening courtiers, though no change of expression on the faces of the mages that Briar could see. Briar himself chose to smile and bow again. She has trained me very well, your imperial majesty, he explained. I learned manners under many blood-curdling threats. The emperor chuckled. His court responded with more soft laughter. She does not seem so terrifying to me, Nanshir Briar. Briar smiled cheerfully. She fools a lot of people that way. Once more, the emperor chuckled and his court followed suit. He did seem truly amused. Briar liked him better for that. The messenger who guided you here tells me that one of my former subjects travels with you, Wei Shu said. Evu me me dingzai, you may rise and come forward. Evie did as she was told. Briar could see her hair ornaments trembling. He knew it was probably against protocol, but he stepped closer and put an arm around her anyway for reassurance. The emperor leaned forward, resting his weight on his elbows. He was the very picture of an indulgent uncle, except for all that gold, Briar thought. Kindly Wei Shu said, We are told that you too have magic in your veins, unlike these poor servants of mine who must pull it from spells and potions. Evie bowed low and almost lost her balance. Only Briar's arm kept her from collapsing. Gently, he drew her upright again. You're all right, he whispered. I get my magic from stones, not my veins, your imperial majesty, Evie said as she stared at the floor. The emperor smiled. And how did you learn to get magic from dull stones, he asked. Or do you use those that have been spelled already? Evie glanced up at him, startled, then down again. All stones have magic in them, your imperial majesty, she said, a little more confidence in her voice. I can feel it, or I could, even before I studied. Now I can see it, too, just like Briar and Rosethorn see the magic in plants. We are taught of qi, the power that binds all things. The speaker was the older of the two male mages, a tall, slender old man with silver hair and long silver mustaches. His face was a maze of wrinkles. Like the other two Yan Jingyi mages, he wore beads of many kinds strung in loops around his neck and worn in multiple bracelets under his full sleeves. Briar closed his eyes briefly, adjusting part of himself. When he opened them again, he saw the light of magic everywhere, enough so that he didn't want to use the spell for long. He did hold it until he saw the blaze of power from each of the beads that were wooden. Even the other mages in the room didn't blaze with power as much as the two men and the woman in black robes. The oldest of the mages, who stood with the emperor, went on. It would seem this young student has learned more of qi than many of us have forgotten. Evie bowed to the old man, to Briar's surprise. I am certain that cannot be true, master, she said politely. I am deeply honored, but I can also recognize the depth of wisdom in a face a depth I will be lucky to ever attain. Such respect when we are all told those of the West are rude barbarians, said the emperor, applauding softly. The emperor held a hand out to Evie. It was laden with rings that gleamed with jade, rubies, sapphires, and pearls. Tell me what my ringstones say, he urged. When his armed guards and mage guards alike stirred, he held up his other hand. I think I am quite safe. 
Go on, Evu Mei Mei. Gently, Briar urged Evie forward. Slowly she climbed the dais and knelt beside the emperor, knowing that her head must never be higher than Wei Shu's. Then, nervously, she took the emperor's hand in both of hers. Suddenly, she smiled at him. They love you, Evie explained. Not the pearls. Well, maybe they do, I don't know. I don't understand pearls because they aren't really stones, just dirt that got in an oyster. Did you know that? Wei Shu nodded, his eyes dancing. I think it's a cheat to call them precious stones when they aren't really, Evie went on, happy as always to talk about rocks. But the others, they love you. They just glow from the inside. They've been with you for a long time, and some of them are very old. The emperor laughed outright. Evie quickly released his hand. I'm sorry, she cried. I wasn't trying to insult you. I didn't mean... She looked frantically at Rosethorn, then Briar. That's not what I meant. Calm down, Briar murmured to his student. See, he's laughing. He bowed to the emperor. She's all wound up. She's heard stories of the imperial court most of her life, and she's been scared to death about coming here. She has nothing to fear, Wei Shu assured Evie, smiling at her. The stones I believe you meant have come to me from my imperial ancestors. You are right. They are very old. And much may be forgiven so talented a young girl in so overpowering a place. So tell me, Nan Shi Briar Moss, how can you teach Evumeme if her power is drawn through stones and yours through plants? Briar didn't shrug. That would have been impolite. I could teach her the basics, your imperial majesty. Meditation, reading, writing, mathematics. The names and everyday properties of stones, and what they're traditionally used for. Evie does the rest herself. First dedicate Doc Yi helped me a lot this winter, Evie said. He's head of First Circle Temple in Garmishing, and an Earth Mage. And so far, it isn't too hard once I read the spells and have the sticky parts explained to me. A lot of stone wants to be shaped, even jade, if you know how to explain it right. Her face was brighter and livelier. Briar thought he might swell up completely with pride in her. Stone gets pretty bored, holding the same form all the time, Evie explained. Even mining it doesn't help, because nobody likes being smacked with a hammer. But if you wheedle just right, and tell it how it will like being smooth and bouncing light, and feeling its magic ripple along its inner surfaces, it's all you can do to keep it in the shape you want. Sometimes I just let the stone shape itself, for fun. And this Doc Yi helped you to do this? The emperor had retreated behind his blank official mask suddenly. He showed you how to shatter rocks? Ebby screwed up her face and shrugged. Briar nudged her to remind her where she was. Oh, no, your imperial majesty, she said, bowing swiftly. No, he said he never tried it my way. He uses spells and puts the spell on stones. I don't see why. He could probably do it like I do, but he thinks stone is dead. The emperor laughed, so those who could hear them did so as well. Evie had that effect on people. Did you enjoy your time in Garmashing? Wei Shu asked Evie. It is a very old and mystical place, I am given to understand, with much that is unusual in the way of temple art. Evie bowed. It's very cold, your imperial majesty, she said as she straightened. And it's harder to breathe than it is here. The mountains were splendid. Her face lit up. Granite and other stones scratching at the sky. Have you seen them, your imperial majesty? Sadly, I have not, the emperor told her gravely. When my family went west, we took the north caravan route, so I didn't see them then. Evie explained. We came to Garmishing the same way. It was snowing so bad that nobody would let me get any closer to the mountains than the cliffs along the Tom Sho River, but I caught glimpses on clear days. Now I believe the books that said they're the tallest mountains anywhere. 
Evie shook her head. I wish we'd seen the Drimba Kang Sharlog on the way here. But your messenger was in such a hurry, and there were storms that your weather mages were holding off us. I couldn't see anything but the storms overhead. I thought I could hear the mountains, though. The emperor clapped his hands with delight. Dedicate initiate Rosethorn, it is wonderful that you have brought Evumeme and Briar to visit us. I must ensure that Evumeme has a suitable companion while we absorb ourselves in the wonders of the palace gardens. The rippling bang of a small gong interrupted every conversation in the room. The emperor looked toward the entry with a frown. Everyone else turned that way with interest, except for Rosethorn. Briar saw that she was looking the room over, paying special interest to the plants. An emerald-robed eunuch, his face painted white like that of the Master of Presentations, stood by the entry with a small gong in his hands. His Most Glorious Excellency, the War Lion of the Empire, the Sword of the Emperor, Defender of the Long Throne, Terror of the Foreigners, Commander of the Imperial Armies, Great Mage General Feng Qi Heng Kai. A short, stocky man in iron scale and leather armor under a scarlet robe strode across the room without so much as a glance for any of the courtiers. His square, blunt-nosed face was marked with scars and cruelty. He carried a pointed metal helm and wore no weapons. Once he reached the foot of the dais, standing near Evie, he set his helm aside, went to his hands and knees, and touched his forehead to the floor. The emperor stood. All of the Yan Jing Yi courtiers went to their hands and knees, as did Parahan and those who shared the top of the dais with Wei Shu. Foreigners bowed deep, including Rose Thorn Briar and Evie. You have met my captive Parahan, have you not, dedicate initiate Rose Thorn? Nan Shi Briar, student Evie Mei Mei? He will entertain you now, the emperor said, motioning to Parahan. The big man sat up on his knees with a jingling of chains. He might have been the king of Kombanpur in the realms of the sun one day, if his uncle had not sold him to me. He looked at his mages. The leash may come off. To Rosethorn, Briar, and Evie, he said cheerfully, Once his uncle captures Parahan's twin sister, I will have a matched set. Now, Mage General. The Emperor snapped his fingers and led his mages down the far side of the dais. His general walked around to meet him there while every courtier nearby backed off in a hurry. That left only Parahan, Rosethorn, Evie, and Briar near the throne. No one else was within earshot. Briar would have liked to meet some of the other courtiers and listen to the local gossip, but he was not going to get the chance. Everyone had drawn away from Parahan and his foreign companions. If Briar tried to amble away, anyone who looked in their direction would notice, and no doubt report it to the Imperial Snoops. Briar hated being without information in a strange place, but for now, he would simply have to smile and play the part of an overwhelmed Imperial guest. Parahan's leash drew away from him to curl itself at the foot of the throne, snake-like. Evie glared at it, then asked the man, does he keep you chained up all of the time? Evie, Rosethorn snapped. Parahan rested a hand on Evie's shoulder. It's all right, he said. Evie, may me. Evie, she interrupted. Evie, Parahan corrected himself with a grin. Reminds me very much of my sister, Sudamini. She is full of questions, too. No, at night I am returned to my cage he told Evie. Evie's face fell. It isn't a joke? They really put you in one of those things? I do not joke about the many torments Yan Jing has developed over its centuries, Parahan replied, a shadow passing over his face. He smiled abruptly. My lot has improved since my first days as the imperial captive. Now, if the emperor is receiving guests or out and about, he takes me along. I believe you will see a great deal of me during your visit, particularly if someone grows tired of gardens. 
He winked at Evie. The gong was rattling again. The eunuch who had announced the general came forward to proclaim that an imperial courier had come. This person trotted over to the area on the far side of the dais, where the emperor conferred with his general. Parahan was telling the three of them about the different treasure chambers of the palace when the master of presentations found them. The son of the gods, light of the heavens, glory of his dynasty, his imperial majesty has asked me to say that he must end your audience. The business of the empire calls him away. You should be honored that he deigns to share his reasons with you. He does not explain himself to many. Now come with me. The master walked away, leaving them no time for polite farewells to Parahan. Briar knew that Rosethorn would be as aware as he was that they were being steered away from the rest of the imperial court and any other foreigners who were present. Briar had hoped to glean some information on the emperor's plans for Gyeongshi, if any, for the god king, but that would be impossible if the emperor's people kept them buttoned up this way throughout their visit. He also would have liked to examine the many flowering plants set throughout the room. Instead, the master of presentations shooed them through a side entrance Briar had not noticed before. They were outside. Their palanquins waited there on a small side road. No slow walk through a corridor meant to overwhelm visitors, Briar thought cynically. Now they just want to rush us back to our pavilion before we can talk to anyone. But why? The master of presentations didn't even wait to see them off. Chapter 4 The Imperial Gardens, the Winter Palace, Dohan in Yanjing Slowly, Evie drifted to the end of the procession that followed Emperor Weishu, Rosethorn, and Briar through the series of gardens they had entered shortly after dawn that morning. She was starved. In their rush to watch everything bloom, or whatever reason they had chosen for getting out of bed at this hour, they had not stopped for breakfast. Also, she was bored. The servants wouldn't let her touch the ornamental rocks on the walkway borders and the odd decorations within the gardens. Other than those, Evie could see no stones anywhere. It was hard to believe that they had all been dug up and carted away. But she felt nothing other than the border stones within a couple of feet of the surface. So where were they? She was so busy pouting that she didn't realize someone was behind her until his hand touched her shoulder. Startled, she jumped with a squeak. Easy, easy, Parahan said. I didn't mean to frighten you. He was dressed just as he'd been dressed the night before, in the very loose loincloth-like garment that seemed to be all the emperor would allow him. He still wore chains, too. They hadn't even given him shoes. Drops of water shone in his short hair and on his scarred shoulders. Are all those from fighting? She asked, pointing to his scars. No, my mother gave me my shoulders, he said. Silly, if they look like cuts, of course they're from fighting. I was leading soldiers from the time I was 14. I bet you're hungry. They didn't give us time to eat this morning. Evie complained. Come on, I'm hungry too. Parahan put his finger to his lips and steered Evie down a side path. Two of the guards from the entourage broke off to accompany them. Evie spun and glared at them. Parahan turned her back around. Don't blame them. I have to have guards whenever I'm off my leash, he told her. Wei Shu likes me too much to let me escape, though how far I would get in these chains, I can't imagine. I doubt there are many smiths who would take them off or pick the locks. And the palace gardens may be huge, but the wall around them is quite high and well guarded by magic and by soldiers. Evie's heart sank. If he really liked you, he'd give you an army so you could go home and kick your uncle all the way to Namorn, Evie replied. Now you sound like my sister. Weishu likes to dangle me over my uncle's head, Parahan explained. Right now, my father lives. One messenger from the emperor, and my uncle dies. 
So long as my uncle sends gold, opium, and jewels to the emperor, he is safe. When my father dies, if my uncle does not continue his tribute to the emperor, he knows the emperor will send me home with an army. So, I am the emperor's most rewarding toy. That would make me angry, Evie informed Parahan. You're free, he replied. You can afford anger. Besides, I hear many interesting things at the emperor's feet. My father always complained that I spent all my time in school joking around. He would be very pleased if he knew how much I was learning now. The walkway he'd chosen led through a bamboo grove to the banks of a bubbling creek. They crossed on a high arched bridge, carved and decorated as all Yan Jingyi bridges were, following the path to an ancient oak grove. They stopped at the foot of a black barked ancient tree with branches so heavy, some of them bowed to touch the ground before they arched up again. Oh, that's better, Evie said. Dropping to her knees, she set her palms against two of the lumps of red and yellow sandstone, clutched tight by the oak's exposed roots. What have the gardeners here got against rocks, anyway? Don't blame them. Parahan stretched out on a length of mossy ground that was clear of rocks and roots. The guards sat on their heels a few feet from them. One took out a dice box and they began to play. It isn't the gardeners, but the imperial will. Unless the garden is supposed to be a little picture of a place with bridges, a stream, small trees, rocks, and so on, the emperor wants each garden to be absolutely tidy. There can't be anything to distract from the flowers. Not weeds, not insects, not stones. It's a sad gardener who doesn't remove everything but the proper plant. I can't like any garden without stones, Evie murmured, discovering the differences between sandstone here and sandstone in Gyeongshi. It would be like taking someone's ribs out. What can you do with stones, if I may ask? Parahan asked. Can you change the course of a stone hurled by a catapult? Evie made a face. Some of the people who had hosted them on their journey west had asked such questions. Oddly, she didn't mind them coming from Parahan. He was just staring at the sky and making conversation. No, catapult stones are too big. I can only help them get to where they're going faster. Look, I can do this. She reached into the sandstone under her hands and sank light into the thousands of grains of quartz, apatite, and garnet that were part of it. When she heard Parahan inhale, she realized that she had closed her eyes. She had not needed them to tell her the sandstones under her fingers were blazing. The guards were babbling in the language of the imperial court to each other. Ignoring them, she opened her eyes and grinned at Parahan. I can do it with heat, but heat won't stay long in sandstone or limestone. I need pure crystal or gemstone to hold light or heat for very long. I'm really good at lamps. We saved all kinds of money traveling because we didn't have to buy torches or lamp oil. Parahan got to his knees and, keeping his chains out of the way, crawled over until he could hold a hand over a glowing stone. Will it burn? Oh, no, Evie told him. Rosethorn threatened to send me to bed without supper if I didn't learn to do cold light and hot heat every time. Parahan grinned as he touched the stones. No heat at all. She only threatened you? I missed too many meals before she and Briar took me on. I don't think she likes taking food from me, even to teach me something. Speaking of food, Parahan raised his beak of a nose to sniff the air. I smell fried cakes and ginger. He looked at the glowing stones. We can't take these. The gardeners will get in trouble if anything is missing. Evie frowned. Stones in a wood should be free to go where they want if they let go of their soil. Not that I'd pry these fine fellows loose. They're happy with their tree. Stones in a wood that does not belong to the emperor, perhaps, Parahan murmured. 
He got to his feet and gave Evie a hand up as the light from the stones faded. Let's see what we can steal from the cooks. The guards stood too. You can't steal the emperor's breakfast, said the darker-skinned guard in Tion. We won't steal, Evie told them, all innocence. We'll borrow from the edges, from the stuff they give people who aren't imperial. Parahan hooked arms with Evie, and they marched up the path. Rose Thorn had to wonder if she was meant by her gods to spend her entire visit to the Winter Palace in a towering state of vexation. For one thing, when the Emperor said they would visit his gardens, he meant that he, Rose Thorn, and Briar, as well as a gaggle of mages and courtiers, watched as gardeners dealt with the plants. If she even touched one, the gardeners hovered as if they feared she might break it. For another thing, she and Briar had been forced to wear silk again today, because they were in the imperial presence. She should have known they would not be allowed to get dirty when the maids placed silk clothes before them that morning. Third, she was deeply unhappy with the mages who dogged their tracks. They drowned the voices of the wind in the leaves and flowers of the garden with the constant click of their strings of beads. She had heard that eastern mages favored beads imprinted with spells and strung together to be worn on neck and wrist. She had seen local mages twirling short strings of spell beads during their journey down from Ice Lion Pass. Court mages wore ropes of them. Apparently, Rose Thorn and Briar in a garden were considered far more dangerous than Rose Thorn and Briar in a throne room. As if we couldn't have turned those potted plants into weapons, Rose Thorn thought, as the breeze carried another burst of hollow clicks to her ears. She rounded on the mages. I can't hear a thing these plants say with that unending noise, she informed them. All around her, the emperor's prized roses, brought at great expense from far Sharon and raised more carefully than most children, trembled and reached for her across the stone borders of the path. The courtiers shrank closer together, terrified of touching those priceless blossoms. Wei Shu looked on, his face emotionless. Briar raised his hands to both sides of the path. The roses halted their movement and waited, trembling. Rosethorn had not taken her eyes off the mages. What are you doing with those things? she demanded. I'm not working magic. If I were, you couldn't distract me with noisemakers. They are not noisemakers, said the youngest of them, a woman. Our magic is inscribed in the marks on each bead. The greater the mage, the more inscriptions, the more spells on a bead, and the more beads. Rosethorn squinted at the ropes that ran through the woman's fingers. The small bone-white beads that made up the bulk of her wrist and neck strings, as well as those of her fellow mages, were etched with minuscule ideographs. In between those beads were others, some brown glass inscribed with Yan Jing Yi characters, some white porcelain with heaven blue characters and figures, some carnelian with engraving on the surface. As I said, I am not using magic. Would you do me a favor and be quiet? She asked, as patiently as she knew how. The plants tell me how they're doing, when I can hear them. Even if I did magic, I strongly doubt that you would detect it, you academic prancer, she thought. Like most ambient mages, Rose Thorn had little patience for those who drew their power from their own bodies and worked it through spells though she had studied academic magic in her youth. Is Nan Sha Briar not using magic? An older mage asked. Not only did this man have two long ropes of beads in his hold, but there were spell figures tattooed onto his hands and wrists. Unlike Briar's, this man's tattoos were motionless. Briar lowered his hands. I asked them to stop trying to help Rosethorn. Rose Thorn let her own power flow into the bushes, calming the roses. As she suspected, not one of the Yan Jing Yi mages so much as twitched. 
Ambient magic was not only rare here, it was unknown. She called her power back into herself and looked at Wei Shu. If you would like me to tell you if they are well, I must be able to concentrate, Your Imperial Majesty, she explained. I see you think I am deluded, claiming to hear the voices of plants. Don't your priests hear the voices of ghosts and mountains? Ghosts were once men, and our mountains are ancient, Wei Shu said. Blossoms live but a season, and plants a few years at best. Perhaps some of our oldest trees have voices, or the spirits within them do. But it takes ages for living things to gain the wisdom of human beings. Everyone around them but Briar murmured their agreement. Rosethorn bit her lip rather than call them all fools. Royalty, their pet mages, and their pet nobles seemed to think they knew everything. The mages she was used to dealing with knew instead that they were just beginning to scrape the surface of the world. And what about you? she asked herself as she followed the emperor along the garden's main path. Weren't you starting to think you had all the answers before Nico brought Briar and the girls to Winding Circle? Before their magics started to combine? We all learned there was no predicting how their power would turn out. We couldn't have guessed that four eleven-year-olds could shape the power of an earthquake, or that one girl's metal flower would take root and bloom in a vein of copper ore, or that those children would pull me back from death itself. I could never have dreamed some of the ways Briar has learned to shape his magic, or Evie hers. I needed shaking up. We all did. She felt the ailing rose bush before she saw it. Immediately, she and Briar stepped off the path. They'd just reached it. Only a single branch showed brown and wilted blooms. When they heard Wei Shu thunder, What is this? They stared at him as courtiers and mages fell to their knees and bowed until their foreheads touched the stone flags of the path. Six gardeners who had been hanging back among the roses, ran forward to drop to the ground before Wei Shu and do the same. Briar looked at Rosethorn, waiting for instructions. She clasped her hands and watched the emperor, letting her power trickle gently into the ailing plant all the while. She could feel the touch of the wetlands fungus that had gotten into the roots and was eating it. What manner of care do you give our roses? the emperor demanded. How is it that we find an imperfect one on the very day we bring important nanshirs, great nanshirs, who know much about plants, to view them? You will be beaten until your backs run red, head gardener. One of them looked up from the ground. He was trembling. Remove this wretched bush and burn it. Replace it with another that does not offend our eye, Wei Shu ordered. Rosethorn had heard enough. When the poor head gardener touched his forehead to the ground once more, she gave a slight bow. If I may, your imperial majesty, she asked. The emperor nodded and she said, There is no need to uproot this plant. It's been attacked by a mold native to these lands, a fast-growing one. I can tell this damage happened overnight, and we are here quite early. How could your gardeners have known? Wei Shu looked down his nose at her. It was their duty to know. Rosethorn tucked her hands inside the sleeves of her robe so he would not see she had clenched them into fists. Of all the silly replies. Your imperial majesty, as a gardener, you know how delicate roses can be, particularly out of their native climate. This province is lush and green most of the year, I am told and very damp. The homelands of the Rose are in the southern and eastern parts of the pebbled sea, dry lands. And like most things that are transplanted here, they grow ferociously fast. In growing fast, this Rose helped the fungus grow. The bush is fine now, your imperial majesty, Briar said, taking over smoothly. Rosethorn knew he must have seen she was struggling with her temper. 
She should not have to explain this to someone like the Emperor, who claimed to know about gardening. Briar gestured to the plant like a showman. It was green and glossy everywhere, the blooms a perfect red. Healthy as ever, healthier because Rosethorn made it resistant to your local molds, your Imperial Majesty, Briar announced. Rosethorn wound threads of her own power throughout the roots of all the plants in the garden to ensure just that, as Briar added. I'll wager your gardeners must run mad fighting mold. Without raising their heads, the gardeners nodded rapidly. Rosethorn and I can fix that while we're here, most charitable and wise majesty, Briar said. Rosethorn refused to give him the fish eye, as she usually did when her boy laid things on too thick. No one else would notice. This was the way they normally addressed the emperor. To her, Briar sounded like the flattering, thieving imp who had stolen his way into her garden and workroom five years ago. Briar told the emperor, We've got advantages these poor fellows don't. It would be our pleasure to do this for you. He looks like he swallowed sour milk, Rosethorn thought, watching the emperor. Then he was the smooth, unreadable emperor again. You cannot fight these illnesses? he asked the gardeners. The head gardener did not look up. No, glorious son of the gods, protector of the empire, imperial majesty. It is as they say. The heat and the wet of these southern lands that make so many things grow so fast also produce much that preys upon the roots and leaves. The emperor looked at his mages. And you, you cannot stop this? They looked at one another with alarm. We do not know, great son of the gods, said one, many of whose thin beads were colored green. I would have to make a study of such things for the space of months, perhaps years. My field of expertise, as you know, is that of medicines and potions that may benefit your august majesty. It is well known that when something causes a plant in the gardens to sicken, that plant is simply destroyed. Your Imperial Majesty, I don't understand, Rosethorn said, forcing herself not to sound as impatient as she felt. There are many living circle earth dedicates here in Yanqing. Mages and non-mages who have studied plant diseases all their lives. You have only to summon them. She had been surprised at first that none of the local dedicates had come to visit her. But the maids in their pavilion had explained it was considered rude to meet guests before the emperor had done so. Wei Shu smiled. We shall have our people make appropriate inquiries, he replied. The truth of the matter is that the priests of the living circle and the priests of the gods of Yan Jing, of our state religion, do not fare well together. We fear that, should we invite priests of the living circle into our palace, the priests of our state religion would make trouble. It is better for our subjects to be peacefully guarded by our priests, keeping harmony in our palace. Rosethorn gazed up at the emperor's unreadably smooth face. His explanation was believable, but she did not trust it. She suggested politely, then, your imperial majesty, for the sake of your gardeners and your plants, I recommend they speak to local farmers. They will know all about this sort of thing. Crossing them with local plants might strengthen the roots of your roses against common molds and funguses. It is something everyone could work on at your pleasure. We could make a study of it ourselves, given time, Wei Shu replied with a smile. He looked at the gardeners. Until dedicate initiate Rosethorn and Nan Shibriar find the leisure to return and see to the health of my roses, uproot that one and burn it. He pointed to the bush that Rosethorn had saved. She threw herself in front of it as the gardeners scrambled to their feet. Imperial Majesty, why? she demanded, shocked. It's healthy now, healthier than ever. There's no reason to kill it. There is every reason he told her. It failed us at the moment of a test. 
when we came to show the splendor of our works to a foreign guest. Anything that does not present itself in glory and perfection betrays us and must be destroyed. But you weren't betrayed, Rosethorn argued, thinking fast. What would satisfy this absolute ruler? We have never seen such splendid gardens, have we, Briar? He shook his head. He'd gone to her side and was keeping an eye on the gardeners. They had yet to notice the tiny green shoots sprouting through the dirt at their feet. She glanced hurriedly at Briar and then at the bits of green. He closed his eyes briefly. The green sprouts shrank into the earth, seemingly before anyone noticed they were there. We'd like your permission to sketch the roses, because we won't be able to describe them, Rose Thorn told Wei Shu quickly. The king of Bihan will weep with envy when we tell him about your rose gardens and lily ponds. This plant didn't fail you. If you approve, we can create a new color for you from its blooms. One that will breed true. That will be only yours forever. He hesitated. She had tempted him. We would take it as a great favor indeed if you were to give us such a gift, Wei Xu said with a broad smile. Then the smile vanished. Rose Thorn hated the way these people had schooled themselves to hide their true feelings behind a blank face. But the plant dies, Wei Xu said. A flaw is not to be tolerated. A gardener must have laid a gloved hand on the bush when Briar was distracted. Rosethorn heard the plants cry when the man gripped it hard. She couldn't bear it. She would have felt the rose bush's pain as she walked away. Throwing herself to her hands and knees, she did as the Yanjing people did and touched her forehead to the earth. All around her, the ground quivered as roots and sprouts strained to break through. A favor, Imperial Majesty, Rosethorn cried. The bushes trembled as Briar's temper flared. She wrapped her power around him for a moment, squeezing his magic gently in hers as a reminder to Briar to exercise control. Slowly, reluctantly, she felt him relax. As he calmed, so did the roses, sprouts, and roots. To the Emperor, Rose Thorn said, It is flawed and an embarrassment to you with your eagle's eye, but to a humble dedicate from a temple far away, it would be an incredible gift. I beg of you, will you let me have it, in memory of my audiences with the great emperor of all Yanjing? It would be an honor beyond all words. Nothing seemed to move, not even the air. Finally, the emperor said, you truly believe this? I truly believe this, Rosethorn said in agreement. After a long moment's consideration, Wei Shu told Rosethorn, This plant will be in your pavilion, with a suitable container when you return there today. You will carry this thing all those miles home with you? Rosethorn straightened to her knees. It would be my honor, she replied. Her back had gone stiff on the ground. She struggled to get one leg up so she could stand. Briar lunged to help her. To the boy's surprise and Rosethorn's, the emperor himself grasped the arm that Briar did not. Gently, they helped her to rise. Once she was on her feet, Briar let her go. The emperor threaded Rosethorn's arm through his. Have you a thought as to the color and shape for our rose? He asked. Or is it too soon to inquire? Chapter 5 The Grove of Venerable Oaks, the Winter Palace, Dohan in Yanjing At the breakfast feast that the emperor had set up in Rosethorn's honor, Briar was finally able to eat his fill. Once that was done, he went in search of his vanished student. He found Evie among the feasting groups of courtiers. She was tucked under an awning, seated on a bench. Parahan sat cross-legged on the ground beside her. Briar had glimpsed him earlier, 
but hadn't had a chance to do more than nod before the emperor had claimed his attention and rose thorns. The young female mage, who had stood with the others next to the throne the night before, was now on the bench with Evie. Parahan grinned up at him. Briar took that as an invitation and sat beside him. How many cats do you have? Evie was asking the young mage. I have seven. Evie, I don't think the nun sure wants to know about your cats, Briar said. Experience had taught him that not everyone welcomed Evie's way of chattering on about the subjects she liked. But I have cats of my own, the mage explained. I would have seven if I could, but the servants would frown at me. She smiled prettily at Briar. I am Jia Jui, one of the imperial mages. It is an honor to meet you, Nan Shi Briar Moss. Briar gave her a bow in return. She was very pretty, but he was still jumpy after the goings-on in the rose garden. She was also much too old for him, though she was young for an academic mage, in her mid to late twenties perhaps. She wore only a single long string of beads around her neck, and some of them were blank. Could that mean they had no spells? Or were they really nasty and hidden? Nan Shermos, you are staring at my beads, Jia Jui said, her voice teasing. She had produced a fan from her sash and was using it to hide the bare skin above the neckline of her robes. Briar was rarely caught without something to say. Actually, I was admiring the embroidery on the borders of your outer robe. Please forgive me if I seem to be rude. Are these bits done with knots? My foster sister works her magic through thread, and I have to tell her about the beautiful work I see. Are those phoenixes? They are, Jadri said with a smile, smoothing the thread work with pride. I stitched for years to make this robe. It is such a pleasure to meet a man who takes an interest in these things. I'm going to meet his sisters when we go to his home, Evie said. One of them braids weather into her hair. Jajui laughed musically. It is a shame you did not bring your sisters with you, she told Briar. They would have learned much from my teachers, I know, and we could have learned from you. She looked up at Briar, her eyes twinkling. I would love a demonstration of your magic. I have never known someone who got his certification from the schools in the West. She doesn't believe Evie, Briar realized. She doesn't believe that my medallion could mean I'm as good as a Yanjing Yi mage. Coldly, he thought, and maybe that's for the best. Despite the friendly reception, he had that old bad feeling. It was one he got when he was burgling a house, and his instincts told him he had been noticed by guards or dogs, or magic. No demonstrations here, of course. Jajui was saying, it is permitted in the imperial presence only under special circumstances. Of course not, Briar replied agreeably. There's no telling what might go awry, with so many mages present and so many spells for the emperor's protection woven around him. Exactly, Jajui said. You grasp what many visitors to court have not, Nansha Briar. Now I will not stop you from dining. And Evie, you may tell me about your cats. Briar waved off a servant with more food, but he did accept a pitcher of coconut water and a cup to drink it with. Parahan took water and a bowl of steamed dumplings. They listened for a moment as Evie began to count cats on her fingers. There's mystery, Asa, apricot, raisin, Ball, Monster, and Rhea. They lived with me in Chamur, but they're travelers now. What about your cats? Will you get in trouble for going off with Evie like that? Briar asked Parahan. Not at all, the big man replied between mouthfuls. The guards were with us all along, and I was instructed to help keep you three amused. I imagine I will spend a good amount of time with Evie. There are more flower gardens than the emperor could show you in one morning. Briar made a face. Believe me, 
I'd rather look at plants and trees than armies like we did yesterday. A eunuch came up to them and bowed to Jia Jui. Forgive me, great Jia Jui, but his imperial majesty, the glory of the East and the bane of all evil, wishes to see the student Evume Mei Dingzai. Even though Rose Thorn was with the emperor, Briar followed Evie for protection. As she trotted along behind the painted and perfumed eunuch, she grinned up at him. This is better than all those pavilions in that throne room, isn't it, Briar? You must be happy with these trees. He smiled. Yes, and I'm glad you're having fun. It's easy to talk to Parahan and Jia Jui. Would you believe Parahan wanted to know what I could do with stone magic? She chuckled wickedly as Briar groaned. He knew all too well what his inventive student could do with her power. Just remember to behave, he cautioned her. I'll bet there are mages keeping watch all over this place for magic they don't like. But would they recognize our magic, he wondered. Would they even know it was there? The eunuch led them around other tables placed under the great oaks. Each table was under an awning, and each setting was more ornate than the last, commanding its own group of servants. At last, they stood on an elaborate strip of carpet that led to the longest table. There, the eunuch dropped to his knees. Briar bowed to the emperor, who sat with Rose Thorn on his right, and last night's general, Heng Kai on his left. Like all of the Yanjing Yi people, Evie went to her knees and touched her forehead to the carpet. Evu Mei Mei, rise, the emperor ordered. She obeyed, checking to make sure that she hadn't wrinkled her skirt. How do you find our gardens? Wei Xu asked. There are no rocks in them, your imperial majesty, she informed him. Well, there are rocks here, but not in the flower gardens. Rocks don't hurt flowers, she said as the courtiers hid their smiles behind their sleeves. Parahan shall escort you to our rock gardens tomorrow. Would you like that? Yes, please, your imperial majesty, Evie said respectfully. We saw a few rock gardens on our way to Gyeongshi, but I was told that you have beautiful ones at your palaces. It would be a very great honor to see them. Then see them you shall, Wei Xu replied with a smile. May I ask a small favor in return? Careful, Briar thought at Evie, wishing she could hear him in her head as his sisters did. Whether or not she heard him, she said, If I can, your imperial majesty, I'm only a twelve-year-old student. We have seen the power of dedicate initiate Rosethorn, and in future, I hope to see Nan Shirbriar display his skill, the emperor explained. But first, I have a little test for you. Mage General Heng Kai, will you let Evume Mei hold your neck beads? The mage general stared at Wei Shu, startled. But, shining one, he began to protest. Wei Shu raised his brows. Mage General, neither your power nor your necklaces helped you to win your last battle in Kayan. Given this is the case, you should have no objection to letting a girl hold your beads. Hand them to her. Heng Kai took in a breath, then slowly let it out. Carefully, he unwound three loops of beads from around his bull neck. Clutching them in one knotted hand, he held them out over the table. Rosethorn leaned forward. Briar, too, was ready in case anything went wrong. The beads had to be protected for people to wear them on a daily basis, or for this general to wear them in battle. Still, Briar felt better when he saw Jia Jui walk into the space behind Wei Xu and Heng Kai. She should prevent anything from going amiss. Evie stepped up and took the necklace. Thank you, Mage General, she said, and gave him a deep bow. Smart, Briar thought. Just because the Emperor can speak to this Heng Kai with disrespect doesn't mean that we can. Evie backed away until she stood next to Briar, running the long strands of beads through her fingers. 
They clicked musically, like the conversation beads used by merchants back home on the pebbled sea. Evumeme, tell me what they are made of, the emperor said quietly. The general jumped to his feet. Imperial Majesty, crown of Yanjing, only I may use my power on them, he cried. Instantly, two guards who had been standing behind the emperor's table lunged forward. They swung their halberds down, crossing them before Hang Kai, so they formed a barrier in front of the angry mage general. Then they pulled back on the crossed blades, pressing the man down into his seat. Once he was there, they moved in closer until he was pinned by the weapons. Hang Kai could not even raise his arms. Jia Jui shifted into the space behind Wei Shu and Rose Thorn. So long as you remain where you are without moving, Mage General, you will stay unharmed, Wei Shu said, his voice as smooth as butter. Evumeme, proceed. Evi gulped. It's all right, Briar whispered in Chamuri, his lips barely moving. I don't think this lesson's for you. She ran the complete string of beads through her fingers twice. The third time, she singled out a section of the most common ones. These are bone, she told the emperor, forgetting titles in her absorption with her task. Old bone, really old, that's half gone to stone, but it's bone all the same. I know it by the way it feels, but it isn't in my magic. She squinted at the lettering on some of the beads. This is some kind of scribe work, but I don't recognize it. Those are the ideographs our Nan Shurs learn, Wei Shi replied. Another bead, if you will. Evie chose a cylindrical bead, blue on white. Porcelain, she said scornfully. Of another, more intricately detailed blue on white bead, she also said, porcelain. Two more. Brown glass with white rubbed over the raised marks. General, did you make these? The general spat on the plate in front of him. Oh, Evie said. Briar could tell she was thinking aloud. You don't make things. You have mages that make your beads for you. But you can use the spells that are put into all this writing? Yes, Jadri said. That is how our magic is taught. Is this not the essence of your magic? Our academic mages write spells on paper or in books. It's the speaking of them, sometimes with scents, herbs, inks, and other aids, that helps them to complete the working, Rosethorn explained quietly. Evie wasn't listening. She was passing the string of beads through her fingers. Wood. Briar, what wood is this? Briar reached over her shoulder and sent out a tendril of his own power. Willow. Evie wrinkled her nose. Wood's no fun for me either she explained to the emperor and the mage general. She seemed to have forgotten that Hang Kai was angry. Briar knew that she was sunk into her power, letting her own stone magic spread around her hands. Her fingers sped over more beads. She had missed a big one, but Briar did not call her attention to it. Either it was the detested porcelain, or Evie would return to it. Maybe you asked the wrong student for this test. Oh, Evie stopped. Wait a moment. She worked her fingers back past flat rectangles of willow etched with circles centered on holes, past bone cylinders, dense with ancient Yanjing Yi letters, and past three brown glass cylinders. When her hand found a round grayish white bead studded with small red spots, she stopped. Interesting, she said, turning the bead over. There's spells in each of the red beads stuck in this marble globe. Even though they're glass, I can tell because the magic soaks into the stone. She looked up at the emperor. The main bead is marble. It changes magic. That's how I can tell what's in the glass beads. Nonsense. One of the other mages from the previous night walked up to stand before the table near Hang Kai. It was the older one the man with silver hair and mustaches. All know that marble houses magic and protects it. Evie ignored him. 
Whatever's in these beads is nasty, and each one is different. There's illness, smallpox in one and cholera in another, fire in three, one very hot, two more normal, choking smoke in two, and icy wind in one. The gold rings around each red bead keep the magic from leaking onto the top of the marble, so only the general knows he carries these. He's got... Evie hauled up the loops of the necklace, her black eyes scanning it for the pale orbs. She looked at the emperor. Twenty of them, she scowled at the general. And you wear another necklace and bracelets like this wrapped around your arms, all loaded with bad magic. You dare lecture me on the magic of war, peasant wench? shouted the mage general, pushing forward against the halberds. He glared up at the guards who fenced him in. Perhaps Evumeme only means that the spells in the stone beads are corrupted, Jajui suggested. As a student, she would understand that far better than war magic or the craft of being a general. She bowed to the emperor as Wei Shu turned to look at her. In my first years, I spent much of my time going over mage strings to find which beads had gone stale. It is one of the earliest senses a young mage develops. General Hang Kai has fought many battles recently. Is it not possible that his most personal tools are worn out? Evie, really interested in her test now, had returned to her scrutiny of the beads. I never said I was anything but a student stone mage. Oh, more bone, more wood, more glass. Cornelian. Briar, it's Carnelian. She held a large reddish brown stone up to him. I can see it's Carnelian, he replied, amused. The emperor, Jadri, and Parahan were also smiling at his students' enthusiasm. Briar knew Carnelian was one of Evie's favorite stones because it had been so hard for her to get her hands on any when she lived in Shamur. Even here in the east where it was more common, she had yet to tire of it. Now she turned the bead around, eyeing it closely. Slowly, so slowly at first, that Briar thought he imagined it. Her eyebrows drew together. By the time she turned the bead on one end to look at it in a different way, everyone could see that she was frowning. Evumeme, what is wrong? The emperor asked. Who put strength and fear spells in this? She demanded hotly. This is Carnelian. It's for protection and thinking. Perhaps it is so in your benighted teaching, student. The old mage was also frowning as he looked at the emperor. Your imperial majesty, light of knowledge, will you humor this peasant infant at the expense of true Yen Jing Yi mages? She knows nothing of our ancient symbols, of our learning that has been passed down over centuries. He fell silent when the emperor raised his hand. Honored Guan Shi Dianliang, I remind you that this Western student knew exactly the nature of the spells on the snake hole bead, Wei Shu said calmly. She also recognizes the spells on this carnelian bead, do you not, child? Fear spells, and not just jump when a mouse squeaks in the dark fear either, Evie cried. This is really bad puke on your robe fear, and the spell's eating away at the stone. If you don't take it off, the stone will go to dust in a year. How many of these do you go through anyway? Silence was her only answer from the general and from the tattooed mage. Thought so, she mumbled. She wiped an eye and went threading through the necklace for other stone beads. It was not long before the older mage the emperor had called Guan Shi Dian Liang had to speak again. She could tell us the stone is useful for the growth of fruit trees, son of the gods. And we would not know because she studies the learning of the barbaric West. It is true the mage stones last only so long but it is the strength of the spells. The most ignorant village fortune-teller knows Carnelian is a stone of power and strength, 
lucky for its color, the blood of dragons. But, Evie began and stopped. Briar watched as Rosethorn, using her arm on the opposite side of the emperor, leaned her head on the table. Her fist was by her ear, there signed to Evie to stop. With her little finger, she sketched a line from her nose to the edge of her mouth, like a wrinkle. It was their sign for Elder. They'd had to work out a series of signs for Evie on the road when her youthful lack of caution started to get her, and them, into hot water. Evie saw it. She bowed her head and mumbled, I'm sorry if I offended anyone, your imperial majesty. From the way she looked only at the emperor, not at his general or at the angry mage, Briar could tell that she had deliberately not included them in her apology. She placed the beads in a heap on the table. I was only telling what I know from the stone. I thank you, Evumeme, the emperor assured her. I am delighted and impressed. You have every right, and it is your duty to your teachers and your tradition to speak what you have been taught. In fact, it would be very wrong of you to speak against your tradition here in Yanjing. We are nothing without respect to our elders and ancestors. You may approach us. Evie glanced at Briar, nervous. He wants you to walk up closer to the table, Briar whispered. As she did so, the emperor raised a finger. A eunuch came to kneel beside him. After that, all Briar saw of the man was two hands offering something wrapped in bright yellow silk. The emperor took it, and the eunuch walked away from his master. Here is a small token of our friendship, Wei Xu said, offering the silk-wrapped bundle to Evie. She took it and dropped to her knees for the usual Yan Jing Yi bow. Briar glanced at Hang Kai and Guan Shi, but neither revealed their emotions. Maybe they know they've gotten themselves in enough trouble with the emperor today, Briar decided. Rise, Evumemi, the emperor said. Open it. He was smiling. Briar stepped forward. He bowed, then motioned to Hang Kai's necklace, which the man had not retrieved. May I, your imperial majesty? The emperor nodded. The general only scowled and looked away. As Evie carefully unwrapped her gift, Briar scooped the beads from the table. He glanced at Rosethorn, who raised a graceful eyebrow at him. Briar lifted a shoulder to say, I don't know, to her silent question of why. He ran the necklace through his fingers, watching Evie. She draped the silk over her shoulder. Her gift was something carved in bright red stone. It's a cat, Evie cried. A cat made of cinnabar. Do not handle cinnabar too much with your bare hands, Jajui cautioned. I know, Evie said, using the silk to turn the beautifully carved cat in her hands. There's quicksilver in it. The gift itself is a great honor. Jajui went on smiling. Cinnabar symbolizes long life in our magical teachings. Down onto her knees, Evie went again. Thank you so very much, your imperial majesty, she said. I'll treasure it always, and I'll remember the lesson that long life and cats are dangerous things. The emperor chuckled, as did most of those who could hear, but Briar did not. That bow was starting to annoy him. No student of his should have to grovel to anyone. How did you know a cat was perfect for me? Evie asked when Wei Shu told her to rise. I heard you traveled from distant Chamur with seven, the emperor replied. Will you tell me about them? Evie hardly needed an invitation to talk about her beloved cats. As she described them and their virtues to her imperial audience, Briar inspected the flat, carved wooden beads with his fingers and his power. He wanted to be sure that should he ever encounter a warrior who wore such a necklace again, he would know exactly what beads to reach for. He did the same with the oak beads on the string and the ginkgo beads, memorizing their feel with the Yan Jing Yi spells sunk into their grain. Then he looked at Mage General Hang Kai. 
The older man had leaned back, away from the halberds so he could finger the beads wound around one wrist. What deadly secrets were there? Briar wondered. How many deaths did the general carry in all those strings wrapped around his arms? And for whom were they destined? Couriers arrived for the emperor just when they reached the lily gardens after breakfast. His guests weren't permitted to know what was in the messages that were so urgent as to take him away from them. He made his excuses and asked Jia Jui to escort them through the beautiful water gardens instead. When they had seen and admired their full share of water lilies, earthbound lilies, trees, flowering vines, beautiful fish, water birds, and carefully landscaped views, the guests returned to their pavilion for a much-needed rest. Before they retired to their beds, Rose Thorn and Briar looked over their new rosebush, which had arrived during the morning. It had been moved into a dark green glazed jar that matched the color of the leaves precisely, a touch even Evie appreciated. Moreover, the inked Yen Jing Yi lettering on the inside of the jar's lip appeared to be instructions to the cats. Even Monster, who had learned only with difficulty that he was not to anoint Briar's shakens, miniature trees, sniffed the jar once, sneezed, and stayed away from it. Briar and Rosethorn both sent their power through the bush, finding the traces of Rosethorn's earlier healing of the mold. Neither of them said it aloud, but they both wanted to ensure the gardeners had not been forced to destroy the original plant. They were joined for supper by Jajui, Parahan, and those of the afternoon's party who had actually seemed to enjoy themselves. The group introduced the foreigners to some Yan Jingyi games and music, then took them to a terrace that looked out over a long body of water. There they fed the giant carp that swam in its waters until an exquisite display of fireworks, colored flowers and trees made of zayao, was set off in their honor. By the time it was over, Rose, Thorn, Briar, and Evie were happy to return to their pavilion and their beds. Rosethorn spent an hour going over the rose bush again. Once she was done, she had hoped to write to her beloved Lark, back at Winding Circle, but she could barely keep her eyes open. A day spent with hidden tensions between Evie and the general, Evie and that older mage, and whatever else was going on between the courtiers and Rosethorn's people would do that. The emperor was also the kind of ruler who enjoyed toying with his lords. She would be happy when they left the imperial court and its pitfalls. Rosethorn was asleep as soon as she closed her eyes. Someone splashed her with heavy stinking oil. She struggled to shake it off her leaves and blossoms, but the oil clung. Her sisters cried out from its weight on their stems and greenery as the men who cared for them walked between them, throwing this dreadful liquid all over them. The men didn't even care that they broke twigs and knocked petals off their blooms. The men were usually so careful. Now they came to fling dry reeds down between their plants, reeds that dripped more of the stinking oil. She didn't understand. None of them understood. The rose plants didn't understand, but the sleeping rose thorn did. With a cry, she thrust her blankets aside and jumped out of bed. She didn't even remember to put on shoes. Still half asleep, not thinking of Briar or Evie, she raced out of the pavilion through a back door. The first touch of flame to reeds brought her to her knees on a trail that skirted a willow pond. She lurched to her feet again and ran on as light grew slowly in the sky ahead. When she reached the rose garden, all of it was in flames. The gardeners had been bound and left at its center. They were done screaming. The emperor and his soldiers watched on horseback from the main path. The emperor saw her as he turned his horse to ride away. The plants harbored mold, and the gardeners allowed them to do so, he said, his face calm. Surely you understand that no imperfection is permitted at one of my palaces. I did tell you. 
he looked past Rosethorn. Slaves will come to escort you back. Rosethorn felt Briar put his arm around her shoulders. He had felt her magic, wakened, and followed her to discover what Weishu had ordered done. Once the emperor and his soldiers were out of sight, Briar spat on the path. They waited together on the edge of the burning garden until the slaves came with the palanquin. By then, the roses had burned to the gravel, and new gardeners had come to dig up the roots. Chapter 6 The Winter Palace, Dohan in Yanjing The next five days were drawn from the pattern of the first. They rose at dawn for Rosethorn and Briar to pretend friendship as the emperor and his favorites showed them around his prized flower gardens, meditation gardens, and greenhouses. Parahan and sometimes Jiajui in addition to Parahan's guards and a few younger courtiers and mages, would join Evie. First they would play briefly with her cats, then venture out to visit the emperor's wild animal collection, his treasure houses, his artisans' workshops, and his rock gardens. Everyone would gather together for a late breakfast or early midday meal. After a noon rest, so necessary in a part of the country that was already warming up for summer, Jiajui would fetch Evie to show her how the Yanjing Yi children studied magic. Or Evie would show Jiajui what she could do. Briar and Rosethorn retreated to the greenhouse where they and the gardeners would work on the rose they had promised Wei Shu. There, they produced a red and yellow streaked bloom, unlike any other in the gardens. The Wei Shu rose was resistant to every plant ailment Rosethorn and Briar could think of including all the molds and funguses known by the local peasant farmers. The blossoms would poison any insects that thought to dine on them, and they would reproduce only from seeds, not cuttings. They presented the emperor with his rose and a bush which showed a handful of buds on their fifth morning at breakfast. They could tell from his face that he was deeply conflicted. Forgive us that we cannot rejoice more, he said as a eunuch carried the potted plant away, and Wei Shu turned the single-cut bloom that Rosethorn had given him around in his fingers. Briar had been careful to remove the thorns first. Even the scent is perfection. Our heart yearns to learn more of our Wei Shu rose, but our duty forces us to leave it behind. We depart the Winter Palace in the morning. Our household will continue to look after you as if we were here, but imperial business calls us away. You will find we have left the three of you certain gifts in thanks for your learning and company. Together with the pack animals, you will need to continue your journey. We are given to understand you mean to take ship from Hanjian at the end of the month you call Goose Moon. Rosethorn bowed. That is our intention, yes, your imperial majesty. You will have plenty of time, Wei Xu said. We will ask our priests to pray for your safe journeys by land and sea. He rose from his table, and they bowed to him for the final time. The next morning, the three mages went to the gate of blessed departures to say goodbye, but the emperor had nothing else to say to them. He did wear his Weishu rose tucked into overlapping pieces of his armor. They watched him ride off with his mages and guards, each feeling a tremendous amount of relief they dared not express. Parahan joined them as a brigade of imperial troops and another of archers followed their master through the gate. Things will be more relaxed with the big dogs gone, he remarked. You can sleep as long as you like. What happens to you? Evie asked. Parahan shrugged. I wait here until he sends for me. If he'd gone to Inchia, like he'd meant to this winter, I'd have traveled with him. But he changed his mind. Where he's going, he won't be settled. He doesn't like taking me places unless he's certain I won't be able to escape. Inchia? Briar asked sharply. 
I thought he was fighting with Inshia and its neighbors. Parahan shook his head. Inshia and Kayan surrendered over the course of the winter. I suppose they couldn't face another summer's hammering. I can't say that I blame them. Their gods have mercy on them, Rosethorn said. Parahan, will you excuse us? I have some messages to send if we are to leave soon. Of course, he said. Shall I bring supper to you, or shall I take you to supper? Supper someplace we haven't seen, Rosethorn suggested. Parahan bowed and sauntered off. Race you, Evie challenged her teachers. She ran down the forested paths that led back to their pavilion. If she thinks I am going to run, she may think again, Briar told Rosethorn. I am going to walk with my most wonderful teacher. You won't say that by the time we're done packing, she warned, taking his arm. I don't want to waste any time, and no lollygagging from you, young man. I don't intend to lollygag. If we're on the far side of the realms of the sun and snow moon, we stand a good chance of being home within a year. We can do it if we're in Hanjian by the end of Goose Moon. That gives us plenty of time, if we find a caravan soon. Briar smiled at Rosethorn as they strolled along. I'll move just as sprightly as a rabbit. You'll see. Hmm. Rosethorn looked up at a hanging willow branch. The edges of its leaves were brown. She did no more than look, but Briar felt it as her magic washed over the tree and dismissed the illness that was creeping into its limbs. Boy, you flinched when Parahan talked about Inshia and Kayan. Don't think for a moment that I missed it. Briar sighed and steered her onto the shady path. The day was getting hot, and Rose Thorn wasn't wearing a hat. The God King was hoping the Emperor would spend the summer throwing his armies at those two countries, and Yithung in the northeast, rather than at Gyeongshi. He won't like knowing that Wei Shu now owns Inxia and Kayan. Well, with luck, the Emperor will turn to Yithung, not Gyeongshi. There's very little in Gyeongshi to tempt him, after all. And the God King should know about Inxia and Kayan by now. Or at least, he will know, long before you could get word to him. Briar knew she was right. There was really nothing more they could do. For a moment, when they reached their pavilion, Briar thought Evie was walking away from his bedchamber. Then he decided she'd simply been chasing her lively orange cat, Apricot. None of the maids was present to scold if the cats climbed the lacquered cabinets, tables, and chairs. Rosethorn hoisted the cat called Raisin over one shoulder and said, Start packing, before she sat down at a table to write messages. Briar rang the bell outside the pavilion to summon a messenger. The girl briefly whined when she learned she would have to ride to the caravansary where the traders made camp outside Dohan, but was all smiles when Briar held up a silver coin. While they waited for word, they went into their rooms to nap, pack, or both. Before sunset, their messenger returned with word that a caravan would be leaving for the seaport of Hanjian in three days. Well... I mean to shift our things to the caravansary as soon as we're packed, Rosethorn said firmly. That will give us the chance to get to know the people we'll be traveling with. That night, Parahan took them to a small pavilion set on a pond. There they were cool and comfortable, listening to night birds and watching floating lamps on the water. By the next night, almost all of their belongings had been carried away to be loaded onto horses for their dawn departure. Parahan had the palace staff bring them simple foods, and he rose to leave them as soon as they were finished. I know you will want plenty of sleep tonight, he said as the servants withdrew. And I am not one for long goodbyes. Rosethorn took his hand in both of hers. Mila and Green Man bless you she told him, and may Shuri Flame Sword see you home in victory one day. Parahan kissed her forehead. You played the part of the agreeable traveler well, 
but wildflowers don't last very long here. I am glad to see you escape. He clasped Briar's hand, then Evie's, in a jangling of chains. Crouching in front of Evie, he tweaked her nose. I wish you could have met my sister Suda, he said with a smile. You two are much alike. Evie flung her arms around his neck. I hate it that you're his captive, she whispered in his ear. I don't like it either, but what can we do? We're just little cats in his big house full of lions, he replied. Evie let him go and ran into her room, sliding the thin door shut with a bang. Parahan bowed to them. May all our gods watch over you on your journey home. He ambled out of the house, fading into the twilight. Briar listened until he could no longer hear the slightest jingle of chain. Rosethorn went to bed soon afterward. Briar made certain the cats were all tucked into Evie's room behind her magic gate stones. Then he went to his own bed. He was drifting off when he thought of Parahan. God's curse it, I need to sleep, he told himself angrily. We leave at dawn. But there was no denying it. The plight of the man from Kombampur bothered him. Any other master would have let them buy Parahan from him, but not Wei Shu. Parahan was some kind of prize. The emperor could give them nine saddlebags full of gold coins for the Wei Shu rose alone, and he had. But he wouldn't sell this one captive. Briar would have traded all of that gold for Parahan, and he knew Rosethorn and Evie would have done the same. Dawn, he reminded himself. We get up before dawn. Calm thoughts. I'll be able to wear plain old breeches and a tunic again. I look nice in all the silk robes, true, but there's nothing for comfort like the clothes Sandry made for me. Great Mila, I'll be so glad to wear my good old boots instead of slippers, where I feel every rock in my path. On that agreeable thought, he drifted off to sleep. Something made him pop awake near midnight. He listened, but the pavilion house was quiet. Uneasy, Briar got up and checked Evie's room. The cats were draped over her bed. They had moved to take the space she had left empty. They looked up at Briar. When I catch her, she's dead, Briar mouthed to them. Mystery raised a leg and began to wash. Swiftly, he pulled on breeches and a tunic, then slung his smaller mage kit over his shoulder. Boots in hand, Briar crept to the door of Rosethorn's room and looked in. She was asleep, making the little buzzing snore that he thought was so funny. Briar sneaked out of the pavilion. There were no servants in the outer rooms or even guards in the street beyond. He put a small bundle of sleep herbs in his tunic pocket in case he met anyone unfriendly on the way and yanked on his boots. Once set, he began to run, his way lit by a half moon. He had a very good notion of where she had gone. He should have realized she would not accept leaving Parahan behind, not after she had spent most of five days in the captive's company. It took him longer than he liked to reach the pavilion of glorious presentations where Parahan was caged. That was because he kept to the trees and bushes beside the road, making frequent stops to look and listen for guard patrols. He saw and heard none, which only made him more nervous, not less. He finally reached his destination. Before he approached his runaway student, he scouted the outside of the long hall. Everywhere else around the perimeter of the large building, he found no sign of guards. Inside was the row of hanging gold cages one of which housed Parahan at night. The hall of cages was easy enough to identify on the outside. It squared into the audience chamber, forming an L in the stonework. When he was certain there were no guards anywhere else around the pavilion, Briar went into the trees along the cage side of the pavilion of glorious presentations. There were the small windows high up, higher than a tall man could reach, so the captives had fresh air. 
There was the corner where the long hall became the emperor's throne room. Very well, Evie knows everything, he thought grimly, as he worked his way through the small wood. How do you mean to get inside? Then he heard tiny grunts of effort. She's trying to pull down the wall, he thought in panic. She'll bring any guards with an earshot down on us. He stepped out of the tree cover at Evie's back. She was kneeling with both hands placed on a marble block, two feet above the ground. She wobbled, snorting, but he could see no movement in the stone. For some reason, Evie, who could guide tons of stones as they fell from cliffs, could not get these blocks to budge. Evie, stop it, he whispered. She jumped, but she did not turn around. No, she whispered fiercely. I won't leave him here. What if the emperor turns on him one day and burns him up like he did the roses? How did you find out about that? Briar grabbed her by the shoulders and tried to yank her to her feet. It was like trying to move a boulder, as he should have remembered from the last time he tried to displace her when she didn't want to obey. I heard the servants talking, she told him patiently. Why don't you stop being silly and help me? I don't know why I can't move these things. The sight of the gardener's corpses burning at the heart of the rose garden was still too fresh in his mind. He can't come with us, he told Evie. They'll kill us if they think we helped him to escape. I bet he knows a way out of the palace grounds, Evie said flatly. The only things that keep him here are the cage and his chains. Then she said the thing that truly horrified Briar. I brought your lock picks with me. I'm going to pick his locks. But first I have to get in there, and these blocks won't budge. Briar chewed his lip. He knew what Sandry and Triss would say. He even knew what Daja, who was more practical, would say. What's the matter, thief boy? Lost your nerve? I have plenty of nerve, he muttered to his smith mage sister. He hesitated for a moment longer, then realized that Evie was throwing her power into the marble block again. She wasn't waiting for him to decide. Growling softly, he cast his magic around to see if there were vine seeds in the earth. The gardeners had cut back the local vines, but if he could get their seeds to grow, there was no risk of examiners later finding bits of foreign ones he might have to grow from the seeds in his mage kit. It was in that casting that he felt the ghost of once living plants at the level of his face. How could that be possible? The only thing in front of him was the marble wall. He shook his hands, as if to clear them of the last magic he had used, a habit Rosethorn teased him for, and let more of his power flow out directly in front of him. Now, the entire wall responded with that shadow of life that had once been green. Evie, stop, he whispered. What's in the mortar? Mostly limestone she replied, her voice as soft as his. There are other things in it that I don't feel, though. It clings like the marble is going to run away. Briar ran his finger over the cracks between blocks. Suddenly, he grinned. And you think plant magic is useless? He crouched on the ground and opened his kit. You mean it isn't? Evie inquired, being difficult on purpose. Apparently, the thing you can't feel is rice, Briar informed her, and that I can manage. Rice? she demanded, outraged. I know rice in my bowl, and I know it in the mortar. It's the rice in the mortar that makes it cling so, I'll bet. Tell me, were you going to pull the wall down? Nope, I was going to pull out just enough blocks to climb in. Then that's what we'll do. But we should make that enough blocks to let Parahan out. Three blocks by two blocks? That should do. Let me get rid of your mortar first. Briar ran his hands over the cracks between the blocks, pouring his magic into them and to the openings around their neighbors. He wouldn't have thought the rice would have remained so strong compared to the stone, but it had. When he called it to him, 
It even brought small chunks of the limestone in the mortar with it. I should have put down a cloth, he said with dismay, looking at the small heaps of white powder on the ground. Should have, would have, Evie muttered. She reached for a block that sat two feet above the ground. It slid from the wall and dropped. Careful, Briar whispered. He called to vine seeds as Evie called the next block. This time, as she called it slowly forward, fat, strong vines were there to wrap themselves around the block and steady it as Briar and Evie put it to one side of the opening. The vines released it and were at the opening, sliding under the next block before Evie had so much as a chance to turn around. As soon as they had finished their opening, Evie stuck her head inside. Briar heard her whisper something. Then she wriggled into the building. He slung his pack in after her, feeling her, he hoped it was her, take it from him. Then he slid through the opening in the wall. To his surprise, there was a lamp burning inside one cage over. In the cage directly in front of him, Parahan sat cross-legged on its floor. Is anyone in this building? Briar asked softly. Evie had gone around to the far side of the cage. From the jingle of metal, he guessed that she was using his stolen picks to open the lock. No, they usually leave us prisoners alone at night. Who would be boneheaded enough to help us escape? Why are you letting her do this? Parahan demanded. You must think I knew all about it before she did it, Briar whispered. They let you have a lamp? I'm allowed to read. Parahan lifted a scroll. He glanced at Evie. I'd offer to help, but I never learned to pick a lock. Briar went around the cage. Evie was scowling at the lock set down beside the bottom of the cage. I don't understand. Briar took the picks from her. Because you've only studied for a year. He reached into his kit and removed a small bottle of specially prepared oil. He let three drops fall into the opening of the lock. While he waited for the cage door's lock to soak, he added oil to those on Parahan's chains, neck, wrists, and feet. Then he turned his attention to the cage lock. It was tricky, but he was far more patient with locks than he was with many human beings. As soon as it popped open, Parahan slid out of the cage. Close it, he said. It will lock itself. Briar handed Evie the flask of water he always carried with his kit. Pour some of that into the lock, he told her. I don't want their mages to get any sniff of my magic from it. I doubt they would, Evie said as she obeyed. I don't think they even believe in our magic, except for Jajui. Briar had started with Parahan's throat collar. I try never to count on what strangers do or don't know. The lock was strange not as simple as the cage lock. He didn't want to spend the rest of the night here. Muttering to himself, he dug through his kit and found another set of picks, one he liked better than the set he used for teaching Evie. The collar lock popped open after a moment's work. You'll be able to escape the palace? Evie asked Parahan as she poured water into the collar lock to clean Briar's potion out of it. I had a feeling... You felt rightly, he assured her. Don't worry about me. You two are taking enough of a risk as it is. He watched Briar open the locks on his wrists. I don't know if I will ever be able to thank you. Just, if you're caught, don't say it was us, Briar advised. You understand, a man can bear only so much. Under the questioning of torturers, Parahan said. I will hold them off as long as I can, of course, but I've already had one experience at the hands of the Emperor's interrogators. But why? Evie whispered, accidentally splashing more water than she needed to. You weren't an enemy. They wanted to see what secrets my uncle and my father had that might be worth stealing, of course. I tried to tell them I was a layabout and my family's fool, but he shrugged. Such people only believe your answers once it has cost you some pain to give them. 
Briar remembered some of Parahan's scars and shuddered. Within a few more moments, he had the ankle shackles unlocked. Parahan was free. He said nothing for a little while, rubbing his wrists as Evie rinsed the locks. Briar snapped all of the cuffs and the collar back together again and left them on the floor of the cage. Then did the cage lock up once more. It would look in the morning as if Parahan had simply turned to mist. Briar went through the opening in the wall first. He quickly scouted around among the trees, but the area was as quiet as when he had arrived. When he returned to the wall, Parahan seemed to be talking with Evie. Then he nodded to Briar, turned, and picked up one of the blocks. Carefully, he eased it into its place in the wall, his muscles bulging as he worked. One at a time, he settled the blocks into the opening. When he finished, only someone who looked very closely would realize there was no mortar between the chunks of stone. Briar watched Evie as Parahan worked. The big man had said something to make her think. That was certain. She chewed steadily on her lip until she realized that Briar's eyes were on her. Then she turned her back to him. He would ask her about it later, when they were not so pressed for time. Briar called on his vines to yank their roots from the ground. He and Evie then tamped the remains of the rice and limestone mortar into the holes the vines had left and filled the rest of the openings with dirt. When they were done, Briar watched as the vines slithered into the trees. They would search through the palace grounds until they found places to grow unhindered. The ability to find homes of their own was part of the bargain that Briar had made with them when he created them. Amazing, Parahan said when Briar faced him. Parahan bowed, his hands pressed together before his face. Thank you both. I am forever in your debt. This is all we can do, Briar said. Don't come anywhere near us while we leave. I won't have this bouncing back on Rosethorn. You need not worry, Parahan told them. By dawn, I will be out of the palace grounds. Will you be safe? We will, but you won't, Briar said. Not if they have dogs that can track your scent. Just wait a moment. He walked out to the main road, where short, broad-leafed palms decorated the way. Silently, he called to four of the longest and broadest of the heavy leaves, catching them as they dropped free of their trees. As he returned to his companions, he sent his magic along the stem and heavy veins, strengthening them and drawing them out. What are those for? Evie whispered when he rejoined them. Shoes, Briar said. He explained to Parahan, you don't want the mages tracking you. He set the leaves down, two pairs by two pairs. Put your heels an inch away from the stems, he instructed. They'll fall apart, Parahan objected softly, though he obeyed. And they'll give me blisters. Briar grinned up at the older man. Trust me, he said, and winked. He folded the long ends of the leaves up over Parahan's feet and held them there as he summoned the woody veins out of the edges. They knitted at his direction, pulling the leafy edges together as tightly as if they had grown that way, binding two tough leaves into one. More veins drew the back and the stems up, closing them up along his heel. Parahan muttered something in his native language. They should last until you're out of the palace walls, Briar said, testing the seams as he made the stems softer. Then you can switch them for anything else except your own bare feet. Won't they be able to trace your magic? Parahan asked. Briar and Evie rolled their eyes. Briar replied, from what we've learned here, they couldn't trace ambient magic if they had torches and hounds. Now, let's be off. May your gods watch over you. Parahan nodded and vanished into the shadows at the back of the pavilion of glorious presentations. Briar slung his arm around Evie's shoulder, 
and steered her down a shortcut through the woods to the rear of their pavilion. Don't you ever try anything like this again without telling me. I thought you might say no. She wiped her eyes on her sleeve. Maybe I would have, Briar sighed. You took some really big chances. So did you. We took them with Rosethorn's life, Briar told Evie sternly. You know I don't like doing that. She's tougher than either of us. No, she isn't. This wasn't the first time they'd argued the point. Briar was positive it wouldn't be the last. She died. I was there. I don't want her dying anymore. It's bad for her. It's why she talks slow sometimes, and why she gets sick so easy. You tell me so all the time, Evie retorted impatiently. And I'll keep telling you till I'm sure you remember. I'm not going to tell Lark we got careless, and that's why we couldn't bring Rosethorn home. And speaking of carelessness, what did he say to you that was so private? Evie flinched. Then she said, I swear, I'll tell you once we're away from the palace. It's important, but I don't want to talk about it anymore until we're on the road. Please, Briar? She hardly ever begged these days except in play. He could tell she meant this. Don't make me regret waiting. I won't, I swear. In silence, they returned to their beds. They saw and heard no one else on the way. No one stirred as they let themselves back into their pavilion. Silent at last, they walked into their rooms and lay down for what remained of the night. Evie hadn't even thought she was asleep. When she heard Rose Thorn say, Evu Meme Dingzai, we are leaving. She sat bolt upright. A maid knelt beside her with a cup of tea in her hands. Thank you, Evie said. She always thanked the servants. She knew it hurt their pride to wait on someone so much lower in rank than they were. To Rosethorn, she said, It won't take me long to clean up and dress. The dedicate was dressed in her wool traveling habit and wide-brimmed hat. See that it doesn't. We still have to load Briar's shackens and your cats. She left the room. I know, Evie muttered and drank her tea. The maid combed out her braid and did it up again while Evie cleaned her teeth. She left Evie to dress, having learned the girl didn't like help if she didn't need it. In happy solitude, Evie pulled on the light cotton tunic and leggings she had laid out the afternoon before. On went her stockings and her comfortable riding boots. Already, she felt wide awake and eager. It had nothing to do with her tea and everything to do with wearing simple clothes again. Once more, she was herself, not some street rat pretending to be nobility in the imperial court. There was a bowl of rice with bits of this and that on a table by the window. Knowing it would be a long time until she got fed again, Evie made quick work of the whole thing and belched when she was done. She even ran her fingers around the inside of the bowl and licked them, just to be sure she had everything. With that scene, too, she grabbed her pack and slung it over her shoulders. Others found it heavy, but not her. She had carried it for two years since Briar had begun her studies when she refused all other teachers. The pack held both her proper mage kit and her stone alphabet, with rocks or gemstones for each letter in its own special pocket. When she traveled, she did not like to be more than an arm's reach away from it. Only knowing that her things were under the strongest protection spells Rose Thorn and Briar could weave had made her comfortable enough to leave them while she was on the palace grounds. As she entered her sitting room, she was greeted with assorted strange cat noises. Briar had freed the cats from her gate spell and lured them once again into their special carry baskets with his very excellent catnip. Outside, she saw Briar carefully stowing the emperor's rosebush and his shakens on the backs of his pack horses. 
He had given one of the miniature trees to the emperor when they arrived as a birthday present, letting their messenger present it in case the emperor hated it. Evie was fairly certain that Briar regretted the gift now, since he loved his shackens like she loved her cats. He had not liked the way that Wei Shu treated his people, and would not like one of his trees in Wei Shu's hands. Rose Thorn's twin pack horses waited outside patiently, their burdens already tucked away in cushioned leather satchels. Evie found her riding horse, which wickered on seeing her. She swung up into the saddle and made herself comfortable. Any time, Briar, Rose Thorn said, mounting her horse. Yes, mother, he replied. To his obvious surprise, and to Evie's, the normally straight-faced servants tittered behind their hands at his joke. They sobered immediately and bowed as their guide and escorts set off on the road to the gate of imperial blessing. Evie sighed happily. They were on their way out of the palace. That illusion lasted as long as their ride to the gate. Two groups waited for them there. One was led by the mistress of protocol. Behind her stood two hostlers. Each held the reins of a string of three horses, all carrying a full burden of packs sealed with the six-toed dragon of the Long Dynasty. The headstall of each horse bore the same insignia. A captain led a full company of the palace guard. These soldiers stood across the front of the gate, blocking it, spears planted firmly on the ground. Evie's skin broke out in goosebumps. They knew. They knew about Parahan. Rosethorn kneed her horse past their guide. What is this? she demanded. Evie, have some tea. Briar nudged his horse closer to hers. He offered her a flask. In a normally loud voice, he said, I bet you didn't even eat breakfast. Softly, he added, drink some tea and stop looking guilty. Evie obeyed. She eased her horse back until she was next to Monster's carry basket. She reached her fingers in and stroked the big animal. The mistress of protocol bowed to Rosethorn. Forgive me, honored Rosethorn, friend of the emperor, she said, not meeting Rosethorn's glare. This officer insists that you will not be allowed to pass until each member of your company is inspected. Please forgive the, the inconvenience. You have my deepest, deepest apologies. Evie wouldn't have thought the mistress of protocol could ever be so upset. Just after their arrival, this intimidating lady had spent several mornings with them, educating them in the ways of the court. At the time, Evie had wondered if she was carved of the same white marble favored for so many of the imperial buildings. Inspect, then, Rose Thorn said. Except for the three of us and our guide, everyone is palace staff. The guide was approved by palace officials. She said nothing else, as every member of their escort had been inspected top to toe by an armed soldier. Even their baggage was poked, as if the soldiers expected them to be hiding someone in it. As the guards inspected the pack animals under Briar's eye, Rose Thorn nudged her mount over to that of the mistress. Quietly, she asked, Is it permitted to inquire why one is being subjected to this degrading inspection? The mistress used her fan to hide her face for a moment, then lowered it and leaned very close to Rose Thorn to whisper in her ear. Evie knew that normally torture would be required to get an extra word from the older woman. But she had a bad case of arthritis. A balm from Rosethorn and its recipe had made her life much easier. Very much easier, Evie thought, if she was willing to give Rosethorn any information. The captain was returning. The two women separated. Done, the captain said. They may go. The men cleared away from the road. The mistress of protocol, badly rattled, presented the travelers with the horses and their burdens, gifts personally chosen by the emperor. 
Rosethorn said a few diplomatic, grateful phrases. Evie admired her all over again. Rosethorn said those things, and she acted as any noble lady might. But when she took a drink of tea from her belt flask, Evie could see that Rosethorn's hand was shaking. Given Rosethorn's nature, Evie was fairly certain she wasn't scared, but furious. Were they looking for Parahan? Evie wondered, nibbling the inside of her cheek. It's early, but maybe they know he's missing. Once they had passed through the last gate out of the palace and were on the long avenue that led into the city, Evie and Briar rode up to Rosethorn. Their guide had drawn closer as well. In all my days of service to the Imperial Palace, I have never seen Imperial guests subjected to search upon their departure, the guide said, indignant. Did the most honorable mistress of protocol hint as to the cause of such extraordinary behavior? The Emperor will be furious to learn of this. I don't believe so, Rosethorn said, her voice very dry. He's missing an even more prized guest. She pursed her mouth, then said, Apparently, his captive Parahan of Kambanpur has escaped. They don't know how. His chains, locked, and his cage, also locked, were discovered this morning when they went to take him to his bath. Oh, that's bad, Briar commented, his face and voice suitably grave. His imperial majesty won't like that. Admiring her teacher more than ever, Evie decided to add her bit. She sighed, careful not to overdo it. He won't get very far, not with the whole palace looking for him. Rosethorn looked at them suspiciously. Very true. If he's lucky, once he's recaptured, no one will say anything about it, she commented. No one will want the emperor to know how badly they slipped up. Their guide shook his head. That's the kind of secret that always comes out, he said. But you're right, they'll catch him. They have ways. Now if you will look ahead, you will see the gate of lowly welcoming. They call it that because anyone who is coming from the palace is assumed to be less happy, even upon entering our glorious city. We will be going around Dohan, though, so we will not pass through. He trotted on ahead to ride with the leader of their guards. Rosethorn rode for a while in silence before she said, We're going to be in Yanjing two more weeks or longer, if the roads aren't good. The Imperial Spy Service will have eyes on us constantly to see if Parahan tries to get in touch. There's no reason why he should, but brace yourselves, all the same. Good luck, Parahan. Evie thought. I hope you get out of Yanjing soon. Chapter 7 On the southern outskirts of the city of Dohan. The caravansary was the biggest Evie had ever seen, with beautiful paintings of flowers and fish on the inside plaster walls and a large square well in the middle. There were two levels of rooms, with the bottom level reserved for the bigger caravans and the upper for smaller traveling parties. This was a trader place, very clean and in good repair. The ride leader of their caravan came running as they rode through the gate. As soon as she and her people took charge of their group, the imperial escort bowed to Rosethorn and Briar and left them. The ride leader, who had introduced herself as Regioni of 28th Caravan Dada, frowned. That's odd. Usually some of them stay for tea and any news we care to pass on. But this year, the Imperials have been very... distant. She shook her head, as if shaking off bad thoughts. Dedicate Rosethorn, you and your companions are blessed. I was unable to send a message before your departure from the palace, but as it happens... We leave in the morning, a day early for Han Jian. She looked at their animals. You have more horses than your note said. The emperor was an overwhelmingly gracious host, Rosethorn explained. Well then, we shall make accommodation. Rajoni looked around. 
The trader boys and girls who had taken charge of the pack animals stood a little straighter, knowing the ride leader's eye was on them. When Rejoni nodded, the youngsters led the animals off to the stables. Only those who held the reins to the cat's horses, the shakin's bearers, and the horses Rose Thorn pointed to, the ones with the mage kits and their next day's clothing, waited and followed as the ride leader showed them to their rooms in the caravansary. Once they had stowed everything they wanted to keep with them, Rejoni said, Midday's being served now if you wish to eat. There are tables by the fountain, or you may carry your food here. I can bring the food here, Briar said. We'll take supper with the rest of your company tonight. Evie sighed. She wanted a nap, but she also wanted time to herself, to think about what Parahan had told her. She hadn't had a moment alone with Briar and Rosethorn since they had ridden away from the palace. She had hoped to talk to them here, but what if there were listening spells on the walls? If they were traitor listening spells, that wasn't so bad. But what if they were imperial ones? Rose Thorn said, Rejoni, I saw a stream outside the walls. Is it safe for me to meditate there? This area is very safe, the ride leader assured them. We only ask that you be inside our walls by dark, when we close and lock the gates for the night. We leave at dawn. Evie and Rosethorn went inside to inspect their rooms. Using her guard stones, Evie set the cats up in a corner of the main room by the entry. She filled a shallow basket with dirt, in which they could relieve themselves, fed them from the sealed jar of cooked pork scraps the palace servants had left for her, and put down several dishes of water. Constant travel had made Evie inventive when it came to providing for her companions. When she went to set up her own bedroll next to the cat's place, she discovered that Briar had returned with food. It had been a long time since the rice she'd had at dawn. Evie did her best not to slop the bowl of chicken and lemon stew all over her face as she ate, but it was a near thing. She thought she might die happy when she saw the plate of spicy Seminola cake that Briar had also brought. I love traitor food, she cried. Do you know, when I don't particularly want to eat, all I have to do is watch you devour whatever is before you, and I feel hungry, Rose Thorn remarked. Evie and Briar carried the empty dishes back to the trader washing tubs, and did their share of washing up in thanks for the meal. By the time they returned to their chambers, Rose Thorn had left in search of her meditation. I'll be back, Evie told Briar and the cats in Shimuri when she saw the woman was gone. Unless you want to come along, actually, you should. Briar, who had picked up one of his shackens, looked at her with suspicion. Go along where? I thought you would want a nap. At least he's quick enough to speak Chamuri, Evie thought. I have to talk to Rosethorn. Briar's lips went tight and his eyes went hard. You have to do no such thing. You hurt her. She said meditation. She needs quiet. She needs to relax. All of that imperial carrying on was hard on her. Evie crossed her arms on her chest. I know that, almost as well as you, Briar Moss. Maybe I'm not a brilliant, dung-nosed nun like some people, but I'm no paperwit either. You might think that I have something important to say, something she ought to know, even if I don't have a cartwheel of metal hanging around my neck. She marched out of the building, bound for the gate. It wasn't long before the tiny rocks on the path behind her let her know that he was following. She had found the stream and entered the wood before he said, Evie, stop, look at me. She did. Don't pout, he ordered. I just don't think she needs to know we helped, you know. That isn't what I was going to say. Evie snapped. What I am going to say? She'll bite my head off if I wait too long to tell her. She set off down the stream bank again. You don't believe I care about her almost as much as you do. I know you care about her, he retorted, 
trotting until he could walk beside her, or I would have just pushed you into the water. Do you think you could talk any louder? They heard Rose Thorn call. Because I am reasonably certain my meditations did not include the two of you squabbling like a nest full of birds. As they rounded a bend in the stream, they saw Rose Thorn seated cross-legged on top of a large, flat boulder. He started it, Evie replied. I didn't ask him to follow me. He invited himself. I was trying to stop her, Briar said. What part of alone did either of you not hear? Rose Thorn wanted to know. I'm sorry, Evie said, climbing up until she was close enough to Rose Thorn to whisper. Briar came to stand beside her. Bend down, please. Parahan told me something yesterday. This is the first time I think it's safe to tell you. Rosethorn frowned and leaned toward them. The three were so close that strands of Rosethorn's hair brushed Evie's head, while her sleeve covered Briar's face until he held it back. The woman braced herself gently on Briar's shoulder. He said the emperor is going to Inchia to join the rest of the army that's been gathering there since Inchia surrendered. Evie whispered in soft chamuri. As soon as the emperor gets there, he's going to invade Gyeongshi. They're already near the border. He doesn't trust his generals anymore. He's going to lead the attack himself. Her legs hurt from standing on tiptoe when she was so tense. She lowered herself until she was flat-footed. Looking up again, she realized Rosethorn had covered her open mouth with her hand. She was stricken, and Evie had done it. I'm sorry, Evie said, still whispering. I know it was bad. I told you as soon as I thought it was safe. Briar didn't know. I was scared to say anything in the palace. Not when I didn't know what had spells on it. Rose Thorn stared off into the distance. Evie wanted very badly to ask what she was thinking, but sometimes it was best to leave Rose Thorn to her thoughts. Finally. The woman clambered down the boulders. So much for quiet meditation, she muttered. I'll have to consider this for a while. You two will mind your tongues and behave. Do you understand me? Yes, Rosethorn, they chorused. She set off down the path back to the caravansary, her pace brisk. Briar held Evie back until Rosethorn was out of earshot. Then he demanded quietly. You couldn't have told me this before? I didn't dare, Evie said as they followed Rosethorn, walking more slowly. It was last night. We were seeing him off. Then we were going back and I was so tired. It's not like there's anything we can do. Briar rubbed the top of his head, looking tired. I just hope she feels the same way. I'll be glad when we leave Yan Jing, Evie told him. I'm scared we'll trip over something really bad. It hasn't happened yet, but I keep expecting it. There are shrines to the gods in the walls all around the inside of the caravansary, Briar said. First thing we do when we get back inside the gates, you take an offering to that Hei Bei luck god of yours. A nice offering, mind, and you ask him to get us out of here safely. Evie beamed at her teacher. That's a splendid idea. She had a piece of white jade that would be perfect, and a piece of lapis lazuli for Kanzan the Merciful. Even gods couldn't be able to resist such fine bits of stone. She would feel better once she had enlisted their help. Hebe had to like her more than he did the emperor, who handed out bad luck to so many. And how could Kenzan like someone who hurt and killed so many people? At the back of her mind, she felt a dark flicker of fear. What about the gods of Gyeongshi and Parahan's gods, who also had something at stake now? She stomped on that flicker until it didn't bother her anymore. Prayers and presents to her two favorite gods would fix all of this, just as giving Parahan's news to Rosethorn had meant passing a hateful burden to someone who could handle it. 
she could concentrate on the journey, and only the journey. Later in the afternoon, the three of them were cutting vegetables into a soup to share with some fellow travelers when they heard the thunder of horses approaching the gate. They drew together, dropping their knives into the bowls of vegetables. Caravansary guards ran to the gate, iron-shod staves in their hands. An archer on the wall turned and whistled three sharp notes that sent the men away from the road as a company of imperial troops, accompanied by three mages, rode in. Ten of them galloped through the caravansary in the direction of the rear gate. Evie felt her heart begin to hammer in her chest. Relax, Rosethorn murmured softly. Rajoni and Changdao, the master of the caravansary, walked up to the haughty man who appeared to be in command. Changdao and Rajoni bowed deeply. The noble did not speak at all. The younger man who carried his banner did that. The older mage who rode next to him made a series of motions with his hands, forcing Briar to look away. Evie knew he could see the magic being done. When the bannerman spoke, his voice was loud, much louder than it would have been without magical help. She was certain it was being heard everywhere inside the caravansary walls. Travelers and those who keep this place, attend. A valuable slave of Southern Realm's blood has escaped from the grounds of the Winter Palace, the banner man proclaimed. Remain in your places as the Imperial warriors search. No harm will be done unless you are sheltering this runaway. Any who do shelter this Parahan of Kombanpur will receive the utmost of the Emperor's displeasure. Those persons, their parents, grandparents, families, cousins, to the third degree of relationship, both older and younger, no one will be spared. Mila, save us, Rosethorn whispered. Those who give us useful information will receive great rewards and advancement at the hands of our glorious lord, wielder of the dragon sword, holder of the orb of wisdom, Emperor Wei Shu of the Long Dynasty. The bannerman continued, Go about your tasks unless our warriors require your assistance. The soldiers dismounted leaving the horses with a few of their number, and dispersed among the stables, supply buildings, and housing. Only the captain, his bannerman, and the mage who had amplified his speech remained where they had halted. Cheng Dao stayed with them, though they did not talk to him at all. Rajoni trotted off in the direction of the brightly painted trader house carts, presumably to act as middle person between the soldiers and the caravan. Back to work. Rosethorn said. Not you, Evie. Not chopping, anyway. Evie looked at her hands and had to agree. They were shaking too much for her to risk picking up a knife. Briar sent her for a bucket of water. She got it, looking at the ground rather than the warriors. She almost dropped it on him when she saw three soldiers enter their set of rooms. The cats, she cried. They'll knock over the gate stones. She put the bucket down and ran to their quarters before Briar or Rosethorn could grab her. Two of the soldiers were looking into the bedchambers. One knelt just outside the line of gate stones and was scratching Ball under the chin. I'm sorry, Evie said. It was hard to think badly of anyone who petted her cats, even if it was Ball who liked everyone. I just wanted to warn you, the stones are magic, so they stay on that side of them. There's a nice trick, the soldier said with admiration. Useful when you're traveling, I'll wager. But do they run alongside, or how do they keep up? Evie showed him the carry baskets and the basket the cats used as a privy. He told her about his own cats, to the point where she almost forgot to be terrified. She walked out with the three of them, and once the inspection of the caravansary was done, waved goodbye as they rode away. Rosethorn and Briar walked up behind her as the other occupants of the caravansary took deep breaths and talked 
a little too loudly in their relief. Did they try to get into our mage stuff? Briar asked. Evie shook her head. Not even enough to get hurt by the protecting spells, she said. Not like those Yuji nuns yesterday, looking into our bags like we'd bundled a big man into one. Charmed by the cats again? Rosethorn asked. Evie nodded. How many times have we used checking on those creatures to keep an eye on soldiers inspecting our things? Briar put an arm around Evie's shoulders. They earn their keep, those cats. Rosethorn gently tweaked Evie's ear. They do indeed. When Evie turned to protest an unearned ear tweak, Rosethorn tweaked her own ear, then laid her forefinger beside her nose. That was a sign Briar had taught them both, a bit of thief sign from his youth that meant uncanny doings or mage work. The tweak of her own ear was notice to both of her younger companions that Rosethorn suspected the soldiers had planted spy spells in the caravansary. Evie growled. You're getting hungry, Briar said wisely. He didn't resent being spied on the way Rosethorn and Evie did. He expected it. He did sigh when Rosethorn shook her finger, telling him silently he wasn't to try to find and dismantle the spy spells. Evie giggled despite her resentment. Let's finish working on that soup. After the soldiers' departure, the traders retreated to their house carts. Evie didn't blame them. Too often, when nations were in upheaval and looking for someone to blame, they singled out traitors. In return, the traitors had strict rules in their dealings with outsiders. If Briar's sister, Daja, and in fact Briar and all three of his sisters, had not done some notable services for traitors now and then, these eastern traitors would not be so willing to help them now. The company of travelers was subdued as they gathered for supper. Everyone had something to contribute. Bread they had made on flat stones, different kinds of tea, pickled vegetables, cooked eggs, and fried fish. The other diners were loud enough in their complaints about people who broke the peaceful traditions of a caravansary that the silence of Rosethorn and her companions went unnoticed. I'll tell you this for nothing, said a merchant from Namorn who was also bound for the pebbled sea. Rosethorn had cared for a cut on his arm, and he felt kindly toward her. You won't see anyone from a living circle temple between here and Hanjian. The emperor's magistrates of the vigilant eyes announced back in Seed Moon that they had uncovered a fearful plot against the living circle faith. For the protection of the temples and those who serve in them, they put them under guard by soldiers. None of the dedicates or their novices or even any of those that worship are being allowed in or out. Rosethorn stared at him. But I heard none of this where we were. Yanjing Yi people don't talk about the doings of the vigilant eyes, the merchant replied. It's bad luck. It isn't only the living circle, another diner said. She was one of the drovers who handled the Namornese merchant's mules. Many of the foreign temples are either closed or under guard. Only ones for the Yanjing Yi gods and goddesses are open to all, and too bad for us that worship other gods. We can only hope they hear us so far from home. A pity you couldn't go to Gyeongshi, a woman from one of the other groups of travelers said. They say that even if your god has no temple, you still have a chance of reaching his ear with your prayer. Oh? the Namornese man asked. How is that? It's Gyeongshi, the woman said, as if that made the answer plain. When the people from the Namornese group stared at her, she chuckled and shrugged. That's why so many build their temples there, even when their faiths have homes elsewhere. That's why the rivers that spring from there are sacred. Gyeongshi is the closest you can get to the gods without dying. Everyone knows that. The Drimbakangs, all three ranges of them, they are the pillars that hold the heavens aloft. 
Huh, Evie said, poking Briar. I told you the mountains were important, and now I'll never get to see them up close. Ow, Briar protested, glaring at her. Haven't you seen enough mountains? The girl who handled mules drew Briar closer to her side. I'll protect you from the skinny girl who likes mountains, she assured him. I think it's time to clean up and go to bed, Rosethorn announced, getting to her feet. I am sorry to hear your news, she told the Namornese man. We were in Gyeongshi before we came here, and they had no word of this. Perhaps he will return the foreign religions to favor as quickly as he took it from them, the merchant replied. We can all pray on that. Yawning, Evie set about gathering their bowls and utensils, but Briar stopped her. We'll do it, he said, taking them. You go to bed. From the look he gave the mule drover, Evie wasn't sure how much washing up would actually get done, but it was no skin off her neb to steal one of Briar's sayings. She hurried inside, changed the arrangement of gate stones so the cats could sleep with their favorite people, then prepared for bed. Before she closed her eyes, she sent another prayer to Hebe for Parahan. She slept. To dreams that Parahan was running ahead of her, she was racing as fast as she could, but she couldn't catch up, no matter how hard she tried. Long after she could hear Briar and Evie breathing in sleep, Rosethorn lay wide awake, absently stroking the lanky apricot who lay inside the curve of her arm. She envied the cat. The day's events and discoveries kept her thinking. Duty and wish were tearing at her heart. Mila of the grain, what shall I do? She wondered, desperate. I just wanted to go to the places Lark was always telling me about before I was too old to do it. I wanted to see plants and trees and flowers whose names I didn't know in my bones. And I have. I'm bringing home seed and magic clippings that will keep me busy for years, if I can get them there. If I can get them there. When Evie told me about the invasion, I confessed to cowardice. I thought that the local temples would have sent word to Gyeongshi somehow. Someone among them must be a far speaker of some kind. But if they've been locked up for months, under guard, I can't be sure if they know the emperor secretly made peace with Inshia, giving him a broad road to Gyeongshi. I can't be sure if the temples north of Dohan saw the armies gathering and heard gossip that their new target was Gyeongshi. And if I am not sure, Mila, my goddess, I want to go home. I want to see my lover again. I want my own food and air I can breathe without fighting. I want to see Crane and Nico and the girls. I want my own garden. But there is my duty. Somehow, I have to leave the caravan and make certain that Gyeongshi knows that our first circle temple is prepared. They'll need me when war comes, too. I'll send the children on with the caravan. Briar will go if I tell him he has to look after Evie, I think. She lay like that for a long time, staring into the dark. When the caravan workers came to rouse them in the gray hour before dawn, they found Rose Thorn, Briar, and Evie already awake, dressed, and packed. Most of their things, including Briar's shakens and Evie's cats, were already on a wagon whose use they had paid for. The rest they loaded swiftly, with the ease of long practice, onto pack horses. Then they saddled their riding horses. Briar elected to drive the wagon for the morning, neither Rosethorn nor Evie being awake enough to do so. The caravansary workers brought everyone hot tea and steamed buns, stuffed with pork or vegetable filling, as the travelers finished their preparations. The sun was just clear of the horizon 
as Rajoni, the ride leader, raised her staff. Her voice swelled in the trilling cry that was the signal to move out. More and more trader voices rose from their own wagons and from the guards on horseback as the caravan passed through the open gates. Chapter 8 The Road South, Dohan to Kushi So relieved was Rosethorn to be out in the countryside, able to leave the caravan now and then to investigate a new plant, that two days of travel and three inspections by Imperial soldiers passed before she realized that her two youngsters were behaving oddly. She also had to wait and stay with the caravan to be sure that her instincts were correct. Most of the time, Evie and Briar behaved as they always did when traveling. They rambled up and down the caravan, making friends with traders and merchants alike. They helped with the horses, the meals, and cleanup. Briar spent idle moments in the back of the wagon, putting together seed bombs. These were mixes of lethally long-spined thorny plants that he and Rosethorn had created to grow very fast when the cloth that held them struck the ground. Evie had her own magical weapons to work on, and she did so, napping sharp edges onto discs of flint. All of that was perfectly normal. In the second search by Imperial soldiers who looked for Parahan, Rosethorn thought both of her youngsters looked uncommonly pale. As the soldiers questioned other travelers, Briar put his arm around Evie, when neither she nor he encouraged gestures of affection before strangers. They were cheerful enough when they answered the soldiers' questions, but something was odd. Then Rosethorn spotted a Yanjing Yi variant of an herb she used to cleanse wounds, and she left the road to get some. By the time she returned, the soldiers were waiting only to question her. No, she would say, far more politely than she would have done had she been in a friendly country. I have seen no escaped slaves or captives. I have all I can manage keeping up with those two children there. She would point out to Evie and Briar, who watched from their seat on the wagon. Usually, the big cat monster watched, too, blinking sleepily in the sun. No, I have received no messages from anyone who wanted me to hide them on my wagon, Rose Thorn would answer. I know better than to break the law in a foreign country. Besides, the traders discourage it. Are we finished? I need to get these plants in damp wrappings before they wither. It wasn't true. Her magic would preserve the plants as long as she wanted to, but the questions tired her. The soldiers would let her go. On the third night, after two more such searches, Rose Thorn made arrangements for them to take supper at their own fire in the shelter of their wagon. Briar and Evie collected their servings of the evening meal while she tied their horses in a picket line near their wagon. If anyone thought they could snoop on the trio's conversation, the horses would give warning. Once the meal and cleanup were done, and they had settled by the fire with a bit of work before bedtime, Rose Thorn took a sip of her tea and said in Chamuri, Do you know what I miss? Briar looked up from his night's collection of seed bombs, mildly puzzled. Evie, who was rubbing Mystery's ears, shook her head. Rose Thorn went on. The entire time we were in the palace, I don't think I went half a day without Parahan said this, or Parahan told me that. Evie's head jerked up. Rose Thorn said, as if she hadn't noticed, I heard this mostly from Evie, but you had some interesting talks with him too, Briar. We miss him, that's all, Briar said, but his eyes were too steady as he looked at her. She was very familiar with that gaze. He was waiting to see how much she knew. It could be a matter of stolen grapes or a missing prince, but her boy was in it up to his elbows. When we left Gyeongshi, you both talked about Dok Yi and the God King until I thought you wanted me to adopt them. Now we've been away from the palace four days. Your good friend, our good friend, 
actually managed to escape. It's clear he hasn't been found. Yet you two haven't uttered a word. Aren't you worried? Aren't you wondering how he managed to slip his chains and his cage? Evie glanced at Briar, who remained absolutely still. With increasing wrath, because suddenly a few things made very good sense, Rosethorn whispered, That is the wonderful thing, isn't it? You would think that only magic would help him to escape. But if that were the case, the soldiers wouldn't be looking for him still. The mages would have found him. So it wasn't magic that helped him to slip his shackles. Please don't be angry, Evie blurted. I stole the picks, and I took them to Parahan, and I moved the blocks so he could get out, and I opened the locks. Rosethorn looked at Evie. You, Evume made Ding's eye, stole Briar's lock picks and unlocked Parahan's shackles and cage. She knows I did it, Evie, Briar said. Even if you stole my picks, those were fancy locks. You're not ready for them yet. I really did move the stones, Evie muttered. We put them back. None of our magic is there anymore, so they won't know we used it. Rose Thorn drew her legs up and rested her face on her knees. Finally, she looked at her companions. Go to bed, she ordered them. No, wait. Did he tell you his plans? They shook their heads. Excellent. Go to bed, both of you. She wished they had gone to their bedrolls under the wagon in utter fear of her wrath. Instead, as she was putting out the fire, she heard Evie murmur to Briar, That went better than I thought. Rosethorn held her hands palm up and looked at the sky. Gracious Mila, help me explain how close they came to the most horrible kind of death, she begged her goddess. Give them knowledge of the world before the world kills them. Give me patience before I buy two barrels and ship them home that way. I beg you, my goddess, guide me before I do something dreadful and box their ears. Rosethorn knew very well that these weren't the reasons she hadn't given them a long list of punishments and a royal scold. She had shown mercy because in two days she would have to tell them that she was sending them on to Han Jian without her. With dawn came the promise of rain. While Evie fetched tea and steamed dumplings, Briar and Rosethorn set the ribs on the wagon and rolled the heavy cover over them to protect the most delicate of their belongings. They had scarcely gone two miles down the road, when the skies delivered on their promise. The cats, who liked to go for a run first thing after breakfast, returned yowling in complaint and took up positions under the cover. Soon after, Evie had made certain all of them were accounted for, the traffic on the road south came to a halt. There were soldiers ahead, searching and questioning the travelers. Briar tied his riding horse's reins to the wagon and climbed up on the seat with Rosethorn. Gently, he took the team's reins from her hands. Rosethorn decided that now was as good a time as any. She half turned so that both of her companions could see her face under her wide brimmed straw hat. Tomorrow, we'll be reaching a big market town called Kushi. You might remember it from the map I showed you. We're going to have a small change in our plans after that. The caravan turns southeast from there, going on to Hanjian. You two will take our things and stay with the caravan, understand me? Briar, you're to get Evie, the cats, your shakens. No. Briar held the reins tightly, so much so that his knuckles had gone white, but he wasn't pulling too hard on the horse's mouths. She made sure of that. Don't argue with me, boy, she warned. No, Evie said. She knuckled an eye before a tear could escape. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I couldn't leave him in the cage. Please don't send me away. 
She crawled to the back with the cats. I won't leave. You can't make me. Rosethorn turned to Briar. You have to take her back to Emelon, she said, trying to hold his eyes with her own. He would not look at her, keeping his gaze on the team that pulled the wagon. Briar, you heard what they said. Weishu has kept the religious people in the local temples prisoner. Unless there was a miracle of some kind, no one has been able to smuggle word to Gyeongshi. I don't know if I'll beat the Imperial Army there, but I have to try. It's a horrible long way, Evie argued. It'll be dangerous, with bandits and rock slides and border guards. You'll need us. Be sensible, Briar said. Even with people being locked up and all, you're going the long way around. They probably will know by then. What will you do, turn and walk back out? Rose Thorn stared at the horse's ears. I have to help. You won't understand. If the first circle temple falls, it's sacred to everyone of the living circle. This is my faith and my devotion, my vows. Now we come to it, Briar said bleakly. Rose Thorn glared at him. My vows, but I won't risk your lives because I swore to defend my faith and those who take shelter in it. Neither of you is a believer. I am not dragging either of you into a war, and that is my last word on the subject. Rosethorn looked around the inside of the Gilov's wagon with admiration. The home of the head of the caravan and his family was ornate and as organized as the caravan itself. Each inch of space was put to use, with no clutter allowed on any surface. Rosethorn always took away ideas for her small workshop at home. She exchanged her greetings with Rajoni and her mother, Nisha. The Galav himself took over as ride leader while Nisha and his daughter had their midday with Rosethorn and talked business. The women invited Rosethorn to take a seat on a fold-out bench as she surveyed the food set on the table between the three of them. Since this clan of traders had its roots in the realms of the sun, Rosethorn was braced for the spicy vegetable stew with fish and green chilies and the pickles flavored with mustard seeds. Silently, she thanked Mila of the grain for the rice that took some of the bite off the chilies and mustard. She even managed believable thanks to her hosts for the excellence of the meal. She always thought of Lark when she ate food like this. Lark could eat spicy food by the bucket. The hotter, the better. She'd acquired a taste for it as a traveling player on the roads between the pebbled sea and the storm dragon's ocean. It was thanks to Lark that Rosethorn had at least a little preparation for some of the deadlier dishes of the southern and eastern countries. Once they had cleaned their hands, Rajoni was pouring a final cup of tea when Nisha asked, You said you have business with us? Rosethorn picked up the small cloth bundle she had put beside her when she took her seat. Carefully, she set it before them, centering it with her hands. She knew that she had the two traders' absolute attention. Negotiating business with traders was a ceremony, one that Rosethorn, Briar, and Evie appreciated. It involved gifts, which showed respect, and money, which showed thanks for the extra time and trouble those who conducted the caravan would be put to. To our sorrow, we have realized we must change our plans, Rosethorn told the other women. For reasons we may not discuss, we must leave the caravan at Kushi, but our goods, including Briar's miniature trees, must be conveyed to Hanjian and placed aboard the next trader ship for Summer Sea in Emelon, on the Pebbled Sea. We will need to purchase our pack animals and riding horses from you as well. She didn't mention that she would be selling or trading their horses for others in Kushi. The less that was known of their plans, even by tight-mouthed traders, the better. What of the cats? Nisha asked with a frown. It seems to me that your Evie exercises a control over the cats that will not be possible for strangers. 
It would be difficult to convey them. Not impossible, given proper consideration, of course. Of course, Rosethorn said. She sighed. No, the cats will be coming with us. In fact, the battle over the cats had been almost as bad as the battle for Briar and Evie to stay with Rosethorn. It was Evie's threat not to travel with them, but to follow them with the cats that had forced Rosethorn to agree. These are all very difficult and unusual requirements to fulfill, Nisha said. She folded her hands on the table. It was time for the real bargaining to start. Rosethorn opened the topmost folds of cloth on her bundle to reveal two rubies the size of pigeon's eggs. Evie could call forth the magic that was part of any stone, which meant that others would pay highly for what she had handled. She accepted precious stones in trade, which had come in handy on their way east. Hidden deep among the girls' things was a store of gems that the three of them had accumulated against emergencies during their travels in exchange for magical work. Rijoni and Nisha were interested in the rubies. Their faces were expressionless but Rosethorn could read the signs in the twitch of Rijoni's shoulder and the hitch in Nisha's breath. Now Rosethorn opened another fold in her package to reveal a vial and a small cloth bundle. A drop of this, Rosethorn touched a finger to the vial, on the lips of one you believe to be lying to you will result in truthful speech. A pinch of this, she touched the bundle of herbs, in a cup of tea for a laboring mother, will ease her birth completely. They are our gifts. A thank you in advance for the trouble we will cause. We will need a list of your requirements, Nisha said. Written instructions for the transport of your goods to Hanjian. And another for the ship that will take them to your home. Rosethorn reached into a pocket in her habit and brought out folded papers. There had been plenty of time that morning, while waiting for the Imperials to search for Parahan, to write everything out. I will have the instructions for the ship's captain later this afternoon, she said, handing the papers over. Rajoni looked her over. You will need magic on your face, she said frankly. Briar and Evie are fine for this country, but you stand out. I could go veiled, Rosethorn suggested. Our Mimander can place a spell that is hard for other mages to detect, Nisha replied. We've had to use it before. It will last a week, and those who look on you will believe you come from their country. Rosethorn frowned. I thought Mimanders could only deal in one kind of magic. Rajoni shrugged. You are able to work a spell from another mage if it is complete and needs but a word from you, yes? It is the same here. Rosethorn grimaced. I understand. There is another thing. The women raised their brows in the same expression. Up until that moment, Rosethorn would have said Rajoni resembled her father, the Gilav. She did her best not to smile, because now it was clear the daughter was her mother's child as well. Rosethorn took a sip of tea and opened another fold of her bundle. There lay some of the emperor's farewell gift, ten pieces of gold, each the length and width of Rosethorn's hand and twice the thickness of her cup. I need a map of the country between Kushi and the end of the Snow Serpent Pass in Gyeongshi, she said quietly. And I need a map of Gyeongshi. I will copy yours, or Briar will, but we need them. Nisha looked at Rosethorn, then at Rajoni. Trader maps were sacred documents, kept secret among traders. Rosethorn saw refusal in the women's eyes. She opened the last fold. The mage back in Leyenpa had traded Evie three Konbanpur diamonds for a handful of stones that Evie had prepared for magical use. In turn, Evie had spent one month of her spare time that winter doing nothing else but thinking about those stones when she was not carrying them in her pockets, bathing with them, 
and even sleeping with them. The next month, she had turned one of the diamonds into ten shards, which one of the local stone merchants happily traded for two small diamonds. The month after that, with further thought, she had tried to shape a large diamond again, carefully running her power down chosen fissures in the gem. The result lay on the cloth before them. A clean, many-surfaced stone, like a jewel-cut ruby, sapphire, or emerald, with a brilliant white fire. The cuts in stone were uneven, but Rosethorn could tell that made no difference, whatever, to the other women. She reached for it, saying, I do understand the maps are... Nisha beat her to the diamond. We will copy the maps. You will have them by the time we stop for the night. Be assured, they will be correct in all the ways you will require. Rajoni reached for a small basket nearby and placed the gifts in that. It is true, then? The emperor means to wage war on Gyeongshi? Rosethorn said nothing. Nisha was turning the diamond over in her palm. She looked up when Rosethorn did not reply. Seeing that Rosethorn hesitated, she pointed to the unlit lamp that hung over the table. What is said under the lamp is repeated only to those who are trusted, she assured Rosethorn. Rosethorn nodded. He is going to invade through Inshia. The traders exchanged looks. We were supposed to cross roads with Third Caravan Gurzi, 50 miles north of Dohan, Rajoni said, her voice just above a whisper. But only two of their people came by stealth to warn us. Imperial troops took the caravan. They now hold everyone but the two who escaped. Very slowly, our people are leaving Yanjing. Our imperial treaty states clearly that we are permitted to trade without harm. Either this emperor thinks we do not know our own treaties, or he believes we fear him too much to punish him by refusing to trade. Rosethorn felt a chill run down her spine. I pray you will escape Yan Jing before he sees that is what you are doing, she replied. It will go badly with your people if he realizes you are fleeing altogether. Rajoni made a V of two fingers and stabbed them at the floor. That was the way traders signaled spitting when they were unwilling to soil their carpets. Even though you are not one of ours, your prayers are welcome, Nisha said. Now, let us begin to make your arrangements, and do not worry that the other travelers will tell any imperial soldiers about those who left us unexpectedly in Kushi. We will make sure that they understand it is against their best interest to speak of it. Rosethorn thanked them for the meal and for the excellent bout of trading. Tying her wide straw hat to her head, she walked back to her wagon and her two unruly students. There was much to be done yet, even if the traders had taken on the burden of copying the maps. Briar and Evie had better have gotten their packing underway while she was gone, Rosethorn thought. She was still unhappy that they had been so impossible about continuing on to Emelon. She knew what Moonstream and her fellow dedicates back home would say when they learned she had dragged a child Evie's age into a war. Those two impossible young people would never hear that she was secretly glad they were coming with her. The only thing that had frightened her more than taking them into a land soon to be invaded was the thought of letting them travel back to Emelon without her. She trusted the traders, the ties that bound Briar, his foster sisters, their teachers, and the traders were many and strong. Too many and too strong to be erased by outsiders' money and magic. But they were not Rosethorn, and they were not aware of the special kinds of peril that followed those who wielded ambient magic. It was almost dawn when the three of them finally gave up on sleeping and finished their last preparations. Briar and Rosethorn had spent time before bed working with their traveling clothes. Sandry had made them from an unusual cloth, both the wool that most people wore 
and linen spun together with the wool. It was the linen that had mattered on delicate occasions when rose thorn or briar could call on it to look more elderly, worn, and hard used than it was. Their neat, clean traveling tunics and breeches turned into the weary clothes that poor farmers wore for days on end as they went about long hours of work. The braided trim came off to be packed away. The wooden buttons lost their polish and developed cracks and splinters. Briar planned to send Evie to buy straw sandals for them while he and Rosethorn swapped their horses for others more suited to poor farmers. Using Evie's light stones, they dressed, then quickly readied the horses and the cats. Two years of experience at having to leave some places quickly had made them good at being quiet. They were drinking tea made over some of Evie's hot stones when Rosethorn raised the cat issue again. Evie, they'll know to look for the cats. Can't you? Evie stared at her. Then I'll follow on my own. You don't know. All those years in Prince's Heights and Shamur, my cats were all I had. You never spent all your days with strangers looking to wallop you just for living. They were my blanket when I didn't have anything else. When I had to eat rat, they shared with me. I am not dumping them with strangers in a foreign place. Two of the hot stones cracked and went to pieces. Sorry. Evie walked away from them over to the wagon. We'll grow plants from the carry baskets, Briar told Rosethorn soothingly. If anyone asks, we'll say we bought the plants at the market, and we're going to try them in the garden. No one will notice there's cats inside. Steps, quiet ones, made them turn. Rigioni approached, carrying the smallest of lamps. She also had an old trader woman with her. When they reached Briar and Rosethorn, Rigioni said, when Grandmother learned what was going on, she had to log in your payment, understand. She told us we were fools. My children sell a charm to disguise the woman and never think of seven cats, the old woman remarked and shook her head. The soldiers capture you because of cats, then see charm to disguise woman and punish traders. No. She came to offer her help. Rejoni explained when she realized Rosethorn thought the old woman was going to create problems. For a price, Briar said quietly. Both women raised their eyebrows as if to say, what else? Money was the main thing that kept traders free and alive in the hostile lands where they made their living. Isn't it the Mimander who handles all spells, even purchased ones? Rosethorn asked. He had come the night before and set the disguise spell before she went to bed. It had changed the look and feel of her from top to toe, everything about her but the way she spoke. The Mimanda still snores in his bed, the grandmother replied crisply, and we have no charms to sell that will disguise baskets of cats as crates of gabbling chickens. This is work that must be done over the baskets and over the cats. But you can do it, Evie said. Her hands were bunched into fists. Even their sounds? The old woman looked at her. What do you offer, girl who changed the nature of diamonds? But I didn't, Evie said. I just broke them in the way they want to be broken. What people call flaws and stones... Those are really just opportunities, you know. Diamond opportunities are beyond other lugshai, the old woman said, using the word for non-trader craftsmen. Evie grinned. I have a few opportunities then. She went to the pack with her mage kit and dug in it. She soon returned with a piece of cloth. When she opened it, she revealed four long pieces of diamond that sparked in the light from Rijoni's lamp. These are diamond splinters. Your lugshai, or whoever you get, must fix these really well to a metal grip, then use them as a chisel on one of the flaws in a diamond. Diamond will cut diamond. It will cut the surface, too. So they have to grip the stone tight in some kind of vice, 
and it will break diamond. So they can't hit too hard, understand? Have we a bargain? Show me the cats. Then you can tell me if we have a bargain, the woman told her. Briar and Rosethorn stayed with Rajoni. I still don't understand, Rosethorn murmured to the other woman. We were always told about Mimanders and their one specialty. But they do not hold all the magic for the clan, any more than one mage holds all the magic for the village, the ride leader replied. Some of us have more or fewer talents for different kinds of magic, and some don't want to limit themselves to one thing all their days. Grandmother discovered she could hide things when there was a killing riot against traitors, and she hid her whole family. She was only five. She can unsour and sour milk, tell if a well has gone bad, cleanse a water source if it is bad. And she can make my mother back down as fast as a monsoon rain, which looks like magic to me. Are your horses ready? By the time the cats had come to look and sound like chickens, and their baskets had come to resemble crates, Evie and Rajoni's grandmother were on good terms. Evie was even allowed to kiss the old woman on the cheek before Rajoni took her back to the trader carts. Then it was time for the three travelers to mount their riding horses, the weariest, scruffiest animals the traders would allow them to keep, and lead their four pack horses to the market gate. It was a matter of a bit here and a bit there. When they emerged from the city sometime afternoon, they had sold the horses they had taken from the caravan at one horse trader, then bought shaggy, sturdy ponies to ride, and four bright-eyed, wary mules for pack animals from another. These were farm mules, used to humans and animals alike, which barely blinked at the false chickens they were forced to carry. The ponies, the trader had assured Rosethorn, were bred in the mountains and used to breathing there. After a trip to the cellars of used clothes, Evie once again had the bright headcloths she loved. Rosethorn chose the more sober colors of a married woman. Both had put on long skirts made of odds and ends, but their breeches were underneath them, just in case. Their packs could have been supplies for a farm or the things they needed for a long visit to relatives. As they left the town, they presented the picture of a family that knew how to travel. Each carried a cloth sling across the front of their chests. Other travelers used their slings for food, water bottles, cloths for wiping away sweat, or coin purses. Rosethorn and Briar carried round balls of seed, made to explode into thorny, strangling vines when they hit a target. Evie carried her stone alphabet, razor-edged throwing discs, and honey candies. She was always afraid of being hungry. Once they had passed the guards at the south gate on their way out of Cushy, Briar let Rosethorn and Evie ride ahead. He purchased steamed plum buns, pressed rice cakes, and ham at the vendors who kept shop beside the road. It was there that he saw an old beggar, or madman, hobble through the gate, propped by a long staff. His sack bent him half over. He was utterly filthy, barefooted and bareheaded, missing teeth and blind in one eye. His mingled gray and black locks were lank with greasy dirt. He offered a begging bowl to one of the soldiers on the gate, but the man just pushed it away and ordered the poor creature to move along. The beggar stumbled on and offered his bowl to travelers who were passing him by. Several wrinkled their noses and pretended he wasn't there. Others walked far around him. Briar shook his head. People assumed they would always be well-fed and well-clothed. The beggar lurched toward him, bringing a wave of piss stink and other smells with him. Briar breathed through his mouth and beckoned so the man could see him with his good eye. The beggar approached on stumbling feet, his staff clicking on the stones of the road. His feet, like his hands, were wrapped in stained and dirty rags. Good afternoon to you. Briar said, here you go. He put a handful of coins in the man's bowl first, then covered them with one of his many clean handkerchiefs. On top of that, he put two of the plum buns and three pressed rice cakes. 
A man could chew those, even with some of his front teeth missing. Thank you, young master, the beggar said, lisping through the gaps in his teeth. May Kanzan the merciful smile on you all your days. Briar put his palms together and bowed. May she smile on us all, friend, he said politely. The beggar stopped to tuck his food into various places in his upper garments. The coins vanished into a breeches pocket. Then he limped on, chewing a rice cake. Briar turned to collect the rest of the food he'd bought for his girls. You waste your money on the likes of that, the cook said. He'll just spend those coins on wine. Briar shrugged. If it makes him warm and happy for an hour or two, I'm not the one to judge. He bowed to the cook and tucked the bundle into the sling over his chest. Excusing himself to those he bumped, he wove through the walkers, wagons, and riders as he searched for Rosethorn and Evie. He thought he would overtake the beggar in only a few yards, but he was well along before he passed the man. The beggar had managed to hitch a ride on the tail of a farmer's cart and was dozing in spite of the faint drizzle. Briar grinned and passed the cart. Every step he took away from Cushy and their last ties to the caravan and the palace made his heart lighter. The traders had been decent, they always were, and the people traveling with the caravan were pleasant enough to talk to, but it was hard to keep an eye on Rosethorn and Evie among so many people. Here, too, it would be difficult, but soldiers would not be palace troops, fearing for their lives when the emperor learned that Parahan had escaped. Soldiers here would be bored and uninterested. He soon caught up to Rosethorn and Evie. They ate in the saddle while keeping a sharp eye on the pack animals. None of them had much to say. The cart with the sleeping beggar passed them by. But they passed him before too long. He was afoot again. The cart had turned down a smaller road away from the main one. The beggar, it seemed, wanted to go south but not the farmer who had given him a ride. More and more of those on the main road turned off it as the day drew to its close. Still, there were plenty of travelers remaining to enter the caravansary near sunset. Here, Rose Thorne's group was not far from the banks of the grinding Fist River and the high bridge they would be crossing in the morning. The sound of the river's thunder as it descended from the Drimbakang Sharlog was intimidating, though Briar would have bitten his own tongue rather than admit it. Briar and Rosethorn told those few fellow travelers who had taken an interest that they could not afford the prices of a caravansary, and they set their small camp up not far from the gates. Briar wasn't worried about bandits or wild animals here. Other travelers couldn't afford the caravansary or chose to save money, so the camp outside the walls was a good-sized one. The guards atop the caravansary walls could see them and come to their rescue if there was trouble. Rosethorn sent Evie to a nearby stream to fill their teapot and soup pot. The girl returned to tell Briar, You know that beggar fellow? He's soaking his feet in the stream. He stinks. I got the water upstream from him. Briar and Rosethorn looked at each other. You could put him downwind, Briar suggested. Go get him, she growled, and keep him away from our chickens. Oh, no, no, young fellow, thank you, no, the beggar said when Briar made his offer. I won't bother anyone here. You won't bother us. It won't be easy to see in the dark, and you're off on your own. We're making soup. Briar used the voice he called his best wheedle. He could get things out of Rosethorn with that voice. My mother can do very good things with soup. There will be ham in it. The beggar, it seemed, was made of sterner stuff. I know what I smell like. His lisping, slightly husky voice was gentle in the growing shadows. I will be fine. Kanzan shower blessings on you and those kind women you travel with. Briar returned to Rosethorn, shaking his head. The night passed quietly. When they woke, Briar returned to the stream for the morning's tea water. The beggar was gone. A bowl that looked 
just like one of their own sat under his tree, freshly cleaned. Briar carried it back with the pot full of water. I took him a little soup after you went to bed, Rosethorn said. That's all. Guards in imperial colors left the caravansary with the rest of the travelers that morning. Those who had camped outside were already lined up at the bridge, waiting for them to unlock the tall gates. Briar, Rosethorn, and Evie were near the end of that line with a pushy merchant behind them. They waited as the guards looked through many wagons before they finally unlocked the gates and people began to stream through. What were you looking for? Briar asked one guard as he was about to ride under the bridge. Escaped prisoner, the man said and yawned. As if he'd come this way. Gods pity him when the imperial torturers get him, the merchant in front of Rosethorn said bitterly. Everyone murmured agreement. Then they rode onto the bridge, where the thunder of the river below drowned out the sound of their crossing. Chapter 9 The Gorge of the Snow Serpent River Company continued to thin as people scattered to other roads. The land now was steep and hilly, with terrace farms on the slopes. Beyond them were mountains. By the map, Briar saw they were in a kind of funnel that would take them into the Snow Serpent Pass. Evie would have no cause to complain after that. They would be traveling down a gorge through the Drimbakang Low, the highest mountains in the world. Briar kept a keen eye on the people around them, knowing that Evie was too busy looking at the stones beside the road. The others were commoners by and large, an occasional priest on donkey back, Merchants on mules or horses followed by servants, peddlers, farmers, and the occasional beggar. Two days after they had crossed the bridge, Briar saw the man he had come to think of as their beggar again. They overtook him around mid-morning when a large wedding party left the road to cross the river. The beggar was seated by the road, digging a stone out of the wrappings on his feet. Successful, he rose and hobbled off, leaning on his tall staff. He moves fast for someone with a bad back, Rosethorn murmured. Maybe he's used to it, Briar suggested. Suddenly she stiffened. Look at his neck. The rags the beggar wore for scarves had come undone. The morning's stiff breeze blew them onto the hillside. He was struggling to climb after them when Evie galloped uphill to grab the flyaway rags. She had learned some riding tricks in their two years of travel, and she loved to show off. Like Rose Thorn, Briar was staring. The beggar's neck was as dirty as the rest of him. What his dirt could not cover was the shackle gall around his throat, the kind of scar that would come from years of wearing a metal collar. As Evie rode over to the beggar with his neck scarves, Rose Thorn murmured, Without the pack he carries, Briar replied, could the long hair be a wig? It's a good one. The rags on his feet and hands could be as much to cover scars from his chains as to keep him warm, Rosethorn added. But the blind eye? Oh, that's easy, Briar told her. This beggar we knew, back when I was with the thief lord, he would take the white lining of eggshells. He'd cut pieces of it to the right size, then punch a hole in them with a pin to see out of. It made me go all over goosebumps to watch him put them in his eyes. But he made money. It's the beggars that have something wrong with them that get the coin. Let's invite this one to supper, Rosethorn suggested. Let's. I'd like to know what he's doing out here. Briar kept an eye on the beggar all that day as they progressed along the road. There were no inspections. It seemed that those who were hunting for the emperor's missing captive did not think he would be heading west. Yet again, they camped outside a caravansary. The beggar was the only other person there to use the well and fire pits set up in the shelter of the wall. Briar started supper, and Evie saw to the animals while Rosethorn went in search of him. By the time Briar had a thick, hearty soup bubbling over the fire, Rosethorn returned triumphant, the beggar in her wake. Briar looked at them. What, you aren't towing him by the ear? 
Evie frowned. How come you always do that to us and not to him? Parahan gave Briar and Evie a sheepish look and a wave. His big satchel had lost its cover of rags and revealed itself as a couple of packs. These he put by the fire, as well as his staff, before he went to the well with an empty bucket. Once he filled it, he began to wash. The wig came off. The eye coverings came out. Rosethorn sent Evie over with a cloth and a jar of soap. By the time Parahan joined them, all that remained of the beggar was his robes. He sat down wind of them to correct for the scent of his clothing. I don't understand, Evie complained, once they had eaten enough hot food to be pleasant to one another. Why are you going the same way we are? It's simple enough, Parahan told them. A man has to eat. I haven't a copper to my name, and if I try to go home, I doubt that I'll get there. I imagine my uncle has his spies out looking for me by now, or he will soon. Weishu will pay him to get me back this time, to show the Yanjingyi nobles that no one can thwart the emperor and get away with it. Evie shuddered. If it looks like the emperor will get you, kill yourself first. Parahan nodded. I have seen what he's done to others. Trust me, if I know I cannot escape, I will not let myself fall into Weishu's hands a second time. And the eating part? Briar prodded. Parahan shrugged. Gyeongshi will be hiring fighters soon. The temples have plenty of money and treasure from pilgrims. I've seen the list of the jewelry my family has sent to the temples, so the priests in Gyeongshi will pray for my ancestors. They can afford me. I may be rusty, but I used to be considered a good warrior. It would have been even nicer if I could lead troops, but I'll take what I can get. They won't know I used to be a general. He grinned at Rosethorn. Maybe you'll put in a good word for me if I don't make it to the temples dedicated to my own gods. Less cheerfully, he added. I imagine I'll be able to give you a demonstration of my skills at the border. What do you mean? Evie had been about to serve herself another bowl of soup. She sat back down instead. What about the border? He's planning a war with Gyeongshi, Parahan replied. You don't think he's left the border with the remaining eastern pass wide open, do you? He looked at Rosethorn. What I don't understand is why you people are here. Why didn't you just send some magical message to Gyeongshi and go home as you planned? Just because we have magic doesn't mean we can fly, Evie told him scornfully. And even if we could talk through plants or stones, there's no one in Gyeongshi who could hear us. Rosethorn raised a finger in admonishment. That we know of. Evie rolled her eyes. Yes, teacher. I have to be precise, teacher. That we know of. And even if we could, Rosethorn swore vows. So she has to go to help. And we'll be Yuji Nandung if we'll let her go without us. Do I want to know what Yuji Nons are? Parahan asked, chuckling. No, Briar assured him. Not with it being night and all. The big man looked at Rosethorn. You shouldn't have brought them. She rubbed her temple with her fingers. You have my permission to send them back. Parahan looked at Briar and Evie taking a breath to speak. He hesitated when he saw the blazing light in their eyes and the hard set of their mouths. You saw only one of Weishu's armies. The God King is our friend, Evie said. Ducky is our friend. Rosethorn is going, which means we are going. Parahan sighed. Then we should sleep. It's always better to go to war if you've had proper sleep. They offered to rearrange things in the morning so that Parahan could ride, but he was far too tall for the ponies, and he protested that his dignity forbade his entering Gyeongshi on mule back. With his packs redistributed to the mules, his stride was long enough that they were able to keep pace with one another without losing too much time. They left before dawn, so none of those who had seen any of them the day before would suspect that the tall man walking alongside Rosethorn 
was the same bent beggar they had passed during their own journeys. The four also improved their pace, simply because there were ever fewer travelers. By the time the sun dropped behind the looming mountains and the evening cold set in, they were alone. There was no caravansary when they decided to make camp, only swaths of ground left bare by those who had stopped in the same places before them. Considerate travelers had left piled wood and stacks of dried dung for campfires. Rosethorn chose a spot with its own stream, well situated against a stony cliff that protected them from the wind. Even with summer on the way, the Jirmbakang Lo got cold at night. Parahan disposed of his stinking rags. From one of his packs, he produced the same general sort of tunic and breeches they wore. He hadn't been able to get boots that would fit him, he said, so he donned long socks and sturdy leather shoes from the same pack. Evie set the gate stones and released the chickens. Once they were out of their crates, the cats took on their normal appearances. Parahan, caring for the ponies and mules after his change of clothes and a cold wash, shook his head in amazement. And these are trader spells? He asked. Evie scowled at him. They'll cook you and eat you if you tell, she said, repeating an old lie about trader habits. I'm old and stringy, the man replied. Don't be cranky, Evie. I thought you liked me. That was before you got us into this mess, she grumbled. The gods would have found another path for us to enter this mess, Rosethorn said as she stirred the pot. Can't you tell fate when it bites you? No, Evie and Parahan said at the same time. She has to talk like that, Briar said. He was mixing and baking flatbread on a heated rock. She took religious vows and everything. Once they were seated with their meal, Parahan sighed. Warm feet. I had forgotten what warm feet were like. Now, I need to ask, how are you three fixed if it comes to a fight? The three looked at him. Evie, stay back with the animals. Rosethorn, what part of mage did you not understand? Briar reached into the sling on the ground next to him. Taking out a seed ball, he flipped it to the edge of the firelight, closest to the road. It burst, immediately sinking roots into the ground. The vines shot up and out, sprouting their long thorns as they grew, spreading around the ground where they struck. By the time they stopped, they were three feet in height and covered a circle of three feet in rough diameter. With no target, the thick stems had formed large curls around one another. Even in the flickering firelight, the thorns could be seen. Some were four inches long. Others were two inches long and two inches thick at the base, curled rather than straight like the longer ones. Parahan, fascinated, got up and started to walk toward the plant. Don't do that, Rosethorn said as the vines rustled. They're still awake. Parahan stopped. The vines settled. You could kill a man with that, he said, his voice cracking. We don't carry them for toys, Briar replied. Don't be so upset. I only let a couple of the seeds grow. Want to see what I have? Evie asked eagerly. No, Parahan said suddenly. No, I don't think I do. But you think I'm a kid, Evie protested, using Briar's slang for child. You don't think I can help protect us? Rocks rose from the ground and began to whirl around Parahan's head. Evu may may, Rosethorn said dangerously. Sorry, Parahan, Evie apologized. The stones fell to the ground. But you did know we're mages. I'm not sure I thought about what you three do in terms of war, he admitted. Sitting on his heels by the fire, he grinned. We may have an easier time getting past the border than I thought. Rosethorn served out the tea. What do you expect once we're there? She asked as she warmed her hands on her cup. It's a small post from what I learned, Parahan explained. 
If things were normal, we might expect caravans coming through southern Gyeongshi in another month, but not this early. Figure no traffic coming from the Gyeongshi side. There's a village that supports the border post on the Yanjing side. They keep perhaps five guards on duty at a time. We're going to have to fight if they've received word to stop anyone from crossing. If they've gotten word about you leaving the caravan, or about me, we'll really have to fight. We might scare them into running, Evie said cheerfully, giving Rhea a scratch. Parahan grunted. We might, though if they're imperial regulars, not locals recruited to stand still and look tough, they won't scare. He looked at the staff on the ground beside him. I wish I had a sword to go with this thing. Rosethorn looked at him in horror. You mean to take on armed guards with a staff? He wiped his bowl with the bread that Briar had made but I have three mages at my back. He stood and stretched as they stared up at him. Then he bent double at the waist and grabbed his ankles, bouncing a little without bending at the knees. Turning halfway, he put his right leg out in front of him as if he were lunging, and did so until his right leg was at a right angle, and his left was stretched all the way out. After he had done that a number of times, he switched his front leg to the left, Rose, Thorn, and Evie began to clean up, while Briar tried to do similar stretches. Finally, Parahan picked up his staff and pulled one end of it off to reveal a long, slender, double-edged blade. Not much as a throwing weapon, he told Briar, as he began to spin it in both hands. But I could jab fish if I was in the woods with no supper on my way south. I tried to stay off the roads, at least till I got to Kushi. When I finally got tired of fish, I tried the beggar disguise. That hurt as much as it helped. I wondered how you did that, Evie said, on her way to fetch dung for the fire. Once I had to go through this tunnel that wasn't quite high enough for me in Prince's Heights, where I used to live. It was really long. When I came out, I had a terrible ache in my back and my neck. I still do, Parahan admitted. He got the spear twirling over his head. Stepping well away from Briar, he spun it rapidly down along one side of his body, then up, over, and along the other. As the firelight sparked off the blade, it gave him the appearance of wings. He did other exercises while Rosethorn and Briar prepared more thorn balls and Evie more discs of flint and quartz. Off and on, they would look up to see him kicking and punching into the air, spinning to kick at the side, or to lash out with a fist so fast it was a blur. Finally, he came over to the fire with one of his packs, and settled in to sharpen his belt knife. Rosethorn gave him the cup of tea that was steeping beside her. This should help those aching muscles, she explained. As night fell, Briar drew the line of ponies and mules closer to their camp. Evie gathered her pack with her extra gate stones and created the enclosure where all of them would sleep. At first, Parahan balked at the thought of sleeping as part of a pile with the others. Briar waited until Rosethorn went off into the dark to explain about her lungs and how she needed all the warmth they could give now that they were in colder lands. We did it sometimes on our way to Gyeongshi when sleeping alone didn't keep us warm enough. She'd start coughing otherwise, he explained. When she returned, and Parahan and Evie had gone in separate directions for the last errands of the night, Briar had to cajole Rosethorn into sleeping at the center of the huddle. That would include Evie, the cats, Parahan, and himself. At first, Rosethorn insisted on taking an outside position with Parahan. The big man overhearing as he returned said flatly, we need every one of us at their best in the morning, woman. You may sleep on the outside and freeze tomorrow night, if we're alive and free. Rosethorn stared at Parahan for a long, worrisome moment, and then placed her bedroll on the ground. Parahan proceeded to bank the fire. Briar wondered if he ought to say he would pray for the man in the fight to come, or something of the sort. In the end, he simply put his own bedroll next to Rosethorn's and crawled into it.
Evie chose Rose Thorne's Freeside and Parahan Briars. Rose Thorne went to sprinkle her herb circle around the camp, including the ponies and mules. It was something she'd done several times on their way east create a kind of magical curtain that hid them from any predator, human, or animal that might come by. Once the circle was finished, she murmured her spell over it and returned to wriggle into her bedroll. Only then did the cats fit themselves into every comfortable spot that they could find. Briar was drifting off when Parahan said, Why don't we take the border at night? If we muffle all our clanking things, we might just sneak past. They'll expect us during the day. We could avoid a fight completely. Briar yawned. We can't do it. When Parahan spoke, he sounded peeved. I may only be a simple soldier, not an educated non sure, but I'm sure if you do it in small words, you can explain it to me in a way I can understand. Why should we not try the strategically far more sensible move of attempting the border crossing by night? Briar growled. He was tired and he was worried about the border just like everyone else. We're plant mages, oh strategist. Stop it, you two, Evie complained. Plants require sunlight. Surely even simple soldiers know that, Briar went on, ignoring Evie. Parahan might be a prince and a warrior, but he wasn't going to bully them into trying something when Rosethorn was not at her best. He also didn't need to know Rosethorn's secrets. It was Rosethorn, of course, who ruined it by telling the truth. He's only half lying, Parahan, she said. I don't see as well in the dark as I used to. I was ill six years ago. It's why I speak as I do, and why I have trouble catching my breath the higher we go, and why my night vision is limited. She died, Evie said with relish. Briar and his sisters went to the Deadlands and brought her back, only she left part of her speech and her breath and her sight there as a promise to the white jade god that she would return. Parahan's voice was shaky when he spoke again. That's a story, isn't it? It is not, Rosethorn said. I nearly died of the blue pox. We leave in the morning. Now go to sleep. That was the end of the night's conversation. They settled between the banked fire and the picketed mules and ponies, warm with their blankets, cats, and one another. Their night was so undisturbed that Parahan's only complaint in the morning was that Monster snored. The road was empty. None of them was happy with that, though they found no other signs of trouble. Eagles and buzzards soared overhead searching for a meal. In the distance, they saw a herd of goats moving on a looming hillside. As the hours passed, the lands ahead on their side of the river began to flatten. By mid-morning, they noticed distant fields off to their right, and the kind of isolated barns used for sheltering herds and storing hay. It was almost noon when they crested a rise in the road. Before them, a small river had cut a little flat-bottomed valley to the north as it hurried to join the snow serpent on their left. A quarter of a mile away and to the north, a walled town stood on the sloping hills that shaped the western side of the valley. Near it were grain fields and herds of the large shaggy cattle known as yaks. Where the road and the smaller river met, there stood a guard and toll house. It was built like the local dwellings, two stories tall and curving inward from ground to flat roof. The shutters were open on the narrow windows since it was a sunny day. Ivory plaster covered every chink in the walls. It was bigger than most of the houses, and there was a watchtower on the roof. A couple of horses grazed in a fenced-in field at the side of the building. If this place was like others in this area, Briar figured, the stables would be on the ground floor. One soldier in imperial livery stood by the barrier on the road. Four more lounged on benches on the side of the guardhouse. Briar squinted against the sunlight that shone into his eyes. A flag on the tower snapped in the wind.
All he could tell was the color, a bright, imperial yellow. Border crossing? He guessed. Two of the seated warriors rose and took up halberds that leaned against the guardhouse. The other two gathered quivers and crossbows that had been on the ground next to their feet, slinging the quivers onto their backs before they stood to set a quarrel in their crossbows. I think so, Parahan replied. Rosethorn and Briar double-checked the slings on their chests. Their seed bombs lay ready. Their mage kits were open and strapped tight on the saddles in front of them, in case they were needed. Evie was leading the pack mules. She had her own cloth sling ready, with discs of quartz and flint ready for use. This may be nothing, Rosethorn cautioned. They said no more until they were within shouting distance of the guard on the barrier. He was a strongly built older man who kept all of his attention on their small party. Hello, Parahan cried cheerfully. It must be a dull day for you fellows with no one else on the road. Halt for inspection, the oldest man shouted back. In the name of our glorious emperor. Gladly, Parahan called, not slowing his pace forward. Only, would you ask your fellows there to lower their crossbows? My wife is in the family way, and they're making her nervous. Rogue muttered Rosethorn. Your endearments make me yearn for our nights together, my sweetest, Parahan whispered. Briar choked, trying not to laugh aloud, as Rosethorn turned crimson. How can you joke at a time like this, she demanded. If not at a time like this, when? Parahan asked. Briar fingered the cloth balls in his sling, skipping from the killer thorns to the ropey ones. He supposed Rosethorn would want him to use the ropes, though the thorns would ensure that none of these people followed them into Kyongxi. If the emperor was declaring war after all, why should they care if they broke the laws of the border? But Rosethorn would care if Briar killed anyone he didn't absolutely have to. He wondered if she'd discussed that issue with Parahan. Halt, shouted the leader again. Dismount and raise your hands. Is there a problem, sirs? As I have said, my wife is in a delicate condition, Parahan called. They were crossing the bridge over the Lesser River. Get ready, he told his companions once they reached the other side. Stop right here. If we get any closer, they'll win the fight. He swiftly brought down the top of his staff and removed the cap, sliding the wooden tube into the front of his tunic. You answer to the descriptions of criminals wanted by the emperor cried the leader. Put down your weapons, dismount and kneel. The crossbow archers leveled their weapons at their group. Evie snapped two pieces of quartz into the air. They flew straight at the archers, who threw up their hands to protect their eyes. Their weapons clattered to the ground. Their bolts began to sprout leaves. The commander shouted an order. The archers grabbed their bows and put fresh bolts from their quivers to the string. The men with halberds ran toward Rosethorn and Evie, who had moved to the right to deal with anyone who came from the house. Rosethorn whispered something to the cloth ball in her hand and threw it at the spearmen. It burst as it struck the ground, throwing its burden of seeds into the air. Vines that went from thread-like to thick shot from the ground at their feet. They wrapped around the spearmen's feet and crawled up around their legs. Briar trotted his pony forward. The crossbow bolt that came for him dropped to the ground and sprouted roots. The second bolt struck a disc of quartz in midair and fell to the ground. The disc returned to Evie. Briar didn't thank her. He had gotten close enough to throw his own ball of seed where he wanted it to go. It landed between the two archers and exploded into thorny growth. The older soldier, the one in command, had unsheathed his sword and run forward the moment the archers released their second round of bolts. He met Parahan's spear with his sword, baring his teeth in a growl. For a moment, Briar stared as Parahan blazed into action. The big man reversed his spear. He slammed the butt end up under the commander's jaw, hard enough to break it, then swept it down, jamming it into the side of the soldier's right knee. The Yanjing Yi man's leg buckled. He slashed sidelong at Parahan, but the bigger man had continued his motion, smacking the staff of his spear hard into the back of the soldier's head.
The Yan Jing Yi man hit the ground and rolled away from Parahan. Briar could look no longer. More yells were coming from the direction of the guardhouse. Four soldiers spilled out of it, wiping their mouths on their sleeves or fumbling with weapons. Evie pitched a ball at the fresh arrivals, as if she played at nine pins. It was quartz, the size of both of her fists, and it rolled swiftly across the flat ground toward the new soldiers. They didn't see it until it reached them and exploded into a number of sharp stone needles. The four men split apart. Two fell screaming to the ground. They tried blindly to pull the sharp stone slivers from their faces. The third ran toward Parahan and one toward Rosethorn, both drawing their swords. Rosethorn pointed to some of the vines that had completely covered the two spearmen near their bench. The green ropes reached for the swordsman who came at her and grabbed him by the throat. Briar looked for the mules. Evie had them on a long rein with one end tied to her waist. Doesn't she know they could pull her out of the saddle? He thought, panicked. He dismounted and ran back to the animals who were on the verge of panic. Digging in a pocket, he found the handful of calming herbs he'd put there. Carefully, he blew some over each animal's nose until they had lost that white ring around their eyes. He checked on Evie again. She was steadfast next to Rosethorn. They waited for the enemy's next attack, Evie with a second stone ball in her hand, Rosethorn with another thorny vine ball in hers. Parahan seized the commander's sword and dagger and turned to greet a soldier who rushed him, a sword in his fist. The big man was grinning, his teeth right against his brown skin. The soldier who had come to attack him halted just out of reach, his sword at the ready. Parahan fainted to the side. The soldier was stupid enough to swing that way, bringing his weapon up to guard. He never saw Parahan cut his head off. Evie glanced at movement in the windows on the second floor of the guardhouse. Archers hung out of two of them. She reached into her sling and brought out two flint circles, handling them carefully. Briar only had a moment to register their color before she sent first one, then the next, flying through the air just as she had the rounds of quartz. They flew straight at the archers. One circle embedded itself in the archer's chest. He vanished from view. The other circle struck the second archer as he lowered his crossbow after shooting. His bolt went over Rosethorn's head and narrowly missed a peacefully grazing mule. The dark circle the girl had thrown hit the archer's throat. He pitched forward out of the window and lay still on the ground. At last, everything was quiet except for the soft roar of the river and a hawk's distant shriek. Parahan wiped his mouth on his wrist and groped at his waist for his water flask. It startled him and his companions to see that his belt had fallen off, cut in two by the commander. His flask had gotten trampled at some point. He looked at the women and Briar, confused. Wait, Briar called. He took his own flask over to the big man. Thanks, Parahan said. He set the sword he had taken on the ground, gulped half of the water, and then poured the rest over his head. Were they waiting for us? Rosethorn asked. Parahan shrugged. Briar saw sheets of paper flutter under a stone near where the commander of the soldiers had first been standing. He wandered over and pulled them out from under the stone. He couldn't read the Yan Jing Yi writing under the drawings on each paper, but the pictures were perfectly clear. Parahan on one, Evie, Rosethorn, and Briar on the other. He gave them to Rosethorn, then went to make certain that the mules were unharmed. Rosethorn remained in the saddle, watching the guardhouse. Once she had looked at the papers, she stuffed them in the sling on her chest and took out more thorn balls just in case. Evie dismounted from her pony. She let the reins trail so the animal wouldn't wander, then trudged toward the guardhouse. I don't think that's a good idea, Rosethorn called. Evie looked back at her. Are you joking? Do you know how long it takes me to nap an edge on those flint pieces so I can throw them just right? I don't think I'm going to find more flint here either. She looked at the fallen archer, gulped, and bent down to pry the dark stone circle from his throat. Parahan followed and took it from her fingers to wipe it clean on the dead man's clothing. 
Beetle dung, it is flint, he said. I'll get the other one, Evie May May. You wait here. I'll go with him, Briar told Rose Thorn. Evie, come watch the mules. He waited until Evie took the reins before he ran into the guardhouse after Parahan. The downstairs was empty of animals, except for chickens on their nests. Upstairs was the main living room. Midday for the guards sat half eaten on a long table. Pallets were rolled up and stacked in a corner. The archer who had fallen inside lay in a heap on the floor, plucking at the flint circle stuck in his chest. Parahan killed him with a sword thrust. We can't have them reporting who did this, he told Briar. He retrieved Evie's second flint circle and wiped it off. Perhaps you shouldn't tell Rosethorn, though. Briar grimaced. Rosethorn would not like to hear of the killing of a wounded man, but Parahan was right. We'd best get out of here, then, before the townsfolk come. Yes, you're right. Ouch! Briar saw that the big man was sucking blood off a fingertip. Oh, sorry, those things are nasty sharp. He took a handkerchief from his pocket and slid the circle from Parahan's hold. Carefully, he wrapped the flint and put it in his sling. But even so, he could see it was cutting through the linen of the handkerchief. Evie owed him a fresh one. As they went down the ladder, Parahan said, I confess, even with their magic, I am impressed with how strong-hearted our ladies are in battle. Will they need time to calm themselves? We can't linger. The herd boys will report trouble here to the town. When they went outside, they found that Rose Thorn had tethered her pony. She had managed to catch one of the horses and saddled and bridled it. From the length of the stirrups, she meant the browned gelding for Parahan. Are you finished? She asked them. Because I would like to put some distance between us and this now. Yes, mother, Briar said. To Parahan, he said, see, she's calm. He skittered out of the way when Rosethorn mimed a swat at him. Smiling, Briar took Evie the flint disc Parahan had recovered. She tucked it into the pocket with the other flint after wiping off the last traces of blood. Briar said nothing to her about the vomit he could see a few yards away. Evie never faltered in battle, but blood still set her back on occasion. Moving quickly but without fuss, Parahan resupplied himself from the dead soldiers until he had two swords, a belt, an iron-covered leather jerkin, and leather boots that fit. After testing a couple of the spears used by the Yanjing Yi guards, he fashioned a quiver for them and his spear and slung it across his back. Evie found a spare water bottle for him. She and Briar swiftly searched the food packs for some kind of midday meal before they swung into their own saddles. The four of them shared out cold rice balls wrapped in leaves and cold red bean buns. As they were about to leave, Rosethorn trotted her pony by the open windows and tossed two of her thorn balls inside. Vines began to sprout through the doors and windows as she joined the other three on the road. Chickens erupted from their side of the house, squawking in alarm. As they moved on, Briar tossed a thorn ball of his own onto the road behind them. In the house, spiked vines were shooting out of the upper windows. Those vines that grew from where dead man lay now crawled over the ground, snake-like, bound to meet their friends in the guardhouse. There was no sign of bodies anywhere. The vines had spread to cover them all. They'll know we were here, Parahan said. Too bad, Briar and Rosethorn said at the same time. I was tired of sneaking around anyway, Briar added. Let's teach Wei Shu to keep his greedy hands to himself. Chapter 10 Snow Serpent Pass They trotted forward as the mules complained. I don't see what you're whining about, Evie told them. You just stood around while we did all the work. She had put her rice ball half eaten and her bun untouched back into the cloth sling over her chest. Though she had done her part without flinching earlier, the memory of the man whose throat she'd cut 
kept rising past any other thoughts or pictures in her head. He joined her vivid memories of a handful of people she had killed, trying to survive before she had met Briar and Rosethorn, and in bandit attacks on the road to Gyeongshi. It never got easier. When the road curved around the edge of a hill, she looked back. Thick green thorn vines covered everything between the tumbling river and the fence behind the guardhouse. The chickens and the horses that had grazed inside the fence had gotten away. The chickens to huddle on the bridge, the horses to gallop through the fields. Someone would notice the problem sooner or later, but by the time anyone came to look, the thorns would have reached the water's edge, blocking the road completely. They could try to go behind the guardhouse to get at the road, Evie supposed. She wasn't really sure when the thorns would stop growing. Rosethorn and Briar created very determined magic. She looked ahead once more. At least the dead men were covered. That was something, since they hadn't had time to give them a burial or prayers. They trotted a mile before the jolting and the image got to Evie. She cried for a halt. She dashed behind a boulder on the hillside and lost what food she'd eaten. Once she'd covered that mess, she heard Rosethorn call, I'm coming up, nobody watch. Since that meant Rosethorn needed to take care of business, Evie thought she might as well do the same. She had her complaints about dried grass, but it was what was available. She was tugging at the ties on her breeches when Rosethorn asked quietly, Are you all right? It's just, I don't like killing people, Evie whispered ashamed of her weakness. None of us likes it. There would be something wrong with you, with us, if you did. You know Briar jokes to cover it up sometimes. You know he also has nightmares. Oh, Evie breathed. She had been so caught up in the picture of the dead man that she had forgotten all the times she had been roused in the night by Briar and Rosethorn crying out in their dreams. Parahan will be different. He's a soldier. We saw that today. It wasn't just bragging from him. It may not bother him as it does us, but you aren't weak because you threw up, girl. You're human. Thank you, Evie whispered. Feeling less like slime, she scrambled down the hillside to wash her hands. They went numb as soon as she dipped them in the icy brown torrent. She got to her feet and tucked her fingers into her armpits to warm them, glaring at Briar and Parahan as she walked over to the mules. It wasn't fair that men didn't have to twist themselves into knots to pee. Rosethorn looked up the gorge, her eyes narrow. My boy's restless, not you, Briar, my mount. I don't think he likes what he smells on the wind. Evie gulped. Their long travels from Chamor had taught them respect for the animals that worked the trade roads. She went to her pack and searched for the bag that held her exploding quartz balls. We have no choice but to ride on, Parahan replied. Wait here. Without stopping for anyone's reply, he hung his sling of spears from his saddle horn, taking only one as he climbed the dip between two hills to their right. Evie could see him long after she stopped hearing him. Her respect for the big man went up several more notches. It took plenty of skill to move so silently over loose gravel and long grass. She, Briar, and Rosethorn continued to load their ponies with the magical weapons they might need for another, perhaps bigger battle. She and Briar had their daggers as well. Evie wore two blades inside and two outside her belt, in addition to one at the back of her neck, inside her jacket. She didn't know where all of Briar's were, except for the obvious ones. As far as Evie knew, Rosethorn didn't carry extra weapons. A kit with blades in it hung at her waist. But they were supposed to be used with plants. The only non-plant use Rosethorn had for her belt knife was to cut her meat. Of course, Rosethorn could turn most plants into something nasty. Evie hoped that would be enough. She feared that it would not be. Here in this steep gorge with its single road, she could not forget 
that for her entire life, the one fixed idea in her world was that the emperor of Yanjing was as powerful as any god and more powerful than some of them. She had seen nothing at the Winter Palace to teach her any different. When they had destroyed the guard station, they had declared their own war against the Yanjing Empire. All she could do was pray that Gyeongshi could somehow do what no other country had managed to do when the imperial armies marched. Defeat them. A few stones rattled down the hillside, distracting her from her dark thoughts. Parahan was coming back. I don't know what's on the road ahead, he told them when he reached their group. I only saw about a mile's length of it, but there's a game trail that way, he pointed uphill, that takes us out of view while still allowing us to travel along the line of the river. We might be able to skirt anyone on the road itself. Tie everything down that might make a noise, Rosethorn ordered. Muffle the harnesses, whatever jingles. Evie, your chickens must take a nap, I'm afraid. Evie grimaced, but she took out the packet of cat sleep herbs and sprinkled some over the crates. She used only a pinch for each. The spell was powerful. Normally, the traitor spell that disguised the cats was enough to make people think they heard hens, but Rosethorn didn't want to risk any noise as they moved to higher ground. Rosethorn continued to say, We'll walk. Check your own gear. Nothing that clanks. Parahan, muffle those spears. When they were ready, Rosethorn told Parahan, Evie leads. His eyes went wide with surprise. Evie? But you'll see, Rosethorn told him. Go on, girl. Evie said nothing. She was already summoning her magic. With her in the front and Rosethorn in the rear, they set off, each of them leading a pair of animals. Evie slid the reins up over her elbows so she could stretch out her hands. Gently, she flicked and twitched her fingers, shaking them to and fro lightly at the same time as she sent her power out to the many bits of stone uphill of her. Inside her head, she could feel the stones in the cut between the two hills giggle as they shifted and slid, all sizes easing around one another. They had never had this kind of energy before, but it was more interesting than just tumbling down, pushed by streams of snowmelt or rain, or the feet of animals. They liked it. The only sounds the rocks made were faint clicks as they edged into position, each one sliding into the right spot next to another. Behind her, Evie left a smooth stone path under the horses and the mule's feet. Better yet, the new footing gave way just enough to cut the sound their hooves made. Up and up they climbed. At last, she heard a soft bird whistle. She glanced back to see Parahan point off to her left. There, in a dip on the far side of the western hill, was the game trail. She turned onto it, hands still moving. The trail itself was beaten earth. This time, she urged the stones to either side, letting them roll into deeper grass. The ground began to rise again. To their right, to the northeast, hill after craggy green hill rose, stabbing into the sky. Behind them were the mountains of the Drimbakang Sharlog. Evie could hear Rosethorn was struggling to breathe. She needed her special tea for managing in the heights. Evie or Briar would make it when they stopped for lunch. They must be higher than Evie realized if Rosethorn was having trouble. These were mountains, for all they looked like hills close up. They hummed in Evie's bones. What would she do when she came to the big ones, those with rocky sides that had been swept of almost anything but stone and snow? Those mountains would sing in a voice that would surely rattle her poor head clean off her neck. Short of the top of the fourth hill, Another soft whistle from Parahan brought her to a stop. This time, he left his horse and mule and crept ahead of the others. Evie sat in the grass and even ate a bit after she thumped the muscle cramps from her thighs. Working her magic and teasing those stones had thrust the horrors down where she didn't have to think about them. 
Briar had made a cold mix of Rose Thorn's breathing tea and was pouring it for her. It was just as well they had gotten a chance to rest. Parahan returned and beckoned to them close. There is half a company in the road, he said, his voice barely a whisper. Fifty soldiers, Yan Jing Yi regulars curse it, not locals. If we're quiet, they'll never know we were here, Briar replied, his voice just as soft. The game trail will put that next ridge between us and them. Even if they look up, they won't see us. We've got to take word to the God King about Wei Shu's plans. Guaranteed he doesn't know these cacks are here either. Parahan grinned at Briar's use of the traitor slang. Rosethorn nodded at his thinking. Once more, they went forward with Parahan in the lead. Evie reached farther ahead with her power, shooing the rocks away. Even the animals seemed to understand that the alternative to silence was death if the enemy caught them. Between more hills they went, the green shoulders rising sharply on both sides of their group. The biggest worry came when they reached a stream. It ran along the foot of a tall ridge on their right. They couldn't avoid a little splashing as the animals crossed. When they halted on the far side, there were no sounds of movement anywhere. Parahan crawled to the shoulder of the hill on their left to see if he could glimpse the road and the enemy. When he came back, he said they were now beyond the soldiers below. If their present trail kept on parallel to the road heading west, they might evade the Yanjing Yi soldiers completely. Rosethorn and Briar weren't listening. Like the ponies and the mules, and even Parahan's horse, they had pointed their noses into the wind that came down from the north and over the stream. Bamboo, Rosethorn whispered. Seaweed, vinegar. Briar frowned. Peony? Pomegranate for certain. They turned their heads to stare uphill at the ridge. Parahan said a few things in his own language and drew his swords. Wait, Evie told him. She threw her magic up the slope and let it spread. When it spilled over the top of the ridge, Evie felt wheat on the stones there. The kind of moving weight that said people to her. She shifted the rocks, straining to pull the bigger ones toward the edge. Someone above shouted. Briar knocked Evie down, still wiggling her hands, her power, and the rocks. She looked around. Arrowheads lay on the dirt as long wooden splinters, the remains of their bolts, sprouted tendrils and leaves. Rosethorn smiled grimly and muttered, Try to catch me unawares, will you? Getting to his knees beside Evie, Briar glared at the ridge. As weeds and grass sprouted madly along the sloping ground, five people looked over the edge. Two wore black scholars' robes with the gold sashes of mages. Ropes of beads hung around their necks and in their hands. Two more were archers. The fifth was armed with a halberd. All five were struggling to keep their feet. The archers also did their best to fit fresh arrows to their crossbows. Evie yanked her hands up. Rocks flew into the air above the ridge. The archers dropped their bows as they covered their eyes with their hands. She tugged her hands forward. The mages had protected themselves from the airborne stones, but it was another matter to have the ground pull away from their feet. They stumbled, trying to stay upright. Something was going wrong with the long strings of beads in their hands. They twisted together around the mages' wrists, binding them like rope. The loops of beads around each mage's neck spun swiftly, winding tighter and tighter, strangling the wearer. The mages struggled to pull their traitor necklaces away from their necks without success. Their faces got redder and redder as they fought to breathe. Evie gave all of the stones on the ridge one last savage pull. This time, it was the ponies and mules that saved her and her companions, hauling them away from the landslide by the reins looped around their arms as the entire ridge came down. They scrambled with the animals to retreat from the tumbling earth and rock. The stone of the ridge roared past them through a dip between hills, dragging the Yanjing Yi mages with it. When everything settled but for a haze of dust, there was no sign of the warriors who had stood with them. The two mages lay on the heap of fallen rock where it had come to a halt. They were clearly dead. 
Evie crept to the southern hilltop to see the road. There was no sign of the enemy. She was starting to grin in relief when she saw movement at the crown of the western hill. She scrambled back to Parahan and pointed west. Yan Jing Yi warriors in domed helmets and armor galloped over the hill's crest. Evie guessed they'd heard the rock slide. Now she strained to give them a rock slide of their own, struggling to find and move the medium and big stones in front of them. She was too tired for small ones at that distance. She flinched when the archers among them raised their crossbows, as if the bolts had struck her already. Parahan scooped up a couple of round, hard stones and threw first one, then the other, with vicious accuracy. Each hit an archer in the face, knocking him out of the saddle and under the other horse's hooves. Parahan grabbed two more stones. Suddenly, Evie saw the bows leap from the remaining archer's hands. The crossbows broke apart in midair, raining stocks, lathes, arrowheads, and splintered shafts down on the other riders. She laughed in spite of herself, as lathes and shafts grew and sprouted leaves, then wound around the arms and necks of the soldiers. Stocks planted themselves in the ground and grew as trees. Horses reared and slipped, trying not to run headfirst into trees that had not been there a moment before. Briar and Rosethorn were hard at work. Parahan grinned at Evie, then snapped his rocks at one soldier each, striking their heads with deadly accuracy. Down they went. The horses that missed the growing trees slipped, losing their balance on moving stones and pebbles. They went down. Those behind them piled on top. Evie ground her teeth and kept the stones on the slope under the riders moving. Men were screaming. She opened her eyes. Briar had run forward to pitch seed balls as far and high as they would go into the air over the charging soldiers. The cloth balls burst at his command, sprouting deadly vines with sword-sharp thorns in midair. The falling deadly net trapped the remaining soldiers and their mounts together with the ropes grown from pieces of crossbow and the fast-growing trees. Evie shrieked as more arrows arched into the air from the far side of the hilltop. Parahan, at her side, laid a hand on her arm. Evie, look, what are you screaming for? She had thought they were fire arrows. In truth, they were crossbow bolts dyed bright orange. These struck short of her and her companions, into the ranks of Yan Jingyi soldiers. More followed, again dropping into the net and the enemy beneath. New soldier archers, these in pointed helmets, charged over the hill in the wake of the arrows. Deftly, they split apart to avoid the fallen enemy and the trap of thorny vines. The newcomer's leather armor was worn over flame-colored silk. The metal pieces fixed to the leather in tidy rows were bronze, not iron, and they were rounded, not flat, as the Yan Jingyi soldiers wore their metal. Their horses were smaller, nimble, and less dismayed by sliding rock. Where had she seen them before? Garmishing! These were Gyeongshin soldiers. Half of their allies split off and galloped downhill toward the road. Parahan swung into his own horse's saddle and followed. Evie released her stones and collapsed on the ground. She watched blankly as the Gyeongshin soldiers who stayed behind killed any living Yan Jingyi soldiers. Two Gyeongshin warriors rode over to Rosethorn and Briar. Now that she had a chance to catch her breath, Evie looked at the trickles of blood that emerged from beneath the heap of thorns and felt unclean. She scrubbed her hands on her breeches. We had to kill them, she told herself. The emperor's soldiers were going to kill us, them, and their mages, to stop us from getting word to Gyeongshi that the emperor is coming, so the emperor can torture Parahan to death. Why did we bother, she wondered, swimming in self-hate. She trembled from top to toe. All of this means nothing. These dead horses and dead men. It's all camel spit and a high wind because the emperor is coming. Gyeongshi is so small. Gyeongshi doesn't have a chance against Yan Jing. The two warriors dismounted before Rose Thorn and Briar. They put their palms together before their faces and bowed low to Rose Thorn. Dedicate, the taller of them said.
I had the honor of seeing you in Gyeongshi over the winter. I am Captain Rana, sent by the God King and first delegate of the living Soko Jiangbu Dokhi to ensure your safe arrival in Gyeongshi. This is my sergeant, Kanbab. I beg your pardon for our lateness. We did not know the beast, Yan Jingyi, had crept up the gorge to lay in wait. Excuse me. He turned and held up a hand. A warrior trotted forward. Get to General Serugo. Tell her the enemy is here. We surprised a company and are dealing with them. There may be more moving northwest above the road. As fast as you can ride. And I know that's fast. The soldier bowed and ran to collect his horse. To Sergeant Kanbab, the captain said, Take half of our people. Help Sergeant Yongden mop up on the road. We must take the dedicate and her companions to the general as soon as possible. Rose Thorne took a drink from the flask at her belt. Forgive me, Captain Rana, but we are on our way to Garmishing. We have important news for the God King and First Dedicate Dok Yi. The captain smiled. The First Dedicate has anticipated you, he replied. He waits at Fort Sambachu, at the end of this gorge, our home base. A fort? Not the temple in Garmishing, Rose Thorne said. I am certain the first dedicate will explain when you see him, Rana said. If you will excuse me, I must see to my wounded. Rose Thorn and Briar walked slowly over to Evie, towing the mules and their ponies. Once the animals were tethered, both of them sat beside her in silence. After a moment, Evie leaned against Briar's shoulder. A glance told her Rosethorn had stretched out on the grass and cradled her head on Briar's knee. Do you want to lie down? Evie asked Briar. I don't mind. I'll just lean against you, he said. We can prop each other up. Good, Evie whispered. She let her eyes close. If she had her way, she would never fight again. Evie slid off his shoulder at some point. Briar woke in time to catch her and lowered her to the grass. Rosethorn had rolled away from him and curled up in a knot. Once awake, he felt too itchy to rest. One of the Gyeongshin soldiers offered him a flask of tea. Briar had a drink and looked around at the mess they had made. They and the emperor's soldiers of a beautiful mountain cove. Now that he had time to think and remember, Something puzzled him. He went back to the rock slide Evie had made of the ridge. At first, his feet simply went out from under him as he tried to reach the two dead Yan Jingyi mages. Suddenly, the sliding rocks held still. He turned to see Evie's eyes on him. He smiled at her and pursued the short climb to the corpses. He hadn't been mistaken. Their bead necklaces had strangled them while he had bound their hands, using the wooden beads in their bracelets. Briar knelt and touched a bare spot where the cord lay exposed against a dead mage's throat. Cotton. The necklace had been threaded on cotton. Not only that, but the cord tingled with the remnants of a magic he knew very well. He scrambled down to solid earth and walked over to his teacher. She was sitting up and talking with Captain Rana. When they stopped and looked at him, Briar said, Cotton. Rosethorn raised an eyebrow at him. You strangled them with the cotton thread on their own mage necklaces. They didn't even try to stop you? They couldn't even tell I was there, Rosethorn replied calmly. Briar, they truly don't understand ambient magic. We will be very useful here. Her voice was perfectly reasonable. You could have done it just as easily. She looked at Captain Rana. Would someone build us a small fire? We need to collect these beads and burn them before they fall into someone else's hands. She and Briar went to collect the beads as the captain gave orders. It took some of their supplies of herbs that kept magic from spreading, but they saw all of the Yan Jing Yi mage's beads destroyed in a nice, hot fire. They were even able to destroy the enemy's mage kits. A part of Briar 
wanted to go through them for curiosity's sake. Rosethorn pointed out that just as they left special surprises in their own mage kits for snoops, the Yanjing Yi mages could be expected to have something similar. Briar and Evie both sighed at the missed opportunity and let the kits burn. By the time they were finished, Parahan and the other Gyeongshin warriors returned to report success at the road. There were no Yan Jing Yi soldiers left to carry word of Gyeongshin soldiers in the pass. Just as good, from Briar's point of view, those Gyeongshin who took wounds were not badly hurt. Rosethorn Briar and Captain Rana's healers were able to patch them up quickly before they all rode out. They had not gone far before Briar noticed that Evie was swaying in the saddle. Rana allowed him to switch to one of the surviving horses so he could take Evie up in the saddle in front of him. Briar's pony would not have appreciated the extra weight. Evie was exhausted. Lately, the work didn't ring her out as it had today, but she had not shaped the paths of so many rocks in such different ways before this. Briar asked Rana if they could stop long enough to make hot tea or soup, but the man refused. Briar understood. If there was one company of the enemy in these hills, there might be more. But he was desperately worried for his two companions. Parahan finally caught Rosethorn when she began to slide from her mule, and pulled her up to ride with him as well. At least the captain sent riders ahead to his camp to prepare hot liquids and food in advance of their arrival. In camp, Parahan and Briar wrapped Rosethorn and Evie in blankets and propped them in front of the captain's fire, where Captain Rana and Sergeant Canbob joined them. Briar was startled when Canbob removed his helmet to free a tumbling waist-length braid of black hair. She grinned at his obvious surprise. Sergeant Canbob is my right hand, the captain said. I would be in bad shape without her. A good number of Gyeongshin women serve in the army before they marry. Some of them stay even afterward, like the sergeant and General Seirugo. Ken Bob bowed to Rosethorn. The men wish to know if they may eat the honored dedicate's chickens. My cats, Evie cried wearily, trying to struggle out of the blankets. They're really cats. You can't eat them. I'll take the spell off, Briar told her. Finish that tea and have another cup. He rose, trying not to groan. He had put out a lot of magic, too, without being able to draw more from his best shakin, which was now on its way to Han Jian. Every muscle in his body ached. The crates had been placed beside the small round tents that were to serve Rosethorn, Evie, Briar, and Parahan. Approaching them, Briar shook his head at the soldiers who stood nearby. Sorry, lads, he said in Tion, hoping they understood. They aren't as tasty as you'd think. Kneeling among the cackling crates, he murmured the words he'd been taught by the Mamander. Suddenly, crates, chickens, and chicken noises were gone. From the look on Asa's and Ball's faces, Briar knew they were going to make their humans pay for the extra long nap they'd had from the dose of sleeping herbs. Monster stuck his head through an opening in the side of his carrier and squeaked. For a large cat, he had a very tiny voice. Briar grinned. You don't hold a grudge, do you, old man? Evie staggered over, her eyes swollen with exhaustion. I can't do gate stones to keep them from straying, she whined. I'm too tired. I'll do herbs, Briar said. Don't worry, that tent's for you and Rosethorn. Go to bed. Evie managed to crawl into the small tent. When he looked in shortly afterward, Briar discovered she had collapsed onto her open bedroll without crawling into it. He tugged her blanket off and covered her, silently thanking whoever had set up the tents. Once he'd made the herb circle around the women's tent so the cats could roam inside it, he released them from their baskets and fed them dried meat soaked in water. Then he went in search of a meal for himself. 
The soldiers invited him to share theirs. A cup of butter tea and a bowl of dough mixed with cheese and tea. Apparently, the normal ration meal. Briar had eaten worse and more unusual dishes. He devoured his and thanked his hosts. They chuckled. Usually foreigners just spit it out, the cook explained in Tion. Briar wasn't about to tell them he hadn't spat out far weirder things served by the emperor. They had agreed to keep silent about their time in Dohan, for one. For another, he didn't want these people thinking he was a snob. You won't catch me wasting decent food, he said truthfully. He bowed and returned to the captain's fire. Rosethorn was gone. She went to bed, Parahan told him. He was sharpening his swords. Captain Rana here says the Emperor's troops attacked in strength up the Ice Lion Pass, the Green Pass, and out along the northern plain a week ago. General Serugo only had word of it two days ago. She wasn't convinced until today that Yan Jing might have sent forces up the Snow Serpent Pass. Most people have left it alone for attacks in the past. It's too narrow for getting real numbers of troops into Gyeongshi. We didn't see any soldiers before today, so they were ahead of us for certain. If they try to send more soldiers, they'll have a fun time, Briar said. We choked the border crossing with thorns. They won't get through those without a really good mage. We made the plants to resist axes, fire, and a lot of magic, Rosethorn and me. The emperor hasn't sent an army this way, the captain replied. Still, he can bleed us a bit and tie up our troops here in the south with only the smallest portion of one of his armies if he chooses. He can afford to waste soldiers here. We can't. He got to his feet. We ride before dawn, and we'll be riding hard all day. Get some sleep. By the time their journey into Gyeongshi was done, Briar never wanted to hear the words, ride hard, again. His bum and thighs, used to the slow pace of caravan riding, were as blistered and chafed as if he had just sat on a horse for the first time. Rosethorn and Evie were no better off, and Parahan, after years afoot in Wei Shu's palaces, was even worse. Night after night, the four applied salves to their sores and did their best not to complain. It was too important to reach the people who had been their friends for those long winter months. Rosethorn and Briar also patched wounds on their companions. Twice during their ride up the pass, they were cut off by Yanjing Yi soldiers and had to fight their way out. Rana said with grudging respect that these Yanjing Yi warriors were enemies to be respected. They had seen Rana and his company ride east and done nothing. It was Rosethorn and her companions who brought them out of hiding to attack. Every day, the hills around them rose ever higher. Trees grew straight up, clamoring for each bit of sun. There were fewer broadleafs and more pines. Scrub and grass clung to the lower slopes, where wild goats and yaks grazed in between ribs of naked limestone, shale, and granite. It did not help Briar's peace of mind in this land of stone that Evie twice dropped loads of rock onto Yan Jing Yi attackers. In his head, Briar knew that even if the cliffs and ridges that soared above the road were unstable, Evie would redirect loose stone if it fell. In his heart, he waited for a ton of boulders to drop on him. If he could do it without Evie noticing, he sent a screen of tough ivy crawling over any area that looked like it might be inclined to fall, just in case. After supper, the night before they were due to reach Rana's base, Fort Sambachu, Evie walked out beyond the picket line of sentries. Sergeant Canbob came running for Briar. The men chased her, trying to get her to come back. They didn't dare call to her, and they kept tripping in the dark, she explained as she led Briar to the place where his student had last been seen. On rocks, he said. He didn't need to ask. On rocks, Sergeant Canbob agreed. She left him when he could see the pale gleam of Evie's yak skin coat. Briar followed Evie, 
until she halted on the edge of the riverbank. He called for some of the grasses there to sprout up in case Evie slipped and tumbled into the icy water. She could control rocks, but not dirt. When he reached her, he had to shout in her ear. She had chosen a spot right over a series of rapids. They boomed in the night. What are you doing? he cried. The enemy could be nearby, and you scared the sentries. The mountains sing. Strangely enough, her voice was perfectly clear. Not like the Yan Jingyi singers do, or the Gyeongshin warriors. It's in my bones. They sing of caves and snow, and vultures. No, thank you, Briar shouted. I'm sure it's lovely, you bleat brained stone mage, but we're going back to camp now. I bet your pocket stones will sing to you if you ask them nicely. All right, she said, as if he'd asked her to feed the cats. She linked her arm in his and walked peaceably back to the cook fires with him. She even apologized to Can Bob and the sentries. Briar was shivering by the time they sat down to get warm. These mountains weren't like any others they had seen. She had liked the heights and the occasional glacier, but she hadn't been strange about the mountains themselves. He remembered the skeletons stepping out of the cliff face not so long ago, and the knowledge that, in Gyeongshi, this kind of thing happened over and over. Evie had been friendly with Gyeongshi's rocks all winter. What if they survived this war, and Evie was too entangled with the stone and mountains of Gyeongshi to leave? What could he say to her that would compete with the highest mountains in the world?